Why Nations Fail, The Origins of Power, Prosperity, and Poverty by Darren Asemoglu and James A. Robinson. Audiobook presented by the Learner's Library. Contents. Chapter 11. The Virtuous Circle. How Institutions That Encourage Prosperity Create Positive Feedback Loops That Prevent the Efforts by Elites to Undermine Them. Chapter 12. The Vicious Circle. How Institutions That Create Poverty Generate Negative Feedback Loops and Endure. Chapter 13. Why Nations Fail Today. Institutions, Institutions, Institutions. Chapter 14. Breaking the Mold. How a few countries changed their economic trajectory by changing their institutions. Chapter 15. Understanding Prosperity and Poverty. How the world could have been different and how understanding this can explain why most attempts to combat poverty have failed. Why Nations Fail. The Origins of Power, Prosperity, and Poverty. By Darren Asemoglu and James A. Robinson. 11. The Virtuous Circle. How Institutions That Encourage Prosperity Create Positive Feedback Loops That Prevent the Efforts by Elites to Undermine Them. 11. The Virtuous Circle. The Black Act. Windsor Castle, located just west of London, is one of the great royal residencies of England. In the early 18th century, the castle was surrounded by a great forest, full of deer, though little of this remains today. One of the keepers of the forest in 1722, Baptist Nunn, was locked into a violent conflict. On June 27 he recorded, Blacks came in the night shot at me three times two bullets into my chamber window and, I, agreed to pay them five guineas at Crowthorn on the 30th. Another entry in Nunn's diary read, A Fresh Surprise. One appeared disguised with a message of destruction. Who were these mysterious blacks, making threats, shooting at Nunn, and demanding money? The blacks were groups of local men who had their faces blacked, to conceal their appearance at night. They appeared widely across southern England in this period, killing and maiming deer and other animals, burning down haystacks and barns, and destroying fences and fish ponds. On the surface it was sheer lawlessness, but it wasn't. Illegal hunting, poaching, Deer in lands owned by the king or other members of the aristocracy had been going on for a long time. In the 1640s, during the Civil War, the entire population of deer at Windsor Castle was killed. After the Restoration in 1660, when Charles II came to the throne, the deer park was restocked. But the blacks were not just poaching deer to eat, they also engaged in wanton destruction. To what end? A crucial building block of the Glorious Revolution of 1688 was the pluralistic nature of interests, represented in Parliament. None of the merchants, industrialists, gentry, or aristocracy allied with William of Orange and then with the Hanoverian monarchs, who succeeded Queen and in 1714, were strong enough to impose their will unilaterally. Attempts at restoring the Stuart monarchy continued throughout much of the 18th century. After James II's death in 1701, his son, James Francis Edward Stuart, the Old Pretender, was recognized as the lawful heir to the English crown by France, Spain, the Pope, and supporters of the Stuart monarchy in England and Scotland, the so-called Jacobites. In 1708 the Old Pretender attempted to take back the throne with support of French troops, but was unsuccessful. In the ensuing decades there would be several Jacobite revolts, including major ones in 1715 and 1719. In 1745-46, the Old Pretender's son, Charles Edward Stuart, the Young Pretender, 
made an attempt to take back the throne, but his forces were defeated by the British army. The Whig political party, which as we saw, pages 210 to 211, was founded in the 1670s to represent the new mercantile and economic interests, was the main organization behind the Glorious Revolution, and the Whigs dominated Parliament from 1714 to 1760. Once in power, they were tempted to use their newly found position to prey on the rights of others, to have their cake and eat it, too. They were no different from the Stuart kings, but their power was far from absolute. It was constrained both by competing groups in Parliament, particularly the Tory party which had formed to oppose the Whigs, and by the very institutions that they had fought to introduce to strengthen Parliament and to prevent the emergence of a new absolutism, and the return of the Stuarts. The pluralistic nature of society that emerged from the Glorious Revolution also meant that the population at large, even those without formal representation in Parliament, had been empowered, and blacking was precisely a response by the common people to perceptions that the Whigs were exploiting their position. The case of William Cadogan a successful general in the War of the Spanish Succession between 1701 and 1714, and in the suppression of the Jacobite revolts, illustrates the sort of encroachment of common people's rights by the Whigs that led to blacking. George I made Cadogan a baron in 1716 and then an earl in 1718. He was also an influential member of the Regency Council of Lords Justices, which presided over major affairs of state, and he served as the acting commander-in-chief. He bought a large property of about a thousand acres at Caversham, about twenty miles west of Windsor. There he built a grand house and ornate gardens and laid out a two hundred and forty-acre deer park. Yet this property was consolidated by encroaching on the rights of those around the estate. People were evicted, and their traditional rights to graze animals and collect peat and firewood were abrogated. Cadogan faced the wrath of the blacks. On January 1, 1722, and again in July, the park was raided by mounted and armed blacks. The first attack killed sixteen deer. Earl Cadogan was not alone. The estates of many notable landowners and politicians were also raided by the blacks. The Whig government was not going to take this lying down. In May 1723, Parliament passed the Black Act, which created an extraordinary fifty new offenses that were punishable by hanging. The Black Act made it a crime not only to carry weapons but to have a blackened face. The law in fact was soon amended to make blacking punishable by hanging. The Whig elites went about implementing the law with gusto. Baptist nuns set up a network of informers in Windsor Forest to discover the identity of the blacks. Soon several were arrested. The transition from arrest to hanging ought to have been a straightforward affair. After all, the Black Act had already been enacted, the Whigs were in charge of Parliament, Parliament was in charge of the country, and the Blacks were acting directly contrary to the interests of some powerful Whigs. Even Sir Robert Walpole, Secretary of State, then Prime Minister, and like Cadogan, another influential member of the Regency Council of the Lords Justices, was involved. He had a vested interest in Richmond Park in southwest London, which had been created out of common land by Charles I. This park also encroached upon the traditional rights of local residents to graze their animals, hunt hares and rabbits, and collect firewood. But the ending of these rights appears to have been rather laxly enforced, and grazing and hunting continued until Walpole arranged for his son to become the park ranger. At this time, the park was closed off, a new wall was constructed, and man traps were installed. Walpole liked hunting deer, and he had a lodge built for himself at Houghton, 
within the park. The animosity of local blacks was soon ignited. On November 10, 1724, a local resident outside the park, John Huntridge, was accused of aiding deer stealers and abetting known blacks, both crimes punishable by hanging. The prosecution of Huntridge came right from the top, initiated by the Regency Council of Lords Justices, which Walpole and Cadogan dominated. Walpole went so far as to extract evidence himself as to Huntridge's guilt from an informant, Richard Blackburn. Conviction ought to have been a foregone conclusion, but it wasn't. After a trial of eight or nine hours, the jury found Huntridge innocent, partly on procedural grounds, since there were irregularities with the way the evidence had been collected. Not all blacks or those who sympathized with them were as lucky as Huntridge. Though some others were also acquitted or had their convictions. Commuted, many were hanged or transported to the penal colony of choice at the time, North America. The law in fact stayed on the statute books until it was repealed in 1824. Yet Huntridge's victory is remarkable. The jury was made up not of Huntridge's peers, but of major landowners and gentry, who ought to have sympathized with Walpole. But this was no longer the 17th century, where the Court of Star Chamber would simply follow the wishes of Stuart monarchs and act as an open tool of repression against their opponents, and where kings could remove judges whose decisions they did not like. Now the Whigs also had to abide by the rule of law the principle that laws should not be applied selectively or arbitrarily and that nobody is above the law. The events surrounding the Black Act would show that the glorious revolution had created the rule of law, and that this notion was stronger in England and Britain, and the elites were far more constrained by it than they themselves imagined. Notably, the rule of law is not the same as rule by law. Even if the Whigs could pass a harsh, repressive law to quash obstacles from common people, they had to contend with additional constraints because of the rule of law. Their law violated the rights that the glorious revolution and the changes in political institutions that followed from it had already established for everybody by tearing down the divine rights of kings and the privileges of elites. The rule of law then implied that both elites and non-elites alike would resist its implementation. The rule of law is a very strange concept when you think about it in historical perspective. Why should laws be applied equally to all? If the king and the aristocracy have political power and the rest don't, it's only natural that whatever is fair game for the king and the aristocracy should be banned and punishable for the rest. Indeed, the rule of law is not imaginable under absolutist political institutions. It is a creation of pluralist political institutions and of the broad coalitions that support such pluralism. It's only when many individuals and groups have a say in decisions, and the political power to have a seat at the table, that the idea that they should all be treated fairly starts making sense. By the early 18th century, Britain was becoming sufficiently pluralistic, and the Whig elites would discover that, as enshrined in the notion of the rule of law, laws and institutions would constrain them, too. But why did the Whigs and parliamentarians abide by such restraints? Why didn't they use their control over Parliament and the state to force an uncompromising implementation of the Black Act? and overturn the courts when the decisions didn't go their way? The answer reveals much about the nature of the glorious revolution, why it didn't just replace an old absolutism with a new version, the link between pluralism and the rule of law, and the dynamics of virtuous circles. As we saw in Chapter 7, the glorious revolution was not the overthrow of one elite by another but a revolution against absolutism by a broad coalition made up of the gentry, merchants, and manufacturers as well as groupings of Whigs and Tories.
the emergence of pluralist political institutions was a consequence of this revolution. The rule of law also emerged as a byproduct of this process. With many parties at the table sharing power, it was natural to have laws and constraints apply to all of them, lest one party start amassing too much power and ultimately undermine the very foundations of pluralism. Thus the notion that there were limits and restraints on rulers, the essence of the rule of law, was part of the logic of pluralism engendered by the broad coalition that made up the opposition to Stuart absolutism. In this light, it should be no surprise that the principle of the rule of law, coupled with the notion that monarchs did not have divine rights, was in fact a key argument against Stuart absolutism. As the British historian E. P. Thompson put it, in the struggle against the Stuart monarchs, immense efforts were made to project the image of a ruling class which was itself subject to the rule of law and whose legitimacy rested upon the equity and universality of those legal forms. And the rulers were, in serious senses, whether willingly or unwillingly, the prisoners of their own rhetoric. They played games of power according to rules which suited them, but they could not break those rules or the whole game would be thrown away. Throwing the game away would destabilize the system and open the way for absolutism by a subset of the broad coalition, or even risk the return of the Stuarts. In Thompson's words, what inhibited Parliament from creating a new absolutism was that take away law, and the royal prerogative, might flood back upon their properties and lives. Moreover, it was inherent in the very nature of the medium which they, those aristocrats, merchants etc. fighting the crown, had selected for their own self-defense that it could not be reserved for the exclusive use only of their own class. The law, in its forms and traditions, entailed principles of equity and universality which had to be extended to all sorts and degrees of men. Once in place, the notion of the rule of law not only kept absolutism at bay but also created a type of virtuous circle. If the laws applied equally to everybody, then no individual or group, not even Cadogan or Walpole, could rise above the law, and common people accused of encroaching on private property still had the right to a fair trial. We saw how inclusive economic and political institutions emerge. But why do they persist over time? The history of the Black Act and the limits to its implementation illustrate the virtuous circle, a powerful process of positive feedback that preserves these institutions in the face of attempts at undermining them and, in fact, sets in motion forces that lead to greater inclusiveness. The logic of virtuous circles stems partly from the fact that inclusive institutions are based on constraints on the exercise of power and on a pluralistic distribution of political power in society, enshrined in the rule of law. The ability of a subset to impose its will on others without any constraints, even if those others are ordinary citizens, as Huntridge was, threatens this very balance. If it were temporarily suspended in the case of the peasants protesting against elites encroaching on their communal lands, what was there to guarantee that it would not be suspended again? And the next time it was suspended, what would prevent the crown and aristocracy from taking back what the merchants, businessmen, and the gentry had gained in the intervening half-century? In fact, the next time it was suspended, perhaps the entire project of pluralism would come crumbling down because a narrow set of interests would take control at the expense of the broad coalition. The political system would not risk this. But this made pluralism, and the rule of law that it implied, persistent features of British political institutions. And we will see that once pluralism and the rule of law were established, there would be demand for even greater pluralism and greater participation in the political process. The virtuous circle arises not only from the inherent logic of pluralism and the rule of law, 
but also because inclusive political institutions tend to support inclusive economic institutions. This then leads to a more equal distribution of income, empowering a broad segment of society and making the political playing field even more level. This limits what one can achieve by usurping political power and reduces the incentives to recreate extractive political institutions. These factors were important in the emergence of truly democratic political institutions in Britain. Pluralism also creates a more open system and allows independent media to flourish, making it easier for groups that have an interest in the continuation of inclusive institutions to become aware and organize against threats to these institutions. It is highly significant that the English state stopped censoring the media after 1688. The media played a similarly important role in empowering the population at large, and in the continuation of the virtuous circle of institutional development in the United States, as we will see in this chapter. While the virtuous circle creates a tendency for inclusive institutions to persist, it is neither inevitable nor irreversible. Both in Britain and the United States, inclusive economic and political institutions were subject to many challenges. In 1745 the young pretender got all the way to Derby, a mere hundred miles from London, with an army to unseat the political institutions forged during the Glorious Revolution. But he was defeated. More important than the challenges from without were potential challenges from within that might also have led to the unraveling of inclusive institutions. As we saw in the context of the Peterloo Massacre in Manchester in 1819, page 207, and as we will see in more detail next, British political elites thought of using repression to avoid having to further open the political system but they pulled back from the brink. Similarly, inclusive economic and political institutions in the United States faced serious challenges, which could have conceivably succeeded, but didn't. And of course it was not preordained that these challenges should be defeated. It is due to not only the virtuous circle but also to the realization of the contingent path of history that British and U.S. inclusive institutions survived and became substantially stronger over time. The Slow March of Democracy The response to the Black Act showed ordinary British people that they had more rights than they previously realized. They could defend their traditional rights and economic interests in the courts and in Parliament through the use of petitions and lobbying. But this pluralism had not yet delivered effective democracy. Most adult men could not vote, neither could women, and there were many inequities in the existing democratic structures. All this was to change. The virtuous circle of inclusive institutions not only preserves what has already been achieved but also opens the door to greater inclusiveness. The odds were against the British elite of the 18th century maintaining their grip on political power without serious challenges. This elite had come to power by challenging the divine right of kings and opening the door to participation by the people in politics. But then they gave this right only to a small minority. It was only a matter of time until more and more of the population demanded the right to participate in the political process and in the years leading up to 1831, they did. The first three decades of the 19th century witnessed increasing social unrest in Britain, mostly in response to increasing economic inequities and demands from the disenfranchised masses for greater political representation. The Luddite riots of 1811 to 1816, where workers fought against the introduction of new technologies they believed would reduce their wages, were followed by riots explicitly demanding political rights, the Spa Fields riots of 1816 in London and the Peterloo Massacre of 1819 in Manchester. In the Swing Riots of 1830, 
Agricultural workers protested against falling living standards as well as the introduction of new technology. Meanwhile, in Paris, the July Revolution of 1830 exploded. A consensus among elites was starting to form that the discontent was reaching the boiling point, and the only way to defuse social unrest and turn back a revolution was by meeting the demands of the masses and undertaking parliamentary reform. It was no surprise then that the 1831 election was mostly about a single issue, political reform. The Whigs, almost 100 years after Sir Robert Walpole, were much more responsive to the wishes of the common man and campaigned to extend voting rights. But this meant only a small increase in the electorate. Universal suffrage, even only for men, was not on the table. The Whigs won the election, and their leader, Earl Grey, became the Prime Minister. Earl Grey was no radical, far from it. He and the Whigs pushed for reform not because they thought a broader voting franchise was more just or because they wanted to share power. British democracy was not given by the elite. It was largely taken by the masses, who were empowered by the political processes that had been ongoing in England and the rest of Britain for the last several centuries. They had become emboldened by the changes in the nature of political institutions unleashed by the Glorious Revolution. Reforms were granted because the elite thought that reform was the only way to secure the continuation of their rule, albeit in a somewhat lessened form. Earl Grey, in his famous speech to Parliament in favour of political reform, said this very clearly. There is no one more decided against annual parliaments, universal suffrage and the ballot, than I am. My object is not to favour, but to put an end to such hopes and projects. The principle of my reform is, to prevent the necessity of revolution, reforming to preserve and not to overthrow. The masses did not just want the vote for its own sake but to have a seat at the table to be able to defend their interests. This was well understood by the Chartist movement, which led the campaign for universal suffrage after 1838, taking its name from its adoption of the People's Charter, named to evoke a parallel with the Magna Carta. Chartist J. R. Stevens articulated why universal suffrage, and the vote for all citizens, was key for the masses. The question of universal suffrage, is a knife and fork question, a bread and cheese question. By universal suffrage I mean to say that every working man in the land has a right to a good coat on his back, a good hat on his head, a good roof for the shelter of his household, a good dinner upon his table. Stevens had well understood that universal suffrage was the most durable way of empowering the British masses further, and guaranteeing a coat, a hat, a roof, and a good dinner for the working man. Ultimately, Earl Grey was successful both in ensuring the passage of the first Reform Act and in defusing the revolutionary tides without taking any major strides toward universal mass suffrage. The 1832 reforms were modest, only doubling the voting franchise from 8% to about 16% of the adult male population, from about 2 to 4% of all the population. They also got rid of rotten boroughs and gave independent representation to the new industrializing cities such as Manchester, Leeds, and Sheffield. But this still left many issues unresolved. Hence there were soon further demands for greater voting rights and further social unrest. In response, further reform would follow. Why did the British elites give in to the demands? Why did Earl Grey feel that partial, indeed, very partial, reform was the only way to preserve the system? Why did they have to put up with the lesser of the two evils, reform or revolution? rather than maintaining their power without any reform? Couldn't they just have done what the Spanish conquistadors did in South America, 
What Austria-Hungarian and Russian monarchs would do in the next several decades when the demands for reform reached those lands, and what the British themselves did in the Caribbean and in India, use force to put down the demands? The answer to this question comes from the virtuous circle. The economic and political changes that had already taken place in Britain made using force to repress these demands both unattractive for the elite and increasingly infeasible. As E. P. Thompson wrote, When the struggles of 1790 to 1832 signaled that this equilibrium had changed, the rulers of England were faced with alarming alternatives. They could either dispense with the rule of law, dismantle their elaborate constitutional structures, countermand their own rhetoric and rule by force, or they could submit to their own rules and surrender their hegemony. They took halting steps in the first direction. But in the end, rather than shatter their own self-image and repudiate 150 years of constitutional legality, they surrendered to the law. Put differently, the same forces that made the British elite not wish to tear down the edifice of the rule of law during the Black Act also made them shun repression and rule by force, which would again risk the stability of the entire system. If undermining the law in trying to implement the Black Act would have weakened the system that merchants, businessmen, and the gentry had built in the Glorious Revolution, setting up a repressive dictatorship in 1832 would have entirely undermined it. In fact, the organizers of the protests for parliamentary reform were well aware of the importance of the rule of law and its symbolism to the British political institutions during this period. They used its rhetoric to bring home this point. One of the first organizations seeking parliamentary reform was called the Hampton Club, after the member of parliament who had first resisted Charles I over the ship money tax a crucial event leading up to the first major uprising against Stuart absolutism, as we saw in Chapter 7. There was also dynamic positive feedback between inclusive economic and political institutions making such a course of action attractive. Inclusive economic institutions led to the development of inclusive markets, inducing a more efficient allocation of resources, greater encouragement to acquire education and skills, and further innovations in technology. All of these forces were in play in Britain by 1831. Clamping down on popular demands and undertaking a coup against inclusive political institutions would also destroy these gains, and the elites opposing greater democratization and greater inclusiveness might find themselves among those losing their fortunes from this destruction. Another aspect of this positive feedback is that under inclusive economic and political institutions, controlling power became less central. In Austria, Hungary and in Russia, as we saw in Chapter 8, the monarchs and the aristocracy had much to lose from industrialization and reform. In contrast, in Britain at the beginning of the 19th century, Thanks to the development of inclusive economic institutions, there was much less at stake, there were no serfs, relatively little coercion in the labor market, and few monopolies protected by entry barriers. Clinging to power was thus much less valuable for the British elite. The logic of the virtuous circle also meant that such repressive steps would be increasingly infeasible again because of the positive feedback between inclusive economic and political institutions. Inclusive economic institutions lead to a more equitable distribution of resources than extractive institutions. As such, they empower the citizens at large and thus create a more level playing field, even when it comes to the fight for power. This makes it more difficult for a small elite to crush the masses rather than to give in to their demands, or at least to some of them. The British inclusive institutions had also already unleashed the Industrial Revolution, and Britain was highly urbanized. Using repression against an urban, concentrated, 
and partially organized and empowered group of people would have been much harder than repressing a peasantry or dependent serfs. The virtuous circle thus brought the first Reform Act to Britain in 1832. But this was just the beginning. There was still a long road to travel toward real democracy, because in 1832 the elite had only offered what they thought they had to and no more. The issue of parliamentary reform was taken up by the Chartist movement, whose People's Charter of 1838 included the clauses a vote for every man 21 years of age, of sound mind, and not undergoing punishment for crime. The ballot dot, to protect the elector in the exercise of his vote. No property qualification for members of parliament, thus enabling the constituencies to return the man of their choice, be he rich or poor. Payment of members, thus enabling an honest tradesman, working man, or other person, to serve a constituency, when taken from his business to attend to the interests of the country. Equal constituencies, securing the same amount of representation for the same number of electors, instead of allowing small constituencies to swamp the votes of large ones. Annual parliaments, thus presenting the most effectual check to bribery and intimidation, since though a constituency might be bought once in seven years, even with the ballot, no purse could buy a constituency, under a system of universal suffrage, in each ensuing twelve-month, and since members, when elected for a year only, would not be able to defy and betray their constituents as now. By the ballot, they meant the secret ballot and the end of open voting, which had facilitated the buying of votes and the coercion of voters. The Chartist movement organized a series of mass demonstrations, and throughout this period Parliament continually discussed the potential for further reforms. Though the Chartists disintegrated after 1848, they were followed by the National Reform Union, founded in 1864, and the Reform League, which was founded in 1865. In July 1866, major pro-reform riots in Hyde Park brought reform right to the top of the political agenda once more. This pressure bore dividends in the form of the Second Reform Act of 1867, in which the total electorate was doubled and working-class voters became the majority in all urban constituencies. Shortly afterward the secret ballot was introduced and moves were made to eliminate corrupt electoral practices such as a treating, essentially buying votes in exchange for which the voter received a treat, usually money, food, or alcohol. The electorate was doubled again by the Third Reform Act of 1884, when 60% of adult males were enfranchised. Following the First World War, the Representation of the People Act of 1918 gave the vote to all adult males over the age of 21, and to women over the age of 30 who were taxpayers or married to taxpayers. Ultimately, all women also received the vote on the same terms as men in 1928. The measures of 1918 were negotiated during the war and reflected a quid pro quo between the government and the working classes, who were needed to fight and produce munitions. The government may also have taken note of the radicalism of the Russian Revolution. Parallel with the gradual development of more inclusive political institutions was a movement toward even more inclusive economic institutions. One major consequence of the first Reform Act was the repeal of the Corn Laws in 1846. As we saw in Chapter 7, the Corn Laws banned the import of grains and cereals, keeping their prices high and ensuring lucrative profits for large landowners. The new parliamentarians from Manchester and Birmingham wanted cheap corn and low wages. They won, and the landed interests suffered a major defeat. The changes in the electorate and other dimensions of political institutions taking place during the course of the 19th century were followed by further reforms.
In 1871 the Liberal Prime Minister Gladstone opened up the civil service to public examination, making it meritocratic, and thus continuing the process of political centralization and the building of state institutions that started during the Tudor period. Liberal and Tory governments during this period introduced a considerable amount of labor market legislation. For example, the Masters and Servants Acts, which allowed employers to use the law to reduce the mobility of their workers, was repealed, changing the nature of labor relations in favor of workers. During 1906 to 1914, the Liberal Party, under the leadership of H. H. Asquith and David Lloyd George, began to use the state to provide far more public services including health and unemployment insurance, government, financed pensions, minimum wages, and a commitment to redistributive taxation. As a result of these fiscal changes, taxes as a proportion of national product more than doubled in the last three decades of the 19th century, and then doubled again in the first three decades of the 20th. The tax system also became more progressive, so that wealthier people bore a heavier burden. Meanwhile, the education system, which was previously either primarily for the elite, run by religious denominations, or required poor people to pay fees, was made more accessible to the masses. The Education Act of 1870 committed the government to the systematic provision of universal education for the first time. Education became free of charge in 1891. The school leaving age was set at 11 in 1893. In 1899 it was increased to 12, and special provisions for the children of needy families were introduced. As a result of these changes, the proportion of 10-year-olds enrolled in school, which stood at a disappointing 40% in 1870 increased to 100% in 1900. Finally, the Education Act of 1902 led to a large expansion in resources for schools and introduced the grammar schools, which subsequently became the foundation of secondary education in Britain. In fact, the British example, an illustration of the virtuous circle of inclusive institutions, provides an example of a gradual virtuous circle. The political changes were unmistakably toward more inclusive political institutions and were the result of demands from empowered masses. But they were also gradual. Every decade another step, sometimes smaller, sometimes larger, was taken toward democracy. There was conflict over each step, and the outcome of each was contingent. But the virtuous circle created forces that reduced the stakes involved in clinging to power. It also spurred the rule of law, making it harder to use force against those who were demanding what these elites had themselves demanded from Stuart monarchs. It became less likely that this conflict would turn into an all-out revolution and more likely that it would be resolved in favor of greater inclusiveness. There is great virtue in this sort of gradual change. It is less threatening to the elite than the wholesale overthrow of the system. Each step is small, and it makes sense to give in to a small demand rather than create a major showdown. This partly explains how the Corn Law was repealed without more serious conflict. By 1846 landowners could no longer control legislation in Parliament. This was an outcome of the first Reform Act. However, if in 1832 the expansion of the electorate, the reform of the rotten boroughs, and the repeal of the Corn Laws had all been on the table, landowners would have put up much more resistance. The fact that there were first limited political reforms and that repeal of the Corn Laws came on the agenda only later diffused conflict. Gradual change also prevented ventures into uncharted territories. A violent overthrow of the system means that something entirely new has to be built in place of what has been removed.
This was the case with the French Revolution, when the first experiment with democracy led to the terror, and then back to a monarchy twice before finally leading to the French Third Republic in 1870. It was the case in the Russian Revolution, where the desires of many for a more equal system than that of the Russian Empire led to a one-party dictatorship, that was much more violent, bloody, and vicious than what it had replaced. Gradual reform was difficult in these societies precisely because they lacked pluralism and were highly extractive. It was the pluralism emerging from the glorious revolution, and the rule of law that it introduced, that made gradual change feasible, and desirable, in Britain. The conservative English commentator Edmund Burke, who steadfastly opposed the French Revolution, wrote in 1790, it is with infinite caution that any man should venture upon pulling down an edifice, which has answered in any tolerable degree for ages the common purposes of society, or on building it up again without having models and patterns of approved utility before his eyes. Burke was wrong on the big picture. The French Revolution had replaced a rotten edifice and opened the way for inclusive institutions not only in France but throughout much of Western Europe. But Burke's caution was not entirely off the mark. The gradual process of British political reform, which had started in 1688 and would pick up pace three decades after Burke's death, would be more effective because its gradual nature made it more powerful, harder to resist, and ultimately more durable. Busting Trusts Inclusive institutions in the United States had their roots in the struggles in Virginia, Maryland, and the Carolinas during the colonial period, pages 19, 28. These institutions were reinforced by the Constitution of the United States, with its system of constraints and its separation of powers. But the Constitution did not mark the end of the development of inclusive institutions. Just as in Britain, these were strengthened by a process of positive feedback, based on the virtuous circle. By the middle of the 19th century, all white males, though not women or blacks, could vote in the United States. Economic institutions became more inclusive, for example, with the passage of the Homestead Act in 1862, page 37 which made frontier land available to potential settlers rather than allocating these lands to political elites. But just as in Britain, challenges to inclusive institutions were never entirely absent. The end of the U.S. Civil War initiated a rapid spurt of economic growth in the North. As railways, industry, and commerce expanded, a few people made vast fortunes. Emboldened by their economic success, these men and their companies became increasingly unscrupulous. They were called the robber barons because of their hard-nosed business practices aimed at consolidating monopolies and preventing any potential competitor from entering the market or doing business on an equal footing. One of the most notorious of these was Cornelius Vanderbilt, who famously remarked, What do I care about the law? Hain't I got the power? Another was John D. Rockefeller, who started the Standard Oil Company in 1870. He quickly eliminated rivals in Cleveland and attempted to monopolize the transportation and retailing of oil and oil products. By 1882 he had created a massive monopoly, in the language of the day, a trust. By 1890 Standard Oil controlled 88% of the refined oil flows in the United States, and Rockefeller became the world's first billionaire in 1916. Contemporary cartoons depict Standard Oil as an octopus wrapping itself around not just the oil industry but also Capitol Hill. Almost as infamous was John Pierpont Morgan, the founder of the modern banking conglomerate J.P. Morgan, which later, after many mergers over decades, eventually became J.P. Morgan Chase. Along with Andrew Carnegie, 
Morgan founded the U.S. Steel Company in 1901, the first corporation with a capitalized value of more than $1 billion, and by far the largest steel corporation in the world. In the 1890s, large trusts began to emerge in nearly every sector of the economy, and many of them controlled more than 70% of the market in their sector. These included several household names, such as DuPont, Eastman Kodak, and International Harvester. Historically the United States, at least the northern and midwestern United States, had relatively competitive markets and had been more egalitarian than other parts of the country, particularly the South. But during this period, competition gave way to monopoly, and wealth inequality rapidly increased. The pluralistic U.S. political system already empowered a broad segment of society that could stand up against such encroachments. Those who were the victims of the monopolistic practices of the robber barons, or who objected to their unscrupulous domination of their industries, began to organize against them. They formed the populist and then subsequently the progressive movements. The populist movement emerged out of a long-running agrarian crisis, which afflicted the Midwest from the late 1860s onward. The National Grange of the Order of Patrons of Husbandry, known as the Grangers, was founded in 1867 and began to mobilize farmers against unfair and discriminatory business practices. In 1873 and 1874, the Grangers won control of 11 Midwestern state legislatures, and rural discontent culminated in the formation of the People's Party in 1892 which got 8.5% of the popular vote in the 1892 presidential election. In the next two elections, the populists fell in behind the two unsuccessful Democratic campaigns by William Jennings Bryan, who made many of their issues his own. Grassroots opposition to the spread of the trusts had now organized to try to counteract the influence that Rockefeller and other robber barons were exerting over national politics. These political movements slowly began to have an impact on political attitudes and then on legislation, particularly concerning the role of the state in the regulation of monopoly. The first important piece of legislation was the Interstate Commerce Act of 1887 which created the Interstate Commerce Commission and initiated the development of the federal regulation of industry. This was quickly followed by the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890. The Sherman Act, which is still a major part of U.S. antitrust regulation, would become the basis for attacks on the robber barons' trusts. Major action against the trusts came after the election of presidents committed to reform and to limiting the power of the robber barons. Theodore Roosevelt, 1901-1909, William Taft, 1909-1913, and Woodrow Wilson, 1913-1921. A key political force behind antitrust and the move to impose federal regulation of industry was again the farm vote. Early attempts by individual states in the 1870s to regulate railroads came from farmers' organizations. Indeed, nearly all the 59 petitions that concerned trusts sent to Congress prior to the enactment of the Sherman Act came from farming states and emanated from organizations such as the Farmers' Union, Farmers' Alliance, Farmers' Mutual Benefit Association, and Patrons of Animal Husbandry. Farmers found a collective interest in opposing the monopolistic practices of industry. From the ashes of the populists, who seriously declined after throwing their weight behind the Democrats, came the progressives, a heterogeneous reform movement concerned with many of the same issues. The progressive movement initially gelled around the figure of Teddy Roosevelt, who was William McKinley's vice president and who assumed the presidency following McKinley's assassination in 1901. Prior to his rise to national office, 
Roosevelt had been an uncompromising governor of New York and had worked hard to eliminate political corruption and machine politics. In his first address to Congress, Roosevelt turned his attention to the trusts. He argued that the prosperity of the United States was based on market economy and the ingenuity of businessmen, but at the same time, there are real and grave evils, and a widespread conviction in the minds of the American people that the great corporations known as trusts are uncertain of their features, and tendencies hurtful to the general welfare. This springs from no spirit of envy or uncharitableness, nor lack of pride in the great industrial achievements that have placed this country at the head of the nations struggling for commercial supremacy. It does not rest upon a lack of intelligent appreciation of the necessity of meeting changing and changed conditions of trade, with new methods, nor upon ignorance of the fact that combination of capital in the effort to accomplish great things is necessary, when the world's progress demands that great things be done. It is based upon sincere conviction that combination and concentration should be, not prohibited but supervised and within reasonable limits controlled, and in my judgment this conviction is right. He continued, it should be as much the aim of those who seek for social betterment to rid the business world of crimes of cunning as to rid the entire body, politic of crimes of violence. His conclusion was that, in the interest of the whole people, the nation should, without interfering with the power of the states in the matter itself, also assume power of supervision and regulation over all corporations doing an interstate business. This is especially true where the corporation derives a portion of its wealth from the existence of some monopolistic element or tendency in its business. Roosevelt proposed that Congress establish a federal agency with power to investigate the affairs of the great corporations and that, if necessary, a constitutional amendment could be used to create such an agency. By 1902 Roosevelt had used the Sherman Act to break up the Northern Securities Company, affecting the interests of J.P. Morgan, and subsequent suits had been brought against DuPont the American Tobacco Company, and the Standard Oil Company. Roosevelt strengthened the Interstate Commerce Act with the Hepburn Act of 1906, which increased the powers of the Interstate Commerce Commission, particularly allowing it to inspect the financial accounts of railways and extending its authority into new spheres. Roosevelt's successor, William Taft, prosecuted trusts even more assiduously. The high point of this being the breakup of the Standard Oil Company in 1911. Taft also promoted other important reforms, such as the introduction of a federal income tax, which came with the ratification of the 16th Amendment in 1913. The apogee of progressive reforms came with the election of Woodrow Wilson in 1912. Wilson noted in his 1913 book, The New Freedom, if monopoly persists, monopoly will always sit at the helm of government. I do not expect to see monopoly restrain itself. If there are men in this country big enough to own the government of the United States, they are going to own it. Wilson worked to pass the Clayton Antitrust Act in 1914, strengthening the Sherman Act, and he created the Federal Trade Commission, which enforced the Clayton Act. In addition, under the impetus of the investigation of the Pujo Committee, led by Louisiana Congressman Arsene Pujo, into the a Money Trust, the spread of monopoly into the financial industry, Wilson moved to increase regulation of the financial sector. In 1913 he created the Federal Reserve Board, which would regulate monopolistic activities in the financial sector. The rise of robber barons and their monopoly trusts in the late 19th and early 20th centuries underscores that, as we already emphasized in Chapter 3, the presence of markets is not by itself a guarantee of inclusive institutions.
markets can be dominated by a few firms, charging exorbitant prices and blocking the entry of more efficient rivals and new technologies. Markets, left to their own devices, can cease to be inclusive, becoming increasingly dominated by the economically and politically powerful. Inclusive economic institutions require not just markets, but inclusive markets that create a level playing field and economic opportunities for the majority of the people. Widespread monopoly, backed by the political power of the elite, contradicts this. But the reaction to the monopoly trusts also illustrates that when political institutions are inclusive, they create a countervailing force against movements away from inclusive markets. This is the virtuous circle in action. Inclusive economic institutions provide foundations upon which inclusive political institutions can flourish, while inclusive political institutions restrict deviations away from inclusive economic institutions. Trust busting in the United States, in contrast to what we have seen in Mexico, pages 38 to 40 illustrates this facet of the virtuous circle. While there is no political body in Mexico restricting Carlos Slim's monopoly, the Sherman and Clayton Acts have been used repeatedly in the United States over the past century to restrict trusts, monopolies, and cartels, and to ensure that markets remain inclusive. The U.S. experience in the first half of the 20th century also emphasizes the important role of free media in empowering broad segments of society and thus in the virtuous circle. In 1906 Roosevelt coined the term muckraker, based on a literary character, the man with the muckrake in Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, to describe what he regarded as intrusive journalism. The term stuck and came to symbolize journalists who were intrusively, but also effectively, exposing the excesses of robber barons as well as corruption in local and federal politics. Perhaps the most famous muckraker was Ida Tarbell, whose 1904 book, History of the Standard Oil Company, played a key role in moving public opinion against Rockefeller and his business interests culminating in the breakup of Standard Oil in 1911. Another key muckraker was lawyer and author Louis Brandeis, who would later be named Supreme Court Justice by President Wilson. Brandeis outlined a series of financial scandals in his book Other People's Money and How Bankers Use It, and was highly influential on the Pujo Committee. The newspaper magnate William Randolph Hearst also played a salient role as muckraker. His serialization in his magazine The Cosmopolitan in 1906 of articles by David Graham Phillips, called The Treason of the Senate, galvanized the campaign to introduce direct elections for the Senate, another key progressive reform that happened with the enactment of the 17th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution in 1913. The muckrakers played a major role in inducing politicians to take action against the trusts. The robber barons hated the muckrakers, but the political institutions of the United States made it impossible for them to stamp out and silence them. Inclusive political institutions allow a free media to flourish, and a free media, in turn, makes it more likely that threats against inclusive economic and political institutions will be widely known and resisted. In contrast, such freedom is impossible under extractive political institutions, under absolutism, or under dictatorships, which helps extractive regimes to prevent serious opposition from forming in the first place. The information that the free media provided was clearly key during the first half of the 20th century in the United States. Without this information, the U.S. public would not have known the true extent of the power and abuses of the robber barons, and would not have mobilized against their trusts. Packing the Court Franklin D. Roosevelt, the Democratic Party candidate and cousin of Teddy Roosevelt, 
was elected president in 1932 in the midst of the Great Depression. He came to power with a popular mandate to implement an ambitious set of policies for combating the Great Depression. At the time of his inauguration in early 1933, one quarter of the labor force was unemployed, with many thrown into poverty. Industrial production had fallen by over half since the Depression hit in 1929, and investment had collapsed. The policies Roosevelt proposed to counteract this situation were collectively known as the New Deal. Roosevelt had won a solid victory, with 57% of the popular vote, and the Democratic Party had majorities in both the Congress and Senate, enough to pass New Deal legislation. However, some of the legislation raised constitutional issues and ended up in the Supreme Court, where Roosevelt's electoral mandate cut much less ice. One of the key pillars of the New Deal was the National Industrial Recovery Act. Title I focused on industrial recovery. President Roosevelt and his team believed that restraining industrial competition, giving workers greater rights to form trade unions, and regulating working standards were crucial to the recovery effort. Title II established the Public Works Administration, whose infrastructure projects include such landmarks as the 30th Street Railroad Station in Philadelphia, the Triborough Bridge, the Grand Coulee Dam, and the Overseas Highway connecting Key West, Florida, with the mainland. President Roosevelt signed the bill into law on June 16, 1933, and the National Industrial Recovery Act was put into operation. However, it immediately faced challenges in the courts. On May 27, 1935, the Supreme Court unanimously ruled that Title I of the Act was unconstitutional. Their verdict noted solemnly, Extraordinary conditions may call for extraordinary remedies. But, extraordinary conditions do not create or enlarge constitutional power. Before the court's ruling came in, Roosevelt had moved to the next step of his agenda and had signed the Social Security Act, which introduced the modern welfare state into the United States, pensions at retirement, unemployment benefits aid to families with dependent children, and some public health care and disability benefits. He also signed the National Labor Relations Act, which further strengthened the rights of workers to organize unions, engage in collective bargaining, and conduct strikes against their employers. These measures also faced challenges in the Supreme Court. As these were making their way through the judiciary, Roosevelt was re-elected in 1936 with a strong mandate, receiving 61% of the popular vote. With his popularity at record highs, Roosevelt had no intention of letting the Supreme Court derail more of his policy agenda. He laid out his plans in one of his regular fireside chats, which was broadcast live on the radio on March 9, 1937. He started by pointing out that in his first term, much-needed policies had only cleared the Supreme Court by a whisker. He went on. I am reminded of that evening in March, four years ago, when I made my first radio report to you. We were then in the midst of the great banking crisis. Soon after, with the authority of the Congress, we asked the nation to turn over all of its privately held gold, dollar for dollar, to the government of the United States. Today's recovery proves how right that policy was. But when, almost two years later, it came before the Supreme Court its constitutionality was upheld only by a 5-4 to four vote. The change of one vote would have thrown all the affairs of this great nation back into hopeless chaos. In effect, for justices ruled that the right under a private contract to exact a pound of flesh was more sacred than the main objectives of the Constitution, to establish an enduring nation. Obviously, this should not be risked again. Roosevelt continued.
Last Thursday, I described the American form of government as a three-horse team provided by the Constitution to the American people so that their field might be plowed. The three horses are, of course, the three branches of government. The Congress, the Executive, and the Courts. Two of the horses, the Congress and the Executive, are pulling in unison today, the third is not. Roosevelt then pointed out that the U.S. Constitution had not actually endowed the Supreme Court with the right to challenge the constitutionality of legislation, but that it had assumed this role in 1803. At the time, Justice Bushrod Washington had stipulated that the Supreme Court should presume in favor of a law's validity until its violation of the Constitution is proved beyond all reasonable doubt. Roosevelt then charged. In the last four years the sound rule of giving statutes the benefit of all reasonable doubt has been cast aside. The court has been acting not as a judicial body, but as a policymaking body. Roosevelt claimed that he had an electoral mandate to change this situation and that, after consideration of what reform to propose the only method which was clearly constitutional, was to infuse new blood into all our courts. He also argued that the Supreme Court judges were overworked, and the load was just too much for the older justices, who happened to be the ones striking down his legislation. He then proposed that all judges should face compulsory retirement at the age of 70, and that he should be allowed to appoint up to six new justices. This plan, which Roosevelt presented as the Judiciary Reorganization Bill, would have sufficed to remove the justices who had been appointed earlier by more conservative administrations, and who had most strenuously opposed the New Deal. Though Roosevelt skillfully tried to win popular support for the measure, opinion polls suggested that only about 40% of the population was in favor of the plan. Louis Brandeis was now a Supreme Court justice. Though Brandeis sympathized with much of Roosevelt's legislation, he spoke against the president's attempts to erode the power of the Supreme Court and his allegations that the justices were overworked. Roosevelt's Democratic Party had large majorities in both houses of Congress. But the House of Representatives more or less refused to deal with Roosevelt's bill. Roosevelt then tried the Senate. The bill was sent to the Senate Judiciary Committee, which then held highly contentious meetings, soliciting various opinions on the bill. They ultimately sent it back to the Senate floor with a negative report, arguing that the bill was a needless, futile and utterly dangerous abandonment of constitutional principle, without precedent or justification. The Senate voted 70 to 20 to send it back to committee to be rewritten. All the court-packing elements were stripped away. Roosevelt would be unable to remove the constraints placed on his power by the Supreme Court. Even though Roosevelt's powers remained constrained, there were compromises, and the Social Security and the National Labor Relations Acts were both ruled constitutional by the court. More important than the fate of these two acts was the general lesson from this episode. Inclusive political institutions not only check major deviations from inclusive economic institutions, but they also resist attempts to undermine their own continuation. It was in the immediate interests of the Democratic Congress and Senate to pack the court and ensure that all New Deal legislation survived. But in the same way that British political elites in the early 18th century understood that suspending the rule of law would endanger the gains they had wrested from the monarchy, congressmen and senators understood that if the president could undermine the independence of the judiciary, then this would undermine the balance of power in the system that protected them from the president and ensured the continuity of pluralistic political institutions. Perhaps Roosevelt would have decided next that obtaining legislative majorities took too much compromise and time, and that he would instead rule by decree, 
totally undermining pluralism and the U.S. political system. Congress certainly would not have approved this, but then Roosevelt could have appealed to the nation, asserting that Congress was impeding the necessary measures to fight the Depression. He could have used the police to close Congress. Sound far-fetched? This is exactly what happened in Peru and Venezuela in the 1990s. Presidents Fujimori and Chavez appealed to their popular mandate to close uncooperative congresses, and subsequently rewrote their constitutions to massively strengthen the powers of the president. The fear of this slippery slope by those sharing power under pluralistic political institutions is exactly what stopped Walpole from fixing British courts in the 1720s, and it is what stopped the U.S. Congress from backing Roosevelt's court-packing plan. Roosevelt had encountered the power of virtuous circles. But this logic does not always play out, particularly in societies that may have some inclusive features but that are broadly extractive. We have already seen these dynamics in Rome and Venice. Another illustration comes from comparing Roosevelt's failed attempt to pack the court with similar efforts in Argentina, where crucially the same struggles took place in the context of predominantly extractive economic and political institutions. The 1853 Constitution of Argentina created a Supreme Court with duties similar to those of the U.S. Supreme Court. An 1887 decision allowed the Argentine court to assume the same role as that of the U.S. Supreme Court in deciding whether specific laws were constitutional. In theory, the Supreme Court could have developed as one of the important elements of inclusive political institutions in Argentina, but the rest of the political and economic system remained highly extractive and there was neither empowerment of broad segments of society nor pluralism in Argentina. As in the United States, the constitutional role of the Supreme Court would also be challenged in Argentina. In 1946 Juan Domingo Perón was democratically elected president of Argentina. Perón was a former colonel and had first come to national prominence after a military coup in 1943 which had appointed him Minister of Labor. In this post, he built a political coalition with trade unions and the labor movement, which would be crucial for his presidential bid. Shortly after Perón's victory, his supporters in the Chamber of Deputies proposed the impeachment of four of the five members of the court. The charges leveled against the court were several. One involved unconstitutionally accepting the legality of two military regimes in 1930 and 1943, rather ironic, since Perón had played a key role in the latter coup. The other focused on legislation that the court had struck down, just as its U.S. counterpart had done. In particular, just prior to Perón's election as president, the court had issued a decision ruling that Perón's new National Labor Relations Board was unconstitutional. Just as Roosevelt heavily criticized the Supreme Court in his 1936 re-election campaign, Perón did the same in his 1946 campaign. Nine months after initiating the impeachment process, the Chamber of Deputies impeached three of the judges, the fourth having already resigned. The Senate approved the motion. Perón then appointed four new justices. The undermining of the court clearly had the effect of freeing Perón from political constraints. He could now exercise unchecked power, in much the same way the military regimes in Argentina did before and after his presidency. His newly appointed judges, for example, ruled as constitutional the conviction of Ricardo Balbin, the leader of the main opposition party to Perón, the Radical Party, for disrespecting Perón. Perón could effectively rule as a dictator. Since Perón successfully packed the court, it has become the norm in Argentina for any new president to handpick his own Supreme Court justices.
so a political institution that might have exercised some constraints on the power of the executive is gone. Perón's regime was removed from power by another coup in 1955, and was followed by a long sequence of transitions between military and civilian rule. Both new military and civilian regimes picked their own justices. But picking Supreme Court justices in Argentina was not an activity confined to transitions between military and civilian rule. In 1990 Argentina finally experienced a transition between democratically elected governments, one democratic government followed by another. Yet, by this time democratic governments did not behave much differently from military ones when it came to the Supreme Court. The incoming president was Carlos Saul Menem of the Peronist Party. The sitting Supreme Court had been appointed after the transition to democracy in 1983, by the Radical Party President Raul Alfonsin. Since this was a democratic transition, there should have been no reason for Menem to appoint his own court. But in the run-up to the election, Menem had already shown his colors. He continually, though not successfully, tried to encourage, or even intimidate, members of the court to resign. He famously offered Justice Carlos Fate an ambassadorship. But he was rebuked, and Fate responded by sending him a copy of his book Law and Ethics, with the note, Beware I wrote this, inscribed. Undeterred, within three months of taking office, Menem sent a law to the Chamber of Deputies proposing to expand the court from five to nine members. One argument was the same Roosevelt used in 1937, the court was overworked. The law quickly passed the Senate and Chamber, and this allowed Menem to name four new judges. He had his majority. Menem's victory against the Supreme Court set in motion the type of slippery slope dynamics we mentioned earlier. His next step was to rewrite the Constitution to remove the term limit so he could run for president again. After being re-elected, Menem moved to rewrite the Constitution again, but was stopped not by Argentina political institutions but by factions within his own Peronist party, who fought back against his personal domination. Since independence, Argentina has suffered from most of the institutional problems that have plagued Latin America. It has been trapped in a vicious, not a virtuous, circle. As a consequence, positive developments, such as first steps toward the creation of an independent Supreme Court, never gained a foothold. With pluralism, no group wants or dares to overthrow the power of another for fear that its own power will be subsequently challenged. At the same time, the broad distribution of power makes such an overthrow difficult. A Supreme Court can have power if it receives significant support, from broad segments of society willing to push back attempts to vitiate the court's independence. That has been the case in the United States, but not Argentina. Legislators there were happy to undermine the court even if they anticipated that this could jeopardize their own position. One reason is that with extractive institutions there is much to gain from overthrowing the Supreme Court, and the potential benefits are worth the risks. Positive Feedback and Virtuous Circles Inclusive economic and political institutions do not emerge by themselves. They are often the outcome of significant conflict between elites resisting economic growth and political change, and those wishing to limit the economic and political power of existing elites. Inclusive institutions emerge during critical junctures, such as during the Glorious Revolution in England or the foundation of the Jamestown Colony in North America, when a series of factors weaken the hold of the elites in power make their opponents stronger, and create incentives for the formation of a pluralistic society. The outcome of political conflict is never certain, and even if in hindsight we see many historical events as inevitable, 
the path of history is contingent. Nevertheless, once in place, inclusive economic and political institutions tend to create a virtuous circle, a process of positive feedback, making it more likely that these institutions will persist and even expand. The virtuous circle works through several mechanisms. First, the logic of pluralistic political institutions makes usurpation of power by a dictator, a faction within the government, or even a well-meaning president much more difficult, as Franklin Roosevelt discovered when he tried to remove the checks on his power imposed by the Supreme Court, and as Sir Robert Walpole discovered when he attempted to summarily implement the Black Act. In both cases, concentrating power further in the hands of an individual or a narrow group, would have started undermining the foundations of pluralistic political institutions, and the true measure of pluralism is precisely its ability to resist such attempts. Pluralism also enshrines the notion of the rule of law, the principle that laws should be applied equally to everybody, something that is naturally impossible under an absolutist monarchy. But the rule of law, in turn, implies that laws cannot simply be used by one group to encroach upon the rights of another. What's more, the principle of the rule of law opens the door for greater participation in the political process and greater inclusivity, as it powerfully introduces the idea that people should be equal not only before the law but also in the political system. This was one of the principles that made it difficult for the British political system to resist the forceful calls for greater democracy throughout the 19th century, opening the way to the gradual extension of the franchise to all adults. Second, as we have seen several times before, inclusive political institutions support and are supported by inclusive economic institutions. This creates another mechanism of the virtuous circle. Inclusive economic institutions remove the most egregious extractive economic relations, such as slavery and serfdom, reduce the importance of monopolies, and create a dynamic economy, all of which reduces the economic benefits that one can secure, at least in the short run, by usurping political power. Because economic institutions had already become sufficiently inclusive in Britain. By the 18th century, the elite had less to gain by clinging to power and, in fact, much to lose by using widespread repression against those demanding greater democracy. This facet of the virtuous circle made the gradual march of democracy in 19th century Britain both less threatening to the elite and more likely to succeed. This contrasts with the situation in absolutist regimes such as the Austro-Hungarian or Russian empires, where economic institutions were still highly extractive and, in consequence, where calls for greater political inclusion later in the 19th century would be met by repression, because the elite had too much to lose from sharing power. Finally, inclusive political institutions allow a free media to flourish and a free media often provides information about and mobilizes opposition to threats against inclusive institutions, as it did during the last quarter of the 19th century and first quarter of the 20th century, when the increasing economic domination of the robber barons was threatening the essence of inclusive economic institutions in the United States. Though the outcome of the ever-present conflicts continues to be contingent, through these mechanisms the virtuous circle creates a powerful tendency for inclusive institutions to persist, to resist challenges, and to expand as they did in both Britain and the United States. Unfortunately, as we will see in the next chapter, extractive institutions create equally strong forces toward their persistence, the process of the vicious circle. Why Nations Fail the Origins of Power, Prosperity, and Poverty by Darren Asemoglu and James A. Robinson 12. The Vicious Circle How Institutions That Create Poverty Generate Negative Feedback Loops and Endure
12. The Vicious Circle. You can't take the train to Bo anymore. All of the West African nation of Sierra Leone became a British colony in 1896. The capital city, Freetown, had originally been founded in the late 18th century as a home for repatriated and freed slaves. But when Freetown became a British colony, the interior of Sierra Leone was still made up of many small African kingdoms. Gradually, in the second half of the 19th century, the British extended their rule into the interior through a long series of treaties with African rulers. On August 31, 1896, the British government declared the colony a protectorate on the basis of these treaties. The British identified important rulers and gave them a new title, Paramount Chief. In eastern Sierra Leone, for example, in the modern diamond mining district of Kono, they encountered Suluku, a powerful warrior king. King Suluku was made Paramount Chief Suluku and the chieftaincy of Sandor was created as an administrative unit in the protectorate. Though kings such as Suluku had signed treaties with a British administrator, they had not understood that these treaties would be interpreted as carte blanche to set up a colony. When the British tried to levy a hut tax, a tax of five shillings to be raised from every house, in January 1898, the chiefs rose up in a civil war that became known as the Hut Tax Rebellion. It started in the north, but was strongest and lasted longer in the south, particularly in Mendelan, dominated by the Mend ethnic group. The Hut Tax Rebellion was soon defeated, but it warned the British about the challenges of controlling the Sierra Leonean hinterland. The British had already started to build a railway from Freetown into the interior. Work began in March 1896, and the line reached Songo Town in December 1898, in the midst of the Hut Tax Rebellion. British parliamentary papers from 1904 recorded that. In the case of the Sierra Leone Railways the native insurrection, that broke out in February 1898 had the effect of completely stopping the works and disorganizing the staff for some time. The rebels descended upon the railway, with the result that the entire staff had to be withdrawn to Freetown. Rotafunk, now situated upon the railways at 55 miles from Freetown, was at that time completely in the hands of the rebels. In fact, Rotafunk was not on the planned railway line in 1894. The route was changed after the start of the rebellion, so that instead of going to the northeast, it went south, via Rotafunk and on to Bo, into Mendelan. The British wanted quick access to Mendelan, the heart of the rebellion, and to other potentially disruptive parts of the hinterland if other rebellions were to flare up. When Sierra Leone became independent in 1961, the British handed power to Sir Milton Margai and his Sierra Leone People's Party, SLPP, which attracted support primarily in the south, particularly Mendelan, and the east. Sir Milton was followed as prime minister by his brother, Sir Albert Margai, in 1964. In 1967 the SLPP narrowly lost a hotly contested election to the opposition. The All People's Congress Party, APC, led by Siaka Stevens. Stevens was a limba, from the north, and the APC got most of their support from northern ethnic groups, the limba, the temni, and the loco. Though the railway to the south was initially designed by the British to rule Sierra Leone, by 1967 its role was economic, transporting most of the country's exports, coffee, cocoa, and diamonds. The farmers who grew coffee and cocoa were mend, and the railway was Mendelan's window to the world. Mendelan had voted hugely for Albert Margai in the 1967 election. Stevens was much more interested in holding on to power than promoting Mendelan's exports. His reasoning was simple, 
whatever was good for the Mend was good for the SLPP, and bad for Stevens. So he pulled up the railway line to Mendelan. He then went ahead and sold off the track and rolling stock to make the change as irreversible as possible. Now, as you drive out of Freetown to the east, you pass the dilapidated railway stations of Hastings and Waterloo. There are no more trains to bow. Of course, Stevens's drastic action fatally damaged some of the most vibrant sectors of Sierra Leone's economy. But like many of Africa's post-independence leaders, when the choice was between consolidating power and encouraging economic growth, Stevens chose consolidating his power, and he never looked back. Today you can't take the train to Bow anymore, because like Tsar Nicholas I, who feared that the railways would bring revolution to Russia, Stevens believed the railways would strengthen his opponents. Like so many other rulers in control of extractive institutions, he was afraid of challenges to his political power and was willing to sacrifice economic growth to thwart those challenges. Stevens's strategy at first glance contrasts with that of the British. But in fact, there was a significant amount of continuity between British rule and Stevens's regime that illustrates the logic of vicious circles. Stevens ruled Sierra Leone by extracting resources from its people using similar methods. He was still in power in 1985 not because he had been popularly re-elected, but because after 1967 he set up a violent dictatorship, killing and harassing his political opponents, particularly the members of the SLPP. He made himself president in 1971, and after 1978, Sierra Leone had only one political party, Stevens's APC. Stevens thus successfully consolidated his power, even if the cost was impoverishing much of the hinterland. During the colonial period, the British used a system of indirect rule to govern Sierra Leone, as they did with most of their African colonies. At the base of this system were the paramount chiefs, who collected taxes, distributed justice, and kept order. The British dealt with the cocoa and coffee farmers not by isolating them, but by forcing them to sell all their produce to a marketing board developed by the colonial office purportedly to help the farmers. Prices for agricultural commodities fluctuated wildly over time. Cocoa prices might be high one year but low the next. The incomes of farmers fluctuated in tandem. The justification for marketing boards was that they, not the farmers, would absorb the price fluctuations. When world prices were high, the board would pay the farmers in Sierra Leone less than the world price, but when world prices were low, they would do the opposite. It seemed a good idea in principle. The reality was very different, however. The Sierra Leone Produce Marketing Board was set up in 1949. Of course the board needed a source of revenues to function. The natural way to attain these was by paying farmers just a little less than they should have received either in good or bad years. These funds could then be used for overhead expenditures and administration. Soon the little less became a lot less. The colonial state was using the marketing board as a way of heavily taxing farmers. Many expected the worst practices of colonial rule in sub-Saharan Africa to stop after independence, and the use of marketing boards to excessively tax farmers to come to an end. But neither happened. In fact, the extraction of farmers using marketing boards got much worse. By the mid-1960s, the farmers of palm kernels were getting 56% of the world price from the marketing board, cocoa farmers, 48%, and coffee farmers, 49%. By the time Stevens left office in 1985, resigning to allow his hand-picked successor, Joseph Momo, to become president, these numbers were 37, 19, and 27%, respectively.
As pitiful as this might sound, it was better than what the farmers were getting during Stevens's reign, which had often been as low as 10%, that is, 90% of the income of the farmers was extracted by Stevens's government, and not to provide public services, such as roads or education, but to enrich himself and his cronies and to buy political support. As part of their indirect rule, the British had also stipulated that the office of the paramount chief would be held for life. To be eligible to be a chief, one had to be a member of a recognized a ruling house. The identity of the ruling houses in a chieftaincy developed over time, but it was essentially based on the lineage of the kings in a particular area and of the elite families who signed treaties with the British in the late 19th century. Chiefs were elected, but not democratically. A body called the Tribal Authority, whose members were lesser village chiefs or were appointed by paramount chiefs, village chiefs, or the British authorities, decided who would become the paramount chief. One might have imagined that this colonial institution would also have been abolished or at least reformed after independence. But just like the marketing board, it was not, and continued unchanged. Today paramount chiefs are still in charge of collecting taxes. It is no longer a hut tax, but its close descendant, a poll tax. In 2005 the tribal authority in Sandor elected a new paramount chief. Only candidates from the Fasaluka ruling house, which is the only ruling house, could stand. The victor was Sheku Fasaluku, King Saluku's great-great-grandson. The behavior of the marketing boards and the traditional systems of land ownership go a long way to explain why agricultural productivity is so low in Sierra Leone and much of sub-Saharan Africa. The political scientist Robert Bates set out in the 1980s to understand why agriculture was so unproductive in Africa even though according to textbook economics this ought to have been the most dynamic economic sector. He realized that this had nothing to do with geography or the sorts of factors discussed in Chapter 2 that have been claimed to make agricultural productivity intrinsically low. Rather, it was simply because the pricing policies of the marketing boards removed any incentives for the farmers to invest, use fertilizers, or preserve the soil. The reason that the policies of the marketing boards were so unfavorable to rural interests was that these interests had no political power. These pricing policies interacted with other fundamental factors making tenure insecure, further undermining investment incentives. In Sierra Leone, paramount chiefs not only provide law and order and judicial services, and raise taxes, but they are also the custodians of the land. Though families, clans, and dynasties have user rights and traditional rights to land, at the end of the day chiefs have the last say on who farms where. Your property rights to land are only secure if you are connected to the chief, perhaps from the same ruling family. Land cannot be bought or sold or used as collateral for a loan, and if you are born outside a chieftaincy, you cannot plant any perennial crop such as coffee, cocoa, or palm for fear that this will allow you to establish a de facto property rights. The contrast between the extractive institutions developed by the British in Sierra Leone and the inclusive institutions that developed in other colonies, such as Australia, is illustrated by the way mineral resources were managed. Diamonds were discovered in Kono in eastern Sierra Leone in January 1930. The diamonds were alluvial, that is, not in deep mines. So the primary method of mining them was by panning in rivers. Some social scientists call these democratic diamonds because they allow many people to become involved in mining, creating a potentially inclusive opportunity. Not so in Sierra Leone. Happily ignoring the intrinsically democratic nature of panning for diamonds.
The British government set up a monopoly for the entire protectorate, called it the Sierra Leone Selection Trust, and granted it to De Beers, the giant South African diamond mining company. In 1936 De Beers was also given the right to create the Diamond Protection Force, a private army that would become larger than that of the colonial government in Sierra Leone. Even so, the widespread availability of the alluvial diamonds made the situation difficult to police. By the 1950s, the Diamond Protection Force was overwhelmed by thousands of illegal diamond miners, a massive source of conflict and chaos. In 1955 the British government opened up some of the diamond fields to licensed diggers, outside the Sierra Leone Selection Trust, though the company still kept the richest areas in Yenjima and Koidu and Tongo fields. Things only got worse after independence. In 1970 Siaka Stevens effectively nationalized the Sierra Leone Selection Trust, creating the National Diamond Mining Company, Sierra Leone, Limited, in which the government, effectively meaning Stevens, had a 51% stake. This was the opening phase of Stevens's plan to take over diamond mining in the country. In 19th century Australia it was gold discovered in 1851 in New South Wales and the newly created state of Victoria, not diamonds, that attracted everyone's attention. Like diamonds in Sierra Leone, the gold was alluvial, and a decision had to be made about how to exploit it. Some, such as James MacArthur, son of John MacArthur, the prominent leader of the squatters we discussed earlier, pages 278 to 282, proposed that fences be placed around the mining areas and the monopoly rights auctioned off. They wanted an Australian version of the Sierra Leone Selection Trust. Yet many in Australia wanted free access to the gold mining areas. The inclusive model won, and instead of setting up a monopoly, Australian authorities allowed anyone who paid an annual mining license fee to search and dig for gold. Soon the diggers, as these adventurers came to be known, were a powerful force in Australian politics, particularly in Victoria. They played an important role in pushing forward the agenda of universal suffrage and the secret ballot. We have already seen two pernicious effects of European expansion and colonial rule in Africa, the introduction of the transatlantic slave trade, which encouraged the development of African political and economic institutions in an extractive direction, and the use of colonial legislation and institutions to eliminate the development of African commercial agriculture, that might have competed with Europeans. Slavery was certainly a force in Sierra Leone. At the time of colonization there was no strong centralized state in the interior, just many small, mutually antagonistic kingdoms continually raiding one another and capturing one another's men and women. Slavery was endemic, with possibly 50% of the population working as slaves. The disease environment meant that large-scale white settlement was not possible in Sierra Leone, as it was in South Africa. Hence there were no whites competing with the Africans. Moreover, the lack of a mining economy on the scale of Johannesburg meant that, in addition to the lack of demand for African labor from white farms, there was no incentive to create the extractive labor market institutions so characteristic of apartheid South Africa. But other mechanisms were also in play. Sierra Leone's cocoa and coffee farmers did not compete with whites, though their incomes were still expropriated via a government monopoly, the marketing board. Sierra Leone also suffered from indirect rule. In many parts of Africa where the British authorities wished to use indirect rule, they found peoples who did not have a system of centralized authority who could be taken over. For example, in eastern Nigeria the Igbo peoples had no chiefs when the British encountered them in the 19th century.
the British then created chiefs, the Warrant Chiefs. In Sierra Leone, the British would base indirect rule on existing indigenous institutions and systems of authority. Nevertheless, regardless of the historical basis for the individuals recognized as paramount chiefs in 1896, indirect rule, and the powers that it invested in paramount chiefs, completely changed the existing politics of Sierra Leone. For one, it introduced a system of social stratification, the ruling houses, where none had existed previously. A hereditary aristocracy replaced a situation that had been much more fluid and where chiefs had required popular support. Instead what emerged was a rigid system with chiefs holding office for life, beholden to their patrons in Freetown or Britain, and far less accountable to the people they ruled. The British were happy to subvert the institutions in other ways, too, for example, by replacing legitimate chiefs with people who were more cooperative. Indeed, the Margai family, which supplied the first two prime ministers of independent Sierra Leone, came to power in the Lower Banta chieftaincy by siding with the British in the Hutt Tax Rebellion against the reigning chief, Nyama. Nyama was deposed, and the Margais became chiefs and held the position until 2010. What is remarkable is the extent of continuity between colonial and independent Sierra Leone. The British created the marketing boards and used them to tax farmers. Post-colonial governments did the same extracting at even higher rates. The British created the system of indirect rule through paramount chiefs. Governments that followed independence didn't reject this colonial institution, rather, they used it to govern the countryside as well. The British set up a diamond monopoly and tried to keep out African miners. Post-independence governments did the same. It is true that the British thought that building railways was a good way to rule Mendelan. While Siaka Stevens thought the opposite. The British could trust their army and knew it could be sent to Mendelan if a rebellion arose. Stevens, on the other hand, could not do so. As in many other African nations, a strong army would have become a threat to Stevens's rule. It was for this reason that he emasculated the army, cutting it down and privatizing violence through specially created paramilitary units loyal only to him, and in the process, he accelerated the decline of the little state authority that existed in Sierra Leone. Instead of the army, first came the Internal Security Unit, the ISU, which Sierra Leone's long-suffering people knew as, I shoot you. Then came the Special Security Division, the SSD, which the people knew as Usiaka Stevens's dogs. In the end, the absence of an army supporting the regime would also be its undoing. It was a group of only 30 soldiers, led by Captain Valentine Strasser, that pitched the APC regime from power on April 29, 1992. Sierra Leone's development, or lack thereof, could be best understood as the outcome of the vicious circle. British colonial authorities built extractive institutions in the first place, and the post-independence African politicians were only too happy to take up the baton for themselves. The pattern was eerily similar all over sub-Saharan Africa. There were similar hopes for post-independence Ghana, Kenya, Zambia, and many other African countries. Yet in all these cases, extractive institutions were recreated in a pattern predicted by the vicious circle, only they became more vicious as time went by. In all these countries, for example, the British creation of marketing boards and indirect rule were sustained. There are natural reasons for this vicious circle. Extractive political institutions lead to extractive economic institutions, which enrich a few at the expense of many. Those who benefit from extractive institutions thus have the resources to build their, private, armies and mercenaries, to buy. Their judges, 
and to rig their elections in order to remain in power. They also have every interest in defending the system. Therefore, extractive economic institutions create the platform for extractive political institutions to persist. Power is valuable in regimes with extractive political institutions, because power is unchecked and brings economic riches. Extractive political institutions also provide no checks against abuses of power. Whether power corrupts is debatable, but Lord Acton was certainly right when he argued that absolute power corrupts absolutely. We saw in the previous chapter that even when Franklin Roosevelt wished to use his presidential powers in a way that he thought would be beneficial for the society, unencumbered by constraints imposed by the Supreme Court, the inclusive U.S. political institutions prevented him from setting aside the constraints on his power. Under extractive political institutions, there is little check against the exercise of power, however distorted and sociopathic it may become. In 1980 Sam Bangura, then the governor of the central bank in Sierra Leone, criticized Siaka Stevens's policies for being profligate. He was soon murdered and thrown from the top floor of the central bank building onto the aptly named Siaka Stevens Street. Extractive political institutions thus also tend to create a vicious circle because they provide no line of defense against those who want to further usurp and misuse the powers of the state. Yet another mechanism for the vicious circle is that extractive institutions by creating unconstrained power and great income inequality, increase the potential stakes of the political game. Because whoever controls the state becomes the beneficiary of this excessive power and the wealth that it generates, extractive institutions create incentives for infighting in order to control power and its benefits, a dynamic that we saw played out in Maya city-states and in ancient Rome. In this light, it is no Surprise that the extractive institutions that many African countries inherited from the colonial powers sowed the seeds of power struggles and civil wars. These struggles would be very different conflicts from the English Civil War and the Glorious Revolution. They would not be fought to change political institutions, introduce constraints on the exercise of power, or create pluralism but to capture power and enrich one group at the expense of the rest. In Angola, Burundi, Chad, Côte d'Ivoire, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Ethiopia, Liberia, Mozambique, Nigeria, Republic of Congo Brazzaville, Rwanda, Somalia, Sudan, and Uganda, and of course in Sierra Leone, as we will see in more detail in the next chapter. These conflicts would turn into bloody civil wars and would create economic ruin and unparalleled human suffering, as well as cause state failure. From Encomienda to Land Grab On January 14, 1993, Ramiro de Leon Carpio was sworn in as the President of Guatemala. He named Richard Aitkenhead Castillo as his Minister of Finance and Ricardo Castillo Sinibaldi as his Minister of Development. These three men all had something in common. All were direct descendants of Spanish conquistadors who had come to Guatemala in the early 16th century. De Leon's illustrious ancestor was Juan de Leon Cardona, while the Castillos were related to Bernal Diaz del Castillo, a man who wrote one of the most famous eyewitness accounts of the conquest of Mexico. In reward for his service to Hernán Cortés, Díaz del Castillo was appointed governor of Santiago de los Caballeros, which is today the city of Antigua in Guatemala. Both Castillo and de Leon founded dynasties along with other conquistadors, such as Pedro de Alvarado. The Guatemalan sociologist Marta Casos Arzu identified a core group of 22 families in Guatemala that had ties through marriage to another 26 families just outside the core. Her genealogical and political study suggested that these families have controlled economic and political power.
in Guatemala since 1531. An even broader definition of which families were part of this elite suggested that they accounted for just over 1% of the population in the 1990s. In Sierra Leone and in much of sub-Saharan Africa, the vicious circle took the form of the extractive institutions set up by colonial powers, being taken over by post-independence leaders. In Guatemala, as in much of Central America, we see a simpler, more naked form of the vicious circle. Those who have economic and political power structure institutions to ensure the continuity of their power, and succeed in doing so. This type of vicious circle leads to the persistence of extractive institutions and the persistence of the same elites in power together, with the persistence of underdevelopment. At the time of the conquest, Guatemala was densely settled, probably with a population of around 2 million Mayas. Disease and exploitation took a heavy toll as everywhere else in the Americas. It was not until the 1920s that its total population returned to this level. As elsewhere in the Spanish Empire, the indigenous people were allocated to conquistadors in grants of encomienda. As we saw in the context of the colonization of Mexico and Peru, the encomienda was a system of forced labor, which subsequently gave way to other similar coercive institutions, particularly to the repartimiento, also called the mandamiento in Guatemala. The elite, made up of the descendants of the conquistadors and some indigenous elements, not only benefited from the various forced labor systems but also controlled and monopolized trade through a merchant guild, called the Consulado de Comercio. Most of the population in Guatemala was high in the mountains and far from the coast. The high transportation costs reduced the extent of the export economy, and initially land was not very valuable. Much of it was still in the hands of indigenous peoples, who had large communal landholdings called ejidos. The remainder was largely unoccupied and notionally owned by the government. There was more money in controlling and taxing trade, such as it was, than in controlling the land. Just as in Mexico, the Guatemalan elite viewed the Cádiz Constitution, pages 28 to 32, with hostility which encouraged them to declare independence just as the Mexican elites did. Following a brief union with Mexico and the Central American Federation, the colonial elite ruled Guatemala under the dictatorship of Rafael Carrera from 1839 to 1871. During this period the descendants of the conquistadors and the indigenous elite maintained the extractive economic institutions of the colonial era largely unchanged. Even the organization of the Consulado did not alter with independence. Though this was a royal institution, it happily continued under a republican government. Independence then was simply a coup by the pre-existing local elite, just as in Mexico. They carried on as usual with the extractive economic institutions from which they had benefited so much. Ironically enough, during this period the Consulado remained in charge of the economic development of the country. But as had been the case pre-independence, the Consulado had its own interests at heart, not those of the country. Part of its responsibility was for the development of infrastructure, such as ports and roads, but as in Austria-Hungary, Russia, and Sierra Leone, this often threatened creative destruction and could have destabilized the system. Therefore, the development of infrastructure, rather than being implemented, was often resisted. For example, the development of a port on the Sucatepequez coast, bordering the Pacific Ocean, was one of the proposed projects. At the time the only proper ports were on the Caribbean coast, and these were controlled by the Consulado. The Consulado did.
nothing on the Pacific side because a port in that region would have provided a much easier outlet for goods from the highland towns of Mazatenango and Casaltenango, and access to a different market for these goods would have undermined the Consulado's monopoly on foreign trade. The same logic applied to Rhodes, where, again, the Consulado had the responsibility for the entire country. Predictably it also refused to build roads that would have strengthened competing groups or would have potentially undone its monopoly. Pressure to do so again came from western Guatemala and Casaltenango, in the Los Altos region. But if the road between Los Altos and the Sucatepequas coast had been improved, this could have created a merchant class which would have been a competitor to the Consulado merchants in the capital. The road did not get improved. As a result of this elite dominance, Guatemala was caught in a time warp in the middle of the 19th century, as the rest of the world was changing rapidly. But these changes would ultimately affect Guatemala. Transportation costs were falling due to technological innovations such as the steam train, the railways, and new, much faster types of ships. Moreover, the rising incomes of people in Western Europe and North America were creating a mass demand for many products that a country such as Guatemala could potentially produce. Early in the century, some indigo and then cochineal, both natural dyes, had been produced for export, but the more profitable opportunity would become coffee production. Guatemala had a lot of land suitable for coffee, and cultivation began to spread, without any assistance from the Consulado. As the world price of coffee rose and international trade expanded, there were huge profits to be made, and the Guatemalan elite became interested in coffee. In 1871 the long-lasting regime of the dictator Carrera was finally overthrown by a group of people calling themselves liberals, after the worldwide movement of that name. What liberalism means has changed over time. But in the 19th century in the United States and Europe, it was similar to what is today called libertarianism, and it stood for freedom of individuals, limited government, and free trade. Things worked a little differently in Guatemala. Led initially by Miguel Garcia Granados, and after 1873 by Justo Rufino Barrios, the Guatemalan liberals were, for the most part, not new men with liberal ideals. By and large, the same families remained in charge. They maintained extractive political institutions and implemented a huge reorganization of the economy to exploit coffee. They did abolish the Consulado in 1871, but economic circumstances had changed. The focus of extractive economic institutions would now be the production and export of coffee. Coffee production needed land and labor. To create land for coffee farms, the liberals pushed through land privatization in fact really a land grab in which they would be able to capture land previously held communally or by the government. Though their attempt was bitterly contested, given the highly extractive political institutions and the concentration of political power in Guatemala, the elite were ultimately victorious. Between 1871 and 1883 nearly one million acres of land, mostly indigenous communal land and frontier lands, passed into the hands of the elite, and it was only then that coffee developed rapidly. The aim was the formation of large estates. The privatized lands were auctioned off typically to members of the traditional elite or those connected with them. The coercive power of the liberal state was then used to help large landowners gain access to labor by adapting and intensifying various systems of forced labor. In November 1876, President Barrios wrote to all the governors of Guatemala noting that, because the country has extensive areas of land that it needs to exploit by cultivation using the multitude of workers who today, 
remain outside the movement of development of the nation's productive elements, you are to give all help to export agriculture. 1. From the Indian towns of your jurisdiction provide to the owners of fincas, farms, of that department who ask for labor the number of workers they need, be it 50 or 100. The repartimiento, the forced labor draft, had never been abolished after independence but now it was increased in scope and duration. It was institutionalized in 1877 by Decree 177, which specified that employers could request and receive from the government up to 60 workers for 15 days of work, if the property was in the same department, and for 30 days if it was outside it. The request could be renewed if the employer so desired. These workers could be forcibly recruited unless they could demonstrate from their personal workbook that such service had recently been performed satisfactorily. All rural workers were also forced to carry a workbook, called a librita, which included details of whom they were working for and a record of any debts. Many rural workers were indebted to their employers and an indebted worker could not leave his current employer without permission. Decree 177 further stipulated that the only way to avoid being drafted into the repartimiento was to show you were currently in debt to an employer. Workers were trapped. In addition to these laws, numerous vagrancy laws were passed so that anyone who could not prove he had a job would be immediately recruited for the repartimiento or other types of forced labor on the roads or would be forced to accept employment on a farm as in 19th and 20th century south africa land policies after 1871 were also designed to undermine the subsistence economy of the indigenous peoples to force them to work for low wages. The repartimiento lasted until the 1920s. The Librita system and the full gamut of vagrancy laws were in effect until 1945, when Guatemala experienced its first brief flowering of democracy. Just as before 1871, the Guatemalan elite ruled via military strongmen. They continued to do so after the coffee boom took off. Jorge Ubico, president between 1931 and 1944, ruled longest. Ubico won the presidential election in 1931 unopposed, since nobody was foolish enough to run against him. Like the consulado, he didn't approve of doing things that would have induced creative destruction and threatened both his political power and his, and the elite's profits. He therefore opposed industry for the same reason that Francis I in Austria-Hungary and Nicholas I in Russia did. Industrial workers would have caused trouble. In a legislation unparalleled in its paranoid repressiveness, Ubico banned the use of words such as obreros, workers, syndicatos, labor unions, and huelgas, strikes. You could be jailed for using any one of them. Even though Ubico was powerful, the elite pulled the strings. Opposition to his regime mounted in 1944, headed by disaffected university students who began to organize demonstrations. Popular discontent increased, and on June 24, 311 people, many of them from the elite, signed the Memorial de los 311, an open letter denouncing the regime. Ubico resigned on July 1. Though he was followed by a democratic regime in 1945, this was overthrown by a coup in 1954, leading to a murderous civil war. Guatemala democratized again after only 1986. The Spanish conquistadors had no compunction about setting up an extractive political and economic system. That was why they had come all the way to the New World. But most of the institutions they set up were meant to be temporary. The encomienda, for example, was a temporary grant of rights over labor. They did not have a fully worked out plan of how.
they would set up a system that would persist for another 400 years. In fact, the institutions they set up changed significantly along the way, but one thing did not, the extractive nature of the institutions, the result of the vicious circle. The form of extraction changed, but neither the extractive nature of the institutions nor the identity of the elite did. In Guatemala the encomienda, the repartimiento, and the monopolization of trade gave way to the librida and the land grab. But the majority of the indigenous Maya continued to work as low-wage laborers with little education, no rights, and no public services. In Guatemala, as in much of Central America, in a typical pattern of the vicious circle, extractive political institutions supported extractive economic institutions which in turn provided the basis for extractive political institutions and the continuation of the power of the same elite. From Slavery to Jim Crow In Guatemala, extractive institutions persisted from colonial to modern times with the same elite firmly in control. Any change in institutions resulted from adaptations to changing environments as was the case with the land grab by the elite motivated by the coffee boom. The institutions in the U.S. South were similarly extractive until the Civil War. Economics and politics were dominated by the Southern elite, plantation owners with large land and slave holdings. Slaves had neither political nor economic rights, indeed, they had few rights of any kind. The South's extractive economic and political institutions made it considerably poorer than the North, by the middle of the 19th century. The South lacked industry and made relatively little investment in infrastructure. In 1860 its total manufacturing output was less than that of Pennsylvania, New York, or Massachusetts. Only 9% of the Southern population lived in urban areas, compared with 35% in the Northeast. The density of railroads, i.e., miles of track divided by land area, was three times higher in the North than in Southern states. The ratio of canal mileage was similar. Map 18, page 352 shows the extent of slavery by plotting the percentage of the population that were slaves across U.S. counties in 1840. It is apparent that slavery was dominant in the South with some counties, for example, along the Mississippi River having as much as 95% of the population slaves. Map 19, page 353, then shows one of the consequences of this. The proportion of the labor force working in manufacturing in 1880. Though this was not high anywhere by 20th century standards, there are marked differences between the North and the South. In much of the Northeast, more than 10% of the labor force worked in manufacturing. In contrast in much of the South, particularly the areas with heavy concentrations of slaves, the proportion was basically zero. The South was not even innovative in the sectors in which it specialized. From 1837 to 1859, the numbers of patents issued per year for innovations related to corn and wheat were on average 12 and 10, respectively. There was just one per year for the most important crop of the South, cotton. There was no indication that industrialization and economic growth would commence any time soon. But defeat in the Civil War was followed by fundamental economic and political reform at Bayonet Point. Slavery was abolished, and black men were allowed to vote. These major changes should have opened the way for a radical transformation of Southern extractive institutions into inclusive ones and launched the South onto a path to economic prosperity. But in yet another manifestation of the vicious circle, nothing of the sort happened. A continuation of extractive institutions, this time of the Jim Crow kind rather than of slavery, emerged in the South. The phrase Jim Crow, 
which supposedly originated from a jump Jim Crow, an early 19th century satire of black people performed by white performers in blackface, came to refer to the whole gamut of segregationist legislation that was enacted in the South after 1865. These persisted for almost another century, until yet another major upheaval, the civil rights movement. In the meantime, blacks continued to be excluded from power and repressed. Plantation-type agriculture based on low-wage, poorly educated labor persisted, and southern incomes fell further relative to the U.S. average. The vicious circle of extractive institutions was stronger than many had expected at the time. The reason that the economic and political trajectory of the South never changed, even though slavery was abolished and black men were given the right to vote, was because blacks' political power and economic independence were tenuous. The Southern planters lost the war, but would win the peace. They were still organized and they still owned the land. During the war, freed slaves had been offered the promise of 40 acres and a mule when slavery was abolished, and some even got it during the famous campaigns of General William T. Sherman. But in 1865, President Andrew Johnson revoked Sherman's orders, and the hope for land redistribution never took place. In a debate on this issue in Congress, Congressman George Washington Julian presciently noted, of what avail would be an act of Congress totally abolishing slavery? If the old agricultural basis of aristocratic power shall remain? This was the beginning of the redemption of the Old South and the persistence of the old Southern landed elite. The sociologist Jonathan Weiner studied the persistence of the planter elite in five counties of the Black Belt, prime cotton country, of southern Alabama. Tracking families from the U.S. Census and considering those with at least $10,000 of real estate, he found that of the 236 members of the planter elite in 1850, 101 maintained their position in 1870. Interestingly, this rate of persistence was very similar to that experienced in the pre-Civil War period. Of the 236 wealthiest planter families of 1850, only 110 remained so a decade later. Nevertheless, of the 25 planters with the largest landholdings in 1870, 18, 72%, had been in the elite families in 1860, 16 had been in the 1850 elite group. While more than 600,000 were killed in the Civil War, the planter elites suffered few casualties. The law, designed by the planters and for the planters, exempted one slaveholder from military service for every 20 slaves held. As hundreds of thousands of men died to preserve the southern plantation economy, many Big slaveholders and their sons sat out the war on their porches and thus were able to ensure the persistence of the plantation economy. After the end of the war, the elite planters controlling the land were able to re-exert their control over the labor force. Though the economic institution of slavery was abolished, the evidence shows a clear line of persistence in the economic system of the South based on plantation-type agriculture with cheap labor. This economic system was maintained through a variety of channels, including both control of local politics and exercise of violence. As a consequence, in the words of the African-American scholar W.E.B. Du Bois, the South became simply an armed camp for intimidating black folk. In 1865 the state legislature of Alabama passed the Black Code an important landmark toward the repression of black labor. Similar to Decree 177 in Guatemala, the Black Code of Alabama consisted of a vagrancy law and a law against the enticement of laborers. It was designed to impede labor mobility and reduce competition in the labor market, and it ensured that southern planters would still have a reliable low-cost labor pool. Following the Civil War, 
The period called Reconstruction lasted from 1865 until 1877. Northern politicians, with the help of the Union Army, engineered some social changes in the South. But a systematic backlash from the Southern elite in the guise of support for the so-called Redeemers, seeking the South's redemption, recreated the old system. In the 1877 presidential election, Rutherford Hayes needed Southern support in the Electoral College. This college, still used today, was at the heart of the indirect election for president created by the U.S. Constitution. Citizens' votes do not directly elect the president but instead elect electors who then choose the president in the Electoral College, in exchange for their support. In the Electoral College, the Southerners demanded that Union soldiers be withdrawn from the South and the region left to its own devices. Hayes agreed. With Southern support, Hayes became president and pulled out the troops. The period after 1877 then marked the real re-emergence of the pre-Civil War planter elite. The redemption of the South involved the introduction of new poll taxes and literacy tests for voting, which systematically disenfranchised blacks, and often also the poor white population. These attempts succeeded and created a one-party regime under the Democratic Party, with much of the political power vested in the hands of the planter elite. The Jim Crow laws created separate, and predictably inferior, schools. Alabama, for example, rewrote its constitution in 1901 to achieve this. Shockingly, even today Section 256 of Alabama's constitution, though no longer enforced, still states. Duty of legislature to establish and maintain public school system, apportionment of public school fund, separate schools for white and colored children. The legislature shall establish, organize, and maintain a liberal system of public schools throughout the state for the benefit of the children thereof, between the ages of 7 and 21 years. The public school fund shall be apportioned to the several counties in proportion to the number of school children of school age therein, and shall be so apportioned to the schools in the districts or townships in the counties as to provide, as nearly as practicable, school terms of equal duration in such school districts or townships. Separate schools shall be provided for white and colored children and no child of either race shall be permitted to attend a school of the other race. An amendment to strike Section 256 from the Constitution was narrowly defeated, in the state legislature in 2004. Disenfranchisement, the vagrancy laws such as the Black Code of Alabama, various Jim Crow laws, and the actions of the Ku Klux Klan, often financed and supported by the elite, turned the post. Civil War South into an effective apartheid society, where blacks and whites lived different lives. As in South Africa, these laws and practices were aimed at controlling the black population and its labor. Southern politicians in Washington also worked to make sure that the extractive institutions of the South could persist. For instance, they ensured that no federal projects or public works that would have jeopardized Southern elite control over the black workforce ever got approved. Consequently, the South entered the 20th century as a largely rural society with low levels of education and backward technology, still employing hand labor and mule power virtually unassisted by mechanical implements. Though the proportion of people in urban areas increased, it was far less than in the North. In 1900, for example, 13.5% of the population of the South was urbanized, as compared with 60% in the Northeast. All in all, the extractive institutions in the Southern United States, based on the power of the landed elite, plantation agriculture, and low-wage, low-education labor, persisted well into the 20th century.
These institutions started to crumble only after the Second World War and then truly after the civil rights movement destroyed the political basis of the system. And it was only after the demise of these institutions in the 1950s and 60s that the South began its process of rapid convergence to the North. The U.S. South shows another, more resilient side of the vicious circle, as in Guatemala. The southern planter elite remained in power and structured economic and political institutions in order to ensure the continuity of its power. But differently from Guatemala, it was faced with significant challenges after its defeat in the Civil War, which abolished slavery and reversed the total, constitutional exclusion of blacks from political participation. But there is more than one way of skinning a cat. As long as the planter elite was in control of its huge landholdings and remained organized, it could structure a new set of institutions, Jim Crow instead of slavery, to achieve the same objective. The vicious circle turned out to be stronger than many, including Abraham Lincoln, had thought. The vicious circle is based on extractive political institutions creating extractive economic institutions which in turn support the extractive political institutions, because economic wealth and power by political power. When 40 acres and a mule was off the table, the southern planter elite's economic power remained untarnished. And, unsurprisingly and unfortunately, the implications for the black population of the South, and the South's economic development, were the same. The Iron Law of Oligarchy The Solomonic dynasty in Ethiopia lasted until it was overthrown by a military coup in 1974. The coup was led by the Derg, a group of Marxist army officers. The regime that the Derg pitched from power looked like it was frozen in some earlier century, a historical anachronism. The Emperor Haile Selassie would start his day by arriving in the courtyard at the Grand Palace, which had been built by Emperor Menelik II in the late 19th century. Outside the palace would be a crowd of dignitaries anticipating his arrival, bowing and desperately trying to get his attention. The Emperor would hold court in the audience hall, sitting on the imperial throne. Selassie was a small man so that his legs were not left swinging in the air. It was the job of a special pillow-bearer to accompany him wherever he went to make sure there was a suitable pillow to put under his feet. The bearer kept a stock of fifty-two pillows to cope with any situation. Celacy presided over an extreme set of extractive institutions and ran the country as his own private property handing out favors and patronage and ruthlessly punishing lack of loyalty. There was no economic development to speak of in Ethiopia under the Solomonic dynasty. The Derg initially formed out of 108 representatives of different military units from all over the country. The representative of the 3rd Division in Harar province was a major named Mengistu Haile Mariam. Though in their initial declaration of July 4, 1974, the Derg officers declared their loyalty to the emperor, they soon started to arrest members of the government, testing how much opposition it would create. As they became more confident that the support for Selassie's regime was hollow, they moved on the emperor himself, arresting him on September 12. Then the executions began. Many politicians at the core of the old regime were swiftly killed. By December, the Derg had declared that Ethiopia was a socialist state. Selassie died, probably murdered, on August 27, 1975. In 1975 the Derg started nationalizing property, including all urban and rural land and most kinds of private property. The increasingly authoritarian behavior of the regime sparked opposition around the country. Large parts of Ethiopia were put together during the European colonial expansion in the late 19th and early 20th centuries.
by the policies of Emperor Menelik II, the victor of the Battle of Adawa, which we encountered before. Page 237. These included Eritrea and Tigray in the north and the Ogadane in the east. Independence movements in response to the Derg's ruthless regime emerged in Eritrea and Tigray, while the Somali army invaded the Somali-speaking Ogadane. The Derg itself started to disintegrate and split into factions. Major Mengistu turned out to be the most ruthless and clever of them. By mid-1977 he had eliminated his major opponents and effectively taken charge of the regime, which was saved from collapse only by a huge influx of weapons and troops from the Soviet Union and Cuba later, in November of that year. In 1978 the regime organized a national celebration marking the fourth anniversary of the overthrow of Haile Selassie. By this time Mengistu was the unchallenged leader of the Derg. As his residence, the place from where he would rule Ethiopia, he had chosen Selassie's Grand Palace, left unoccupied since the monarchy was abolished. At the celebration, he sat on a gilded armchair, just like the emperors of old, watching the parade. Official functions were now held once again at the Grand Palace, with Mengistu sitting on Haile Selassie's old throne. Mengistu started to compare himself to Emperor Tawadros, who had refounded the Solomonic dynasty in the mid-19th century after a period of decline. One of his ministers, Dawit Wolda Georgis, recalled in his memoir, at the beginning of the revolution all of us had utterly rejected anything to do with the past. We would no longer drive cars, or wear suits, necties were considered criminal. Anything that made you look well off or bourgeois, anything that smacked of affluence or sophistication, was scorned as part of the old order. Then, around 1978, all that began to change. Gradually materialism became accepted, then required. Designer clothes from the best European tailors were the uniform of all senior government officials, and members of the military council. We had the best of everything, the best homes, the best cars, the best whiskey, champagne, food. It was a complete reversal of the ideals of the revolution. Georgies also vividly recorded how Mengistu changed once he became sole ruler. The real Mengistu emerged, vengeful, cruel, and authoritarian. Many of us who used to talk to him with hands in our pockets, as if he were one of us, found ourselves standing stiffly to attention, cautiously respectful in his presence. In addressing him we had always used the familiar form of, you, auntie, now we found ourselves switching to the more formal you, Erziwo. He moved into a bigger, more lavish office in the palace of Menelik. He began using the emperor's cars. We were supposed to have a revolution of equality, now he had become the new emperor. The pattern of vicious circle depicted by the transition between Haile Selassie and Mengistu or between the British colonial governors of Sierra Leone and Siaka Stevens, is so extreme and at some level so strange that it deserves a special name. As we already mentioned in Chapter 4, the German sociologist Robert Michaels called it the Iron Law of Oligarchy. The internal logic of oligarchies, and in fact of all hierarchical organizations, is that, argued Michaels, they will reproduce themselves not only when the same group is in power, but even when an entirely new group takes control. What Michaels did not anticipate perhaps was an echo of Karl Marx's remark that history repeats itself, the first time as tragedy, the second time as farce. It is not only that many of the post-independence leaders of Africa moved into the same residences, made use of the same patronage networks, and employed the same ways of manipulating markets and extracting resources. As had the colonial regimes and the emperors they replaced, but they also made things worse.
It was indeed a farce that the staunchly anti-colonial Stevens would be concerned with controlling the same people, the Mend, whom the British had sought to control, that he would rely on the same chiefs whom the British had empowered and then used to control the hinterland, that he would run the economy in the same way, expropriating the farmers with the same marketing boards and controlling the diamonds under a similar monopoly. It was indeed a farce, a very sad farce indeed, that Laurent Kabila, who mobilized an army against Mobutu's dictatorship with the promise of freeing the people and ending the stifling, and impoverishing corruption and repression of Mobutu's Zaire, would then set up a regime just as corrupt and perhaps even more disastrous. It was certainly farcical that he tried to start a Mobutuesque personality cult aided and abetted by Dominique Sakambi Inongo previously Mobutu's Minister of Information, and that Mobutu's regime was itself fashioned on patterns of exploitation of the masses that had started more than a century, previously with King Leopold's Congo Free State. It was indeed a farce that the Marxist officer Mengistu would start living in a palace, viewing himself as an emperor, and enriching himself and his entourage just like Haile Selassie and other emperors before him had done. It was all a farce, but also more tragic than the original tragedy, and not only for the hopes that were dashed. Stevens and Kabila, like many other rulers in Africa, would start murdering their opponents and then innocent citizens. Mengistu and the Derg's policies would bring recurring famine to Ethiopia's fertile lands. History was repeating itself, but in a very distorted form. It was a famine in Wallo province in 1973 to which Haile Selassie was apparently indifferent that did so much finally, to solidify opposition to his regime. Selassie had at least been only indifferent. Mengistu instead saw famine as a political tool to undermine the strength of his opponents. History was not only farcical and tragic, but also cruel to the citizens of Ethiopia and much of sub-Saharan Africa. The essence of the iron law of oligarchy, this particular facet of the vicious circle, is that new leaders overthrowing old ones with promises of radical change bring nothing but more of the same. At some level, the iron law of oligarchy is harder to understand than other forms of the vicious circle. There is a clear logic to the persistence of the extractive institutions in the U.S. South and in Guatemala. The same groups continued to dominate the economy and the politics for centuries. Even when challenged, as the U.S. Southern planters were after the Civil War, their power remained intact and they were able to keep and recreate a similar set of extractive institutions, from which they would again benefit. But how can we understand those who come to power in the name of radical change re, creating the same system? The answer to this question reveals, once again, that the vicious circle is stronger than it first appears. Not all radical changes are doomed to failure. The glorious revolution was a radical change, and it led to what perhaps turned out to be the most important political revolution of the past two millennia. The French Revolution was even more radical, with its chaos and excessive violence and the ascent of Napoleon Bonaparte, but it did not recreate the Ancien Regime. Three factors greatly facilitated the emergence of more inclusive political institutions following the Glorious Revolution, and the French Revolution. The first was new merchants and businessmen wishing to unleash the power of creative destruction from which they themselves would benefit. These new men were among the key members of the revolutionary coalitions and did not wish to see the development of yet another set of extractive institutions that would again prey on them. The second was the nature of the broad coalition that had formed in both cases. For example, the Glorious Revolution wasn't a coup by a narrow group or a specific narrow interest, but a movement backed by merchants, industrialists, the gentry, and diverse political groupings.
the same was largely true for the French Revolution. The third factor relates to the history of English and French political institutions. They created a background against which new, more inclusive regimes could develop. In both countries there was a tradition of parliaments and power-sharing going back to the Magna Carta in England, and to the assembly of notables in France. Moreover, both revolutions happened in the midst of a process that had already weakened the grasp of the absolutist, or aspiring absolutist, regimes. In neither case would these political institutions make it easy for a new set of rulers or a narrow group to take control of the state, and usurp existing economic wealth and build unchecked and durable political power. In the aftermath of the French Revolution, a narrow group under the leadership of Robespierre and Saint just did take control, with disastrous consequences, but this was temporary and did not derail the path toward more inclusive institutions. All this contrasts with the situation of societies with long histories of extreme extractive economic and political institutions, and no checks on the power of rulers. In these societies, there would be no new strong merchants or businessmen supporting and bankrolling the resistance against the existing regime in part. To secure more inclusive economic institutions, no broad coalitions introducing constraints against the power of each of their members, no political institutions inhibiting new rulers' intent on usurping and exploiting power. In consequence, in Sierra Leone, Ethiopia, and the Congo, the vicious circle would be far harder to resist, and moves toward inclusive institutions far more unlikely to get underway. There were also no traditional or historical institutions that could check the power of those who would take control of the state. Such institutions had existed in some parts of Africa, and some, as in Botswana, even survived the colonial era. But they were much less prominent throughout Sierra Leone's history, and to the extent that they existed, they were warped by indirect rule. The same was true in other British colonies in Africa, such as Kenya and Nigeria. They never existed in the absolutist kingdom of Ethiopia. In the Congo, indigenous institutions were emasculated by Belgian colonial rule and the autocratic policies of Mobutu. In all these societies, there were also no new merchants, businessmen or entrepreneurs supporting the new regimes and demanding secure property rights and an end to previous extractive institutions. In fact, the extractive economic institutions of the colonial period meant that there was not much entrepreneurship, or business left at all. The international community thought that post-colonial African independence would lead to economic growth through a process of state planning and cultivation of the private sector. But the private sector was not there, except in rural areas, which had no representation in the new governments and would thus be their first prey. Most important perhaps, in most of these cases there were enormous benefits from holding power. These benefits both attracted the most unscrupulous men, such as Stevens, who wished to monopolize this power, and brought the worst out of them once they were in power. There was nothing to break the vicious circle. Negative feedback and vicious circles. Rich nations are rich largely because they managed to develop inclusive institutions at some point during the past 300 years. These institutions have persisted through a process of virtuous circles even if inclusive only in a limited sense to begin with, and sometimes fragile, they generated dynamics that would create a process of positive feedback, gradually increasing their inclusiveness. England did not become a democracy after the Glorious Revolution of 1688. Far from it. Only a small fraction of the population had formal representation, but crucially, she was pluralistic. Once pluralism was enshrined, there was a tendency for the institutions to become more inclusive over time, 
even if this was a rocky and uncertain process. In this, England was typical of virtuous circles. Inclusive political institutions create constraints against the exercise and usurpation of power. They also tend to create inclusive economic institutions, which in turn make the continuation of inclusive political institutions more likely. Under inclusive economic institutions, wealth is not concentrated in the hands of a small group that could then use its economic might to increase its political power disproportionately. Furthermore, under inclusive economic institutions there are more limited gains from holding political power, thus weaker incentives for every group and every ambitious, upstart individual to try to take control of the state. A confluence of factors at a critical juncture, including interplay between existing institutions and the opportunities and challenges brought by the critical juncture, is generally responsible for the onset of inclusive institutions, as the English case demonstrates. But once these inclusive institutions are in place, we do not need the same confluence of factors for them to survive. Virtuous circles, though still subject to significant contingency, enable the institution's continuity and often even unleash dynamics taking society toward greater inclusiveness. As virtuous circles make inclusive institutions persist, vicious circles create powerful forces toward the persistence of extractive institutions. History is not destiny, and vicious circles are not unbreakable, as we will see further in Chapter 14. But they are resilient. They create a powerful process of negative feedback, with extractive political institutions forging extractive economic institutions, which in turn create the basis for the persistence of extractive political institutions. We saw this most clearly in the case of Guatemala, where the same elite held power, first under colonial rule. Then in independent Guatemala, for more than four centuries, extractive institutions enrich the elite, and their wealth forms the basis for the continuation of their domination. The same process of the vicious circle is also apparent in the persistence of the plantation economy in the U.S. South, except that it also showcases the vicious circle's great resilience in the face of challenges. U.S. Southern planters lost their formal control of economic and political institutions after their defeat in the Civil War. Slavery, which was the basis of the plantation economy, was abolished, and blacks were given equal political and economic rights. Yet the Civil War did not destroy the political power of the planter elite or its economic basis, and they were able to restructure the system under a different guise but still under their own local political control, and to achieve the same objective, abundance of low-cost labor for the plantations. This form of the vicious circle, where extractive institutions persist because the elite controlling them and benefiting from them persists, is not its only form. At first a more puzzling, but no less real and no less vicious, form of negative feedback shaped the political and economic development of many nations, and is exemplified by the experiences of much of sub-Saharan Africa, in particular Sierra Leone and Ethiopia. In a form that the sociologist Robert Michaels would recognize as the iron law of oligarchy, the overthrow of a regime presiding over extractive institutions heralds the arrival of a new set of masters, to exploit the same set of pernicious extractive institutions. The logic of this type of vicious circle is also simple to understand in hindsight. Extractive political institutions create few constraints on the exercise of power. So there are essentially no institutions to restrain the use and abuse of power by those overthrowing previous dictators, and assuming control of the state, and extractive economic institutions imply that there are great profits and wealth to be made merely by controlling power, expropriating the assets of others, and setting up monopolies. Of course, 
The iron law of oligarchy is not a true law, in the sense that the laws of physics are. It does not chart an inevitable path, as the glorious revolution in England or the Meiji Restoration in Japan illustrate. A key factor in these episodes, which saw a major turn toward inclusive institutions, was the empowerment of a broad coalition that could stand up against absolutism and would replace the absolutist institutions by more inclusive, pluralistic ones. A revolution by a broad coalition makes the emergence of pluralistic political institutions much more likely. In Sierra Leone and Ethiopia, the iron law of oligarchy was made more likely not only because existing institutions were highly extractive, but also because neither the independence movement in the former nor the Derg coup in the latter were revolutions led by such broad coalitions, but rather by individuals and groups seeking power so that they could do the extracting. There is yet another, even more destructive facet of the vicious circle anticipated by our discussion of the Maya city-states in Chapter 5. When extractive institutions create huge inequalities in society and great wealth and unchecked power for those in control, there will be many wishing to fight to take control of the state and institutions. Extractive institutions then not only pave the way for the next regime, which will be even more extractive, but they also engender continuous infighting and civil wars. These civil wars then cause more human suffering and also destroy even what little state centralization these societies have achieved. This also often starts a process of descent into lawlessness, state failure, and political chaos, crushing all hopes of economic prosperity, as the next chapter will illustrate. Why Nations Fail the Origins of Power, Prosperity, and Poverty by Darren Asemoglu and James A. Robinson 13. Why Nations Fail Today Institutions, Institutions, Institutions 13. Why Nations Fail Today How to Win the Lottery in Zimbabwe It was January 2000 in Harare, Zimbabwe. Master of Ceremonies Fallet Chihuahua was in charge of drawing the winning ticket for the National Lottery, organized by a partly state-owned bank, the Zimbabwe Banking Corporation, Zimbank. The lottery was open to all clients who had kept 5,000 or more Zimbabwe dollars in their accounts during December 1999. When Chihuahua drew the ticket, he was dumbfounded. As the public statement of Zimbank put it, Master of Ceremonies Fallet Chihuahua could hardly believe his eyes when the ticket drawn for the Z$100,000 prize was handed to him and he saw His Excellency R.G. Mugabe written on it. President Robert Mugabe, who had ruled Zimbabwe by hook or by crook, and usually with an iron fist, since 1980, had won the lottery which was worth a hundred thousand Zimbabwe dollars, about five times the annual per capita income of the country. Zimbank claimed that Mr. Mugabe's name had been drawn from among thousands of eligible customers. What a lucky man! Needless to say he didn't really need the money. Mugabe had in fact only recently awarded himself and his cabinet salary hikes of up to 200%. The lottery ticket was just one more indication of Zimbabwe's extractive institutions. One could call this corruption, but it is just a symptom of the institutional malaise in Zimbabwe. The fact that Mugabe could even win the lottery if he wanted showed how much control he had over matters in Zimbabwe and gave the world a glimpse of the extent of the country's extractive institutions. The most common reason why nations fail today is because they have extractive institutions. Zimbabwe under Mugabe's regime vividly illustrates the economic and social consequences. Though the national statistics in Zimbabwe are very unreliable, the best estimate is that by 2008, 
Zimbabwe's per capita income was about half of what it was when the country gained its independence in 1980. Dramatic as this sounds, it does not in fact begin to capture the deterioration in living standards in Zimbabwe. The state has collapsed and more or less stopped providing any basic public services. In 2008 to 2009 the deterioration in the health systems led to an outbreak of cholera across the country. As of January 10, 2010, there have been 98,741 reported cases and 4,293 deaths, making it the deadliest cholera outbreak in Africa over the previous 15 years. In the meantime, mass unemployment has also reached unprecedented levels. In early 2009, the UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs claimed that the unemployment rate had hit an incredible 94 percent. The roots of many economic and political institutions in Zimbabwe, as is the case for much of sub-Saharan Africa, can be traced back to the colonial period. In 1890 Cecil Rhodes's British South Africa Company sent a military expedition into the then Kingdom of the Ndebele, based in Matabeleland, and also into the neighboring Mashinaland. Their superior weaponry quickly suppressed African resistance, and by 1901 the colony of southern Rhodesia, named after Rhodes, had been formed in the area that is currently Zimbabwe. Now that the area was a privately owned concession of the British South Africa Company, Rhodes anticipated making money there through prospecting and mining for precious minerals. The ventures never got off the ground, but the very rich farmlands began attracting white migration. These settlers soon annexed much of the land. By 1923 they had freed themselves from the rule of the British South Africa Company and persuaded the British government to grant them self-government. What then occurred is very similar to what had happened in South Africa a decade or so previously. The 1913 Natives Land Act, pages 265 to 266, created a dual economy in South Africa. Rhodesia passed very similar laws, and inspired by the South African model, a white-only apartheid state was constructed soon after 1923. As the European colonial empires collapsed in the late 1950s and early 1960s, the white elite in Rhodesia, led by Ian Smith, comprising possibly 5% of the population, declared independence from Britain in 1965. Few international governments recognized Rhodesia's independence, and the United Nations levied economic and political sanctions against it. The black citizens organized a guerrilla war from bases in the neighboring countries of Mozambique and Zambia. International pressure and the rebellion waged by the two main groups, Mugabe's ZANU, the Zimbabwe African National Union, and ZAPU, the Zimbabwe African People's Union, led by Joshua Komu, resulted in a negotiated end to white rule. The state of Zimbabwe was created in 1980. After independence, Mugabe quickly established his personal control. He either violently eliminated his opponents or co-opted them. The most egregious acts of violence happened in Matabeleland, the heartland of support for Zapu, where as many as 20,000 people were killed in the early 1980s. By 1987 Zapu had merged with ZANU to create ZANU, PF, and Joshua Komu was sidelined politically. Mugabe was able to rewrite the constitution he had inherited as a part of the independence negotiation, making himself president, he had started as prime minister, abolishing white voter roles that were part of the independence agreement, and eventually, in 1990, getting rid of the Senate altogether and introducing positions in the legislature that he could nominate. A de facto one-party state headed by Mugabe was the result. Upon independence, 
Mugabe took over a set of extractive economic institutions created by the white regime. These included a host of regulations on prices and international trade, state-run industries, and the obligatory agricultural marketing boards. State employment expanded rapidly, with jobs given to supporters of ZANU-PF. The tight government regulation of the economy suited the ZANU-PF elites because it made it difficult for an independent class of African businessmen, who might then have challenged the former's political monopoly, to emerge. This was very similar to the situation we saw in Ghana in the 1960s in Chapter 2, pages 64 to 68. Ironically, of course, this left whites as the main business class. During this period the main strengths of the white economy, particularly the highly productive agricultural export sector, was left untouched. But this would last only until Mugabe became unpopular. The model of regulation and market intervention gradually became unsustainable, and a process of institutional change, with the support of the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, began in 1991 after a severe fiscal crisis. The deteriorating economic performance finally led to the emergence of a serious political opposition to ZANU-PF's one-party rule, the Movement for Democratic Change, MDC. The 1995 parliamentary elections were far from competitive. ZANU-PF won 81% of the vote and 118 out of the 120 seats. 55 of these members of parliament were elected unopposed. The presidential election the following year showed even more signs of irregularities and fraud. Mugabe won 93% of the vote, but his two opponents, Abel Muzarewa and Dabaningi Sithole, had already withdrawn their candidacy prior to the election, accusing the government of coercion and fraud. After 2000, Despite all the corruption, ZANU-PF's grip was weakening. It took only 49% of the popular vote, and only 63 seats. All were contested by the MDC, who took every seat in the capital, Harare. In the presidential election of 2002, Mugabe scraped home with only 56% of the vote. Both sets of elections went Zanup's way only because of violence and intimidation, coupled with electoral fraud. The response of Mugabe to the breakdown of his political control was to intensify both the repression and the use of government policies to buy support. He unleashed a full-scale assault on white landowners. Starting in 2000, he encouraged and supported an extensive series of land occupations and expropriations. They were often led by war veterans associations, groups supposedly comprised of former combatants in the War of Independence. Some of the expropriated land was given to these groups, but much of it also went to the ZANU-PF elites. The insecurity of property rights wrought by Mugabe and ZANU-PF led to a collapse of agricultural output and productivity. As the economy crumbled, the only thing left was to print money to buy support, which led to enormous hyperinflation. In January 2009, it became legal to use other currencies, such as the South African Rand, and the Zimbabwean dollar vanished from circulation, a worthless piece of paper. What happened in Zimbabwe after 1980 was commonplace in sub-Saharan Africa since independence. Zimbabwe inherited a set of highly extractive political and economic institutions in 1980. For the first decade and a half, these were maintained relatively untouched. While elections took place, Political institutions were anything but inclusive. Economic institutions changed somewhat, for example, there was no longer explicit discrimination against blacks. But on the whole the institutions remained extractive, with the only difference being that instead of Ian Smith and the whites doing the extracting, 
it was Robert Mugabe and the ZANU-PF elites filling their pockets. Over time the institutions became even more extractive, and incomes in Zimbabwe collapsed. The economic and political failure in Zimbabwe is yet another manifestation of the iron law of oligarchy. In this instance, with the extractive and repressive regime of Ian Smith being replaced by the extractive, corrupt, and repressive regime of Robert Mugabe. Mugabe's fake lottery win in 2000 was then simply the tip of a very corrupt and historically shaped iceberg. Nations fail today because their extractive economic institutions do not create the incentives needed for people to save, invest, and innovate. Extractive political institutions support these economic institutions by cementing the power of those who benefit from the extraction. Extractive economic and political institutions, though their details vary under different circumstances, are always at the root of this failure. In many cases, for example, as we will see in Argentina, Colombia, and Egypt, this failure takes the form of lack of sufficient economic activity, because the politicians are just too happy to extract resources or quash any type of independent economic activity that threatens themselves and the economic elites. In some extreme cases, as in Zimbabwe and Sierra Leone, which we discuss next, extractive institutions pave the way for complete state failure, destroying not only law and order but also even the most basic economic incentives. The result is economic stagnation and, as the recent history of Angola, Cameroon, Chad, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Haiti, Liberia, Nepal, Sierra Leone, Sudan, and Zimbabwe illustrates, civil wars, mass displacements, famines, and epidemics, making many of these countries poorer today than they were in the 1960s. A Children's Crusade On March 23, 1991 a group of armed men under the leadership of Fode Senko crossed the border from Liberia into Sierra Leone and attacked the southern frontier town of Kailahun. Senko, formerly a corporal in the Sierra Leonean army, had been imprisoned after taking part in an abortive coup against Siaka Stevens's government in 1971. After being released, he eventually ended up in Libya where he entered a training camp that the Libyan dictator Colonel Gaddafi ran for African revolutionaries. There he met Charles Taylor, who was plotting to overthrow the government in Liberia. When Taylor invaded Liberia on Christmas Eve 1989, Senko was with him, and it was with a group of Taylor's men, mostly Liberians and Burkinabis, citizens of Burkina Faso, that Senko invaded Sierra Leone. They called themselves the RUF, the Revolutionary United Front, and they announced that they were there to overthrow the corrupt and tyrannical government of the APC. As we saw in the previous chapter, Siaka Stevens and his All People's Congress, the APC, took over and intensified the extractive institutions of colonial rule in Sierra Leone, just as Mugabe and ZANU-PF did in Zimbabwe. By 1985, when Stevens, ill with cancer, brought in Joseph Momo to replace him, the economy was collapsing. Stevens, apparently without irony, used to enjoy quoting the aphorism, the cow eats where it is tethered. And where Stevens had once eaten, Momo now gorged. The roads fell to pieces, and schools disintegrated. National television broadcasts stopped in 1987, when the transmitter was sold by the Minister of Information, and in 1989 a radio tower that relayed radio signals outside Freetown fell down, ending transmissions outside the capital. An analysis published in a newspaper in the capital city of Freetown in 1995 rings very true. By the end of Momo's rule he had stopped paying civil servants, teachers and even paramount chiefs. Central government had collapsed, and then of course we had border incursions, 
rebels, and all the automatic weapons pouring over the border from Liberia. The NPRC, the rebels, and the Sobels, soldiers turned rebels, all amount to the chaos one expects when government disappears. None of them are the causes of our problems, but they are symptoms. The collapse of the state under Momo, once again a consequence of the vicious circle unleashed by the extreme extractive institutions under Stevens, meant that there was nothing to stop the RUF from coming across the border in 1991. The state had no capacity to oppose it. Stevens had already emasculated the military, because he worried they might overthrow him. It was then easy for a relatively small number of armed men to create chaos in most of the country. They even had a manifesto called Footpaths to Democracy, which started with a quote from the black intellectual France Fanon, Each generation must, out of relative obscurity, discover its mission, fulfill it or betray it. The section, What Are We Fighting For?, begins. We continue to fight because we are tired of being perpetual victims of state-sponsored poverty and human degradation, visited on us by years of autocratic rule and militarism. But, we shall exercise restraint and continue to wait patiently at the rendezvous of peace, where we shall all be winners. We are committed to peace, by any means necessary, but what we are not committed to is becoming victims of peace. We know our cause to be just and God slash Allah will never abandon U.S. in our struggle to reconstruct a new Sierra Leone. Though Senko and other RUF leaders may have started with political grievances, and the grievances of the people suffering under the APC's extractive institutions may have encouraged them to join the movement. Early on, the situation quickly changed and spun out of control. The mission of the RUF plunged the country into agony, as in the testimony of a teenager from Geoma, in the south of Sierra Leone. They gathered some of us. They chose some of our friends and killed them, two of them. These were people whose fathers were the chiefs, and they had soldiers' boots and property in their houses. They were shot, for no other reason than that they were accused of harboring soldiers. The chiefs were also killed, as part of the government. They chose someone to be the new chief. They were still saying they had come to free us from the APC. After a point, they were not choosing people to kill, just shooting people. In the first year of the invasion, any intellectual roots that the RUF may have had were completely extinguished. Senko executed those who criticized the mounting stream of atrocities. Soon, few voluntarily joined the RUF. Instead they turned to forcible recruitment, particularly of children. Indeed, all sides did this, including the army. If the Sierra Leonean civil war was a crusade to build a better society, in the end it was a children's crusade. The conflict intensified with massacres and massive human rights abuses, including mass rapes and the amputation of hands and ears. When the RUF took over areas, they also engaged in economic exploitation. It was most obvious in the diamond mining areas, where they press-ganged people into diamond mining, but was widespread elsewhere as well. The RUF wasn't alone in committing atrocities, massacres, and organized forced labor. The government did so as well. Such was the collapse of law and order that it became difficult for people to tell who was a soldier and who was a rebel. Military discipline completely vanished. By the time the war ended in 2001, probably 80,000 people had died and the whole country had been devastated. Roads, houses, and buildings were entirely destroyed. Today, if you go to Koidu, a major diamond, producing area in the east, you'll still see rows of burned-out houses scarred with bullet holes. By 1991 the state in Sierra Leone had totally failed.
Think of what King Xiam started with the Bushang. Pages 133 to 136 he set up extractive institutions to cement his power, and extract the output the rest of society would produce. But even extractive institutions with central authority concentrated in his hands were an improvement over the situation, without any law and order, central authority, or property rights that characterized the Lele society on the other side of the river Kasai. Such lack of order and central authority has been the fate of many African nations in recent decades, partly because the process of political centralization was historically delayed in much of sub-Saharan Africa, but also because the vicious circle of extractive institutions reversed any state centralization that existed, paving the way for state failure. Sierra Leone during her bloody civil war of ten years, from 1991 to 2001, was a typical case of a failed state. It started out as just another country marred by extractive institutions, albeit of a particularly vicious and inefficient type. Countries become failed states not because of their geography or their culture, but because of the legacy of extractive institutions, which concentrate power and wealth in the hands of those controlling the state opening the way for unrest, strife, and civil war. Extractive institutions also directly contribute to the gradual failing of the state by neglecting investment in the most basic public services, exactly what happened in Sierra Leone. Extractive institutions that expropriate and impoverish the people and block economic development are quite common in Africa, Asia, and South America. Charles Taylor helped to start the civil war in Sierra Leone while at the same time initiating a savage conflict in Liberia, which led to state failure there, too. The pattern of extractive institutions collapsing into civil war and state failure has happened elsewhere in Africa. For example, in Angola, Côte d'Ivoire, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Mozambique, Republic of Congo, Somalia, Sudan, and Uganda. Extraction paves the way for conflict, not unlike the conflict that the highly extractive institutions of the Maya city-states generated almost a thousand years ago. Conflict precipitates state failure. So another reason why nations fail today is that their states fail. This, in turn, is a consequence of decades of rule under extractive economic and political institutions. Who is the state? The cases of Zimbabwe, Somalia, and Sierra Leone, even if typical of poor countries in Africa, and perhaps even some in Asia, seem rather extreme. Surely Latin American countries do not have failed states? Surely their presidents are not brazen enough to win the lottery? In Colombia, the Andean Mountains gradually merge to the north with a large coastal plain that borders the Caribbean Ocean. Colombians call this the Tierra Caliente, the hot country, as distinct from the Andean world of the Tierra Fria, the cold country. For the last 50 years, Colombia has been regarded by most political scientists and governments as a democracy. The United States feels happy to negotiate a potential free trade agreement with the country and pours all kinds of aid into it, particularly military aid. After a short-lived military government, which ended in 1958, elections have been regularly held, even though until 1974 a pact rotated political power and the presidency, between the two traditional political parties, the conservatives and the liberals. Still, this pact, the National Front, was itself ratified by the Colombian people via a plebiscite, and this all seems democratic enough. Yet while Colombia has a long history of democratic elections, it does not have inclusive institutions. Instead, its history has been marred by violations of civil liberties, extrajudicial executions violence against civilians, and civil war. Not the sort of outcomes we expect from a democracy.
The civil war in Colombia is different from that in Sierra Leone, where the state and society collapsed and chaos reigned. But it is a civil war nonetheless and one that has caused far more casualties. The military rule of the 1950s was itself partially in response to a civil war known in Spanish simply as La Violencia, or the violence. Since that time quite a range of insurgent groups, mostly communist revolutionaries, have plagued the countryside, kidnapping and murdering. To avoid either of these unpleasant options in rural Colombia, you have to pay the vacuna, literally, the vaccination, meaning that you have to vaccinate yourself against being murdered or kidnapped by paying off some group of armed thugs each month. Not all armed groups in Colombia are communists. In 1981 members of the main communist guerrilla group in Colombia, the Fuerzas Armadas Revolucionarias de Colombia, the FARC, the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, kidnapped a dairy farmer, Jesus Castano, who lived in a small town called Amalfi in the hot country in the northeastern part of the Department of Antioquia. The FARC demanded a ransom amounting to $7,500, a small fortune in rural Colombia. The family raised it by mortgaging the farm, but their father's corpse was found anyway, chained to a tree. Enough was enough for three of Castano's sons, Carlos, Fidel, and Vicente. They founded a paramilitary group, Los Tangueros, to hunt down members of the FARC and avenge this act. The brothers were good at organizing, and soon their group grew and began to find a common interest with other similar paramilitary groups that had developed from similar causes. Colombians in many areas were suffering at the hands of left-wing guerrillas, and right-wing paramilitaries formed in opposition. Paramilitaries were being used by landowners to defend themselves against the guerrillas, but they were also involved in drug trafficking, extortion, and the kidnapping and murder of citizens. By 1997 the paramilitaries, under the leadership of the Castano brothers, had managed to form a national organization for paramilitaries called the Autodefenses Unidas de Colombia, the AUC, United Self-Defense Forces of Colombia. The AUC expanded into large parts of the country, particularly into the hot country, in the departments of Córdoba, Sucre, Magdalena, and Cesar. By 2001 the AUC may have had as many as 30,000 armed men at its disposal, and was organized into different blocks. In Córdoba, the paramilitary bloc A Catatumbo was led by Salvatore Mancuso. As its power continued to grow, the AUC made a strategic decision to get involved in politics. Paramilitaries and politicians courted each other. Several of the leaders of the AUC organized a meeting with prominent politicians in the town of Santa Fe de Relito in Córdoba, a joint document, a pact, calling for the re-founding of the country, was issued and signed by leading members of the AUC, such as Jorge Forti, the nickname for Rodrigo Tovar Pupo, Adolfo Paz, a nom de guerre for Diego Fernando, Udon Berna, Murillo, and Diego Vecino, real name, Edward Cobo Tellez, along with politicians, including national senators William Montes and Miguel de la Espriella. By this point the AUC was running large tracts of Colombia, and it was easy for them to fix who got elected in the 2002 elections for the Congress and Senate. For example, in the municipality of San Onofre, in Sucre, the election was arranged by the paramilitary leader Cadena, Chain. One eyewitness described what happened as follows. The trucks sent by Cadena went around the neighborhoods, corregimientos, and rural areas of San Onofre picking people up. According to some inhabitants, for the 2002 elections hundreds of peasants were taken to the corregimiento plan Parejo, 
so they could see the faces of the candidates they had to vote for in the parliamentarian elections, Jairo Merlano for Senate and Muriel Benito Raboyo for Congress. Cadena put in a bag the names of the members of the municipal council, took out two and said that he would kill them and other people chosen randomly if Muriel did not win. The threat seems to have worked, each candidate obtained 40,000 votes in the whole of Sucre. It is no surprise that the mayor of San Onofre signed the Pact of Santa Fe de Relito. Probably one-third of the congressmen and senators owed their election in 2002 to paramilitary support, and Map 20, page 380, which depicts the areas of Colombia under paramilitary control, shows how widespread their hold was. Salvatore Mancuso himself put it in an interview in the following way. 35% of the Congress was elected in areas where there were states of the self-defense groups. In those states we were the ones collecting taxes, we delivered justice, and we had the military and territorial control of the region. And all the people who wanted to go into politics had to come and deal with the political representatives we had there. It is not difficult to imagine the effect of this extent of paramilitary control of politics and society, on economic institutions and public policy. The expansion of the AUC was not a peaceful affair. The group not only fought against the FARC, but also murdered innocent civilians and terrorized and displaced hundreds of thousands of people from their homes. According to the Internal Displacement Monitoring Center, IDMC, of the Norwegian Refugee Council, in early 2010 around 10% of Colombia's population, nearly 4.5 million people, was internally displaced. The paramilitaries also, as Mancuso suggested, took over the government and all its functions except that the taxes they collected were just expropriation for their own pockets. An extraordinary pact between the paramilitary leader Martin Llanos, real name, Hector German Buitrago, and the mayors of the municipalities of Toromina, Aguazal, Mani, Villanueva, Monterrey, and Sabanalarga, in the department of Casanare in eastern Colombia, lists the following rules to which the mayors had to adhere by order of the paramilitary peasants of Casanare. Map 20, Paramilitary Presence Across Colombia, 1997-2005. 9. Give 50% of the municipality budget to be managed by the paramilitary peasants of Casanare. 10. 10% 10 of each and every contract of the municipality to be given to the paramilitary peasants of Casanare. 11. Mandatory assistance to all the meetings called by the paramilitary peasants of Casanare. 12. Inclusion of the paramilitary peasants of Casanare in every infrastructure project. 13. Affiliation to the new political party formed by the paramilitary peasants of Casanare. 14. Accomplishment of his slash hers governance program. Casanare is not a poor department. On the contrary, it has the highest level of per capita income of any Colombian department, because it has significant oil deposits, just the kind of resources that attract paramilitaries. In fact, once they gained power, the paramilitaries intensified their systematic expropriation of property. Mancuso himself reputedly accumulated $25 million worth of urban and rural property. Estimates of land expropriated in Colombia by paramilitaries are as high as 10% of all rural land. Colombia is not a case of a failed state about to collapse. But it is a state without sufficient centralization and with far from complete authority over all its territory. Though the state is able to provide security and public services in large urban areas such as Bogota and Barranquilla, there are significant parts of the country where it provides few public services and almost no law and order. Instead, 
alternative groups and people, such as Mancuso, control politics and resources. In parts of the country, economic institutions function quite well, and there are high levels of human capital and entrepreneurial skill. In other parts the institutions are highly extractive, even failing to provide a minimal degree of state authority. It might be hard to understand how a situation like this can sustain itself for decades, even centuries. But in fact, the situation has a logic of its own, as a type of vicious circle. Violence, and the absence of centralized state institutions of this type enter into a symbiotic relationship with politicians running the functional parts of the society. The symbiotic relationship arises because national politicians exploit the lawlessness in peripheral parts of the country, while paramilitary groups are left to their own devices by the national government. This pattern became particularly apparent in the 2000s. In 2002 the presidential election was won by Alvaro Uribe. Uribe had something in common with the Castano brothers, his father had been killed by the FARC. Uribe ran a campaign repudiating the attempts of the previous administration to try to make peace with the FARC. In 2002 his vote share was three percentage points higher in areas with paramilitaries than without them. In 2006, when he was re-elected, his vote share was 11 percentage points higher in such areas. If Mancuso and his partners could deliver the vote for Congress and the Senate, they could do so in presidential elections as well, particularly for a president strongly aligned with their worldview and likely to be lenient on them. As Jairo Angarita, Salvatore Mancuso's deputy and the former leader of the AUC's Sinu and San Jorge blocs, declared in September 2005, he was proud to work for the re-election of the best president we have ever had. Once elected, the paramilitary senators and congressmen voted for what Uribe wanted, in particular changing the constitution so that he could be re-elected in 2006, which had not been allowed at the time of his first election, in 2002. In exchange, President Uribe delivered a highly lenient law that allowed the paramilitaries to demobilize. Demobilization did not mean the end of paramilitarism, simply its institutionalization in large parts of Colombia and the Colombian state, which the paramilitaries had taken over and were allowed to keep. In Colombia many aspects of economic and political institutions have become more inclusive over time but certain major extractive elements remain. Lawlessness and insecure property rights are endemic in large swaths of the country, and this is a consequence of the lack of control by the national state in many parts of the country, and the particular form of lack of state centralization in Colombia. But this state of affairs is not an inevitable outcome. It is itself a consequence of dynamics mirroring the vicious circle. Political institutions in Colombia do not generate incentives for politicians to provide public services and law and order in much of the country and do not put enough constraints on them to prevent them from entering into implicit or explicit deals with paramilitaries and thugs. El Corralito Argentina was in the grip of an economic crisis in late 2001. For three years, income had been falling, unemployment had been rising, and the country had accumulated a massive international debt. The policies leading to this situation were adopted after 1989 by the government of Carlos Menem to stop hyperinflation and stabilize the economy. For a time they were successful. In 1991 Menem tied the Argentine peso to the U.S. dollar. One peso was equal to one dollar by law. There was to be no change in the exchange rate. End of story. Well, almost. To convince people that the government really meant to stick to the law, it persuaded people to open bank accounts in U.S. dollars.
dollars could be used in the shops of the capital city of Buenos Aires and withdrawn from cash machines all over the city. This policy may have helped stabilize the economy, but it had one big drawback. It made Argentine exports very expensive and foreign imports very cheap. Exports dribbled to a halt, imports gushed in. The only way to pay for them was to borrow. It was an unsustainable situation. As more people began worrying about the sustainability of the peso, they put more of their wealth into dollar accounts at banks. After all, if the government ripped up the law and devalued the peso, they would be safe with dollar accounts, right? They were right to be worried about the peso. But they were too optimistic about their dollars. On December 1, 2001, the government froze all bank accounts, initially for 90 days. Only a small amount of cash was allowed for withdrawal on a weekly basis. First it was 250 pesos, still worth $250, then 300 pesos. But this was allowed to be withdrawn only from peso accounts. Nobody was allowed to withdraw money from their dollar accounts, unless they agreed to convert the dollars into pesos. Nobody wanted to do so. Argentines dubbed this situation El Corralito, the little corral, depositors were hemmed into a corral like cows, with nowhere to go. In January the devaluation was finally enacted, and instead of there being one peso for one dollar, there were soon four pesos for one dollar. This should have been a vindication of those who thought that they should put their savings in dollars. But it wasn't, because the government then forcibly converted all the dollar bank accounts into pesos, but at the old one-for-one -one exchange rate. Someone who had had $1,000 saved suddenly found himself with only $250. The government had expropriated three-quarters of people's savings. For economists, Argentina is a perplexing country. To illustrate how difficult it was to understand Argentina, the Nobel Prize, winning economist Simon Kuznets once famously remarked that there were four sorts of countries, developed, underdeveloped, Japan, and Argentina. Kuznets thought so because, around the time of the First World War, Argentina was one of the richest countries in the world. It then began a steady decline relative to the other rich countries in Western Europe and North America, which turned, in the 1970s and 80s, into an absolute decline. On the surface of it, Argentina's economic performance is puzzling, but the reasons for its decline become clearer when looked at through the lens of inclusive and extractive institutions. It is true that before 1914, Argentina experienced around 50 years of economic growth, but this was a classic case of growth under extractive institutions. Argentina was then ruled by a narrow elite heavily invested in the agricultural export economy. The economy grew by exporting beef, hides, and grain in the middle of a boom in the world prices of these commodities. Like all such experiences of growth under extractive institutions, it involved no creative destruction and no innovation. And it was not sustainable. Around the time of the First World War, mounting political instability and armed revolts induced the Argentine elites to try to broaden the political system, but this led to the mobilization of forces they could not control and in 1930 came the first military coup. Between then and 1983, Argentina oscillated backward and forward between dictatorship and democracy and between various extractive institutions. There was mass repression under military rule, which peaked in the 1970s with at least 9,000 people and probably far more being illegally executed. Hundreds of thousands were imprisoned and tortured. During the periods of civilian rule there were elections, a democracy of sorts.
but the political system was far from inclusive. Since the rise of Perón in the 1940s, democratic Argentina has been dominated by the political party he created, the Partido Justicialista, usually just called the Peronist Party. The Peronists won elections thanks to a huge political machine, which succeeded by buying votes, dispensing patronage, and engaging in corruption, including government contracts and jobs in exchange for political support. In a sense this was a democracy, but it was not pluralistic. Power was highly concentrated in the Peronist party, which faced few constraints on what it could do, at least in the period when the military restrained from throwing it from power. As we saw earlier, pages 329 to 332, if the Supreme Court challenged a policy, so much the worse for the Supreme Court. In the 1940s, Perón had cultivated the labor movement as a political base. When it was weakened by military repression in the 1970s and 80s, his party simply switched to buying votes from others instead. Economic policies and institutions were designed to deliver income to their supporters, not to create a level playing field. When President Menem faced a term limit that kept him from being re-elected in the 1990s, it was just more of the same, he could simply rewrite the constitution and get rid of the term limit. As El Corralito shows, even if Argentina has elections and popularly elected governments, the government is quite able to override property rights and expropriate its own citizens with impunity. There is little check on Argentine presidents and political elites, and certainly no pluralism. What puzzled Kuznets, and no doubt many others who visit Buenos Aires, is that the city seems so different from Lima, Guatemala City, or even Mexico City. You do not see indigenous people, and you do not see the descendants of former slaves. Mostly you see the glorious architecture and buildings put up during the Bell Epoch, the years of growth under extractive institutions. But in Buenos Aires you see only part of Argentina. Menem, for example, was not from Buenos Aires. He was born in Analaco, in the province of La Rioja, in the mountains far to the northwest of Buenos Aires, and he served three terms as governor of the province. At the time of the conquest of the Americas by the Spanish, this area of Argentina was an outlying part of the Inca Empire and had a dense population of indigenous people. See map 1 on page 17. The Spanish created encomiendas here, and a highly extractive economy developed growing food and breeding mules for the miners in Potosí to the north. In fact, La Rioja was much more like the area of Potosí in Peru and Bolivia than it was like Buenos Aires. In the 19th century, La Rioja produced the famous warlord Facundo Quiroga, who ruled the area lawlessly and marched his army on Buenos Aires. The story about the development of Argentine political institutions is a story about how the interior provinces, such as La Rioja, reached agreements with Buenos Aires. These agreements were a truce, the warlords of La Rioja agreed to leave Buenos Aires alone so that it could make money. In return, the Buenos Aires elites gave up on reforming the institutions of the interior. So Argentina at first appears a world apart from Peru or Bolivia, but it is really not so different once you leave the elegant boulevards of Buenos Aires. That the preferences and the politics of the interior got embedded into Argentine institutions, is the reason why the country has experienced a very similar institutional path to those of other extractive, Latin American countries. That elections have not brought either inclusive political or economic institutions is the typical case in Latin America. In Colombia, paramilitaries can fix one-third of national elections. In Venezuela today, as in Argentina, 
the democratically elected government of Hugo Chavez attacks its opponents, fires them from public sector jobs, closes down newspapers whose editorials it doesn't like, and expropriates property. In whatever he does, Chavez is much more powerful and less constrained than Sir Robert Walpole was in Britain in the 1720s, when he was unable to condemn John Huntridge under the Black Act, pages 302 to 308. Huntridge would have fared much less well in present-day Venezuela or Argentina. While the democracy emerging in Latin America is in principle diametrically opposed to elite rule, and in rhetoric and action it tries to redistribute rights and opportunities away from at least a segment of the elite, its roots are firmly based in extractive regimes in two senses. First, inequities persisting for centuries under extractive regimes make voters in newly emerging democracies vote in favor of politicians, with extreme policies. It is not that Argentinians are just naive and think that Juan Perón or the more recent Peronist politicians such as Menem, or the Kirchners are selfless and looking out for their interests, or that Venezuelans see their salvation in Chávez. Instead, many Argentinians and Venezuelans recognize that all other politicians and parties have for so long failed to give them voice, to provide them with the most basic public services, such as roads and education, and to protect them from exploitation by local elites. So many Venezuelans today support the policies that Chávez is adopting even if these come with corruption and waste, in the same way that many Argentinians supported Perón's policies in the 1940s and 1970s. Second, it is again the underlying extractive institutions that make politics so attractive to and so biased in favor of, strongmen such as Perón and Chávez, rather than an effective party system producing socially desirable alternatives. Perón, Chávez, and dozens of other strongmen in Latin America are just another facet of the iron law of oligarchy, and as the name suggests, the roots of this iron law lies in the underlying elite-controlled regimes. The New Absolutism in November 2009, the government of North Korea implemented what economists call a currency reform. Severe bouts of inflation are often the reasons for such reforms. In France in January 1960, a currency reform introduced a new franc that was equal to 100 of the existing francs. Old francs continued in circulation and people even quoted prices in them as the change to the new francs was gradually made. Finally, old francs ceased to be legal tender in January 2002, when France introduced the euro. The North Korean reform looked similar on the face of it. Like the French in 1960, the North Korean government decided to take two zeros off the currency. 100 old wands, the currency of North Korea, were to be worth one new one. Individuals were allowed to come forward to exchange their old currency for the newly printed currency, though this had to be done in one week, rather than 42 years, as in the French case. Then came the catch, the government announced that no one could convert more than 100,000 won though it later relaxed this to 500,000. 100,000 won was about $40 at the black market exchange rate. In one stroke, the government had wiped out a huge fraction of North Korean citizens' private wealth, we do not know exactly how much, but it is probably greater than that expropriated by the Argentine government in 2002. The government in North Korea is a communist dictatorship opposed to private property and markets. But it is difficult to control black markets, and black markets make transactions in cash. Of course quite a bit of foreign exchange is involved, particularly Chinese currency, but many transactions. Use one. The currency reform was designed to punish people who used these markets and, more specifically, 
to make sure that they did not become too wealthy or powerful enough to threaten the regime. Keeping them poor was safer. Black markets are not the whole story. People in North Korea also keep their savings in wands because there are few banks in Korea, and they are all owned by the government. In effect, the government used the currency reform to expropriate much of people's savings. Though the government says it regards markets as bad, the North Korean elite rather like what markets can produce for them. The leader, Kim Jong-il, has a seven-story pleasure palace equipped with a bar, a karaoke machine, and a mini movie theater. The ground floor has an enormous swimming pool with a wave machine, where Kim likes to use a bodyboard fitted with a small motor. When in 2006 the United States placed sanctions on North Korea, it knew how to really hit the regime where it hurt. It made it illegal to export more than 60 luxury items to North Korea, including yachts, water scooters, racing cars, motorcycles, DVD players, and televisions larger than 29 inches. There would be no more silk scarves, designer fountain pens, furs, or leather luggage. These were exactly the items collected by Kim and his Communist Party elites. One scholar used sales figures from the French company Hennessy to estimate that Kim's annual cognac budget before the sanctions could have been as high as $800,000 a year. It is impossible to understand many of the poorest regions of the world at the end of the 20th century without understanding the new absolutism of the 20th century, communism. Marx's vision was a system that would generate prosperity under more humane conditions and without inequality. Lenin and his Communist Party were inspired by Marx, but the practice could not have been more different from the theory. The Bolshevik Revolution of 1917 was a bloody affair, and there was no humane aspect to it. Equality was not part of the equation, either, since the first thing Lenin and his entourage did was to create a new elite, themselves, at the head of the Bolshevik party. In doing so, they purged and murdered not only non-communist elements, but also other communists who could have threatened their power. But the real tragedies were yet to come, first with the Civil War and then under Stalin's collectivization and his all-too-frequent purges, which may have killed as many as 40 million people. Russian communism was brutal, repressive, and bloody, but not unique. The economic consequences and the human suffering were quite typical of what happened elsewhere, for example, in Cambodia in the 1970s under the Khmer Rouge, in China, and in North Korea. In all cases communism brought vicious dictatorships and widespread human rights abuses. Beyond the human suffering and carnage, the communist regimes all set up various types of extractive institutions. The economic institutions, with or without markets, were designed to extract resources from the people, and by entirely abhorring property rights, they often created poverty instead of prosperity. In the Soviet case, as we saw in Chapter 5, the communist system at first generated rapid growth, but then faltered and led to stagnation. The consequences were much more devastating in China under Mao, in Cambodia under the Khmer Rouge, and in North Korea, where the communist economic institutions led to economic collapse and famine. The communist economic institutions were in turn supported by extractive political institutions, concentrating all power in the hands of communist parties and introducing no constraints on the exercise of this power. Though these were different extractive institutions in form, they had similar effects on the livelihoods of the people as the extractive institutions in Zimbabwe and Sierra Leone. King Cotton Cotton accounts for about 45% of the exports of Uzbekistan, making it the most important crop since the country established independence at the breakup of the Soviet Union.
in 1991. Under Soviet communism all farmland in Uzbekistan was under the control of 2,048 state-owned farms. These were broken up and the land distributed after 1991. But that didn't mean farmers could act independently. Cotton was too valuable to the new government of Uzbekistan's first, and so far only, President, Ismail Karimov. Instead, regulations were introduced that determined what farmers could plant and exactly how much they could sell it for. Cotton was a valuable export, and farmers were paid a small fraction of world market prices for their crop, with the government taking the rest. Nobody would have grown cotton at the prices paid, so the government forced them. Every farmer now has to allocate 35% of his land to cotton. This caused many problems, difficulties with machinery being one. At the time of independence, about 40% of the harvest was picked by combine harvesters. After 1991, not surprisingly, given the incentives that President Karimov's regime created for farmers, they were not willing to buy these or maintain them. Recognizing the problem, Karimov came up with a solution, in fact, a cheaper option than combine harvesters, schoolchildren. The cotton bowls start to ripen and are ready to be picked in early September, at about the same time that children return to school. Karimov issued orders to local governors to send cotton delivery quotas to schools. In early September the schools are emptied of 2.7 million children, 2006 figures. Teachers, instead of being instructors, became labor recruiters. Gulnaz, a mother of two of these children, explained what happens. At the beginning of each school year, approximately at the beginning of September, the classes in school are suspended, and Instead of classes children are sent to the cotton harvest. Nobody asks for the consent of parents. They don't have weekend holidays, during the harvesting season. If a child is for any reason left at home, his teacher or class curator comes over and denounces the parents. They assign a plan to each child, from 20 to 60 kilograms per day depending on the child's age. If a child fails to fulfill this plan then next morning he is lambasted in front of the whole class. The harvest lasts for two months. Rural children lucky enough to be assigned to farms close to home can walk or are bus to work. Children farther away or from urban areas have to sleep in the sheds or storehouses with the machinery and animals. There are no toilets or kitchens. Children have to bring their own food for lunch. The main beneficiaries from all this forced labor are the political elites, led by President Karimov, the de facto king of all Azbiki cotton. The schoolchildren are supposedly paid for their labor, but only supposedly. In 2006, when the world price of cotton was around $1.40 US per kilo, the children were paid about 3 cents for their daily quota of 20 to 60 kilos. Probably 75% of the cotton harvest is now picked by children. In the spring, school is closed for compulsory hoeing, weeding, and transplanting. How did it all come to this? Uzbekistan, like the other Soviet socialist republics, was supposed to gain its independence after the collapse of the Soviet Union and develop a market economy and democracy. As in many other Soviet republics, this is not what happened, however. President Karimov, who began his political career in the Communist Party of the old Soviet Union, rising to the post of first secretary for Uzbekistan at the opportune moment of 1989, just as the Berlin Wall was collapsing, managed to reinvent himself as a nationalist. With the crucial support of the security forces, in December 1991 he won Uzbekistan's first-ever presidential election. After taking power, 
he cracked down on the independent political opposition. Opponents are now in prison or exile. There is no free media in Uzbekistan, and no non-governmental organizations are allowed. The apogee of the intensifying repression came in 2005, when possibly 750, maybe more, demonstrators were murdered by the police and army in Andijan. Using this command of the security forces and total control of the media, Karimov first extended his presidential term for five years, through a referendum, and then won re-election for a new seven-year term in 2000, with 91.2% of the vote. His only opponent declared that he had voted for Karimov. In his 2007 re-election, widely regarded as fraudulent, he won 88% of the vote. Elections in Uzbekistan are similar to those that Joseph Stalin used to organize in the heyday of the Soviet Union. One in 1937 was famously covered by New York Times correspondent Harold Denny, who reproduced a translation from Pravda, the newspaper of the Communist Party, which was meant to convey the tension and excitement of Soviet elections. Midnight has struck. The 12th of December, the day of the first general, equal and direct elections to the Supreme Soviet, has ended. The result of the voting is about to be announced. The commission remains alone in its room. It is quiet, and the lamps are shining solemnly. Amid the general attentive and intense expectation the chairman performs all the necessary formalities before counting of the ballots, checking up by list how many voters there were and how many have voted, and the result is 100%. 100%. What election in what country for what candidate has given a 100% response? The main business starts now. Excitedly the chairman inspects the seals on the boxes. Then the members of the commission inspect them. The seals are intact and are cut off. The boxes are opened. It is quiet. They sit attentively and seriously these election inspectors and executives. Now it is time to open the envelopes. Three members of the commission take scissors. The chairman rises. The tellers have their copybooks ready. The first envelope is slit. All eyes are directed to it. The chairman takes out two slips, white, for a candidate for the Soviet of the Union, and blue for a candidate for the Soviet of Nationalities, and reads loudly and distinctly, Comrade Stalin. Instantly the solemnity is broken. Everybody in the room jumps up and applauds joyously and stormily for the first ballot of the first general secret election, under the Stalinist constitution, a ballot with the name of the constitution's creator. This mood would have captured the suspense surrounding the re-elections of Karimov, who appears an apt pupil of Stalin when it comes to repression and political control and seems to organize elections that compete with those of Stalin in their surrealism. Under Karimov, Uzbekistan is a country with very extractive political and economic institutions. And it is poor. Probably one-third of the people live in poverty, and the average annual income is around $1,000. Not all the development indicators are bad. According to World Bank data, school enrollment is 100%, well, except possibly during the cotton-picking season. Literacy is also very high, though apart from controlling all the media, the regime also bans books and censors the internet. While most people are paid only a few cents a day to pick cotton, the Karimov family and former communist cadres who reinvented themselves after 1989 as the new economic and political elites of Uzbekistan have become fabulously wealthy. The family economic interests are run by Karimov's daughter Gulnora, who is expected to succeed her father as president.
In a country so untransparent and secretive, nobody knows exactly what the Karimov family controls or how much money they earn, but the experience of the U.S. company in Terspan is indicative of what has happened in the Uzbek economy in the last two decades. Cotton is not the only agricultural crop, parts of the country are ideal for growing tea, and in Terspan decided to invest. By 2005 it had taken over 30% of the local market, but then it ran into trouble. Gulnora decided that the tea industry looked economically promising. Soon Interspan's local personnel started to be arrested, beaten up, and tortured. It became impossible to operate, and by August 2006 the company had pulled out. Its assets were taken over by the Karimov family's rapidly expanding tea interests, at the time representing 67% of the market, up from 2% a couple of years earlier. Uzbekistan in many ways looks like a relic from the past, a forgotten age. It is a country languishing under the absolutism of a single family and the cronies surrounding them, with an economy based on forced labor, in fact, the forced labor of children. Except that it isn't. It's part of the current mosaic of societies failing under extractive institutions. And unfortunately it has many commonalities with other former Soviet socialist republics. Ranging from Armenia and Azerbaijan to Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, and Turkmenistan, and reminds us that even in the 21st century, extractive economic and political institutions can take an unashamed atrociously extractive form. Keeping the playing field at an angle the 1990s were a period of reform in Egypt. Since the military coup that removed the monarchy in 1954, Egypt had been run as a quasi-socialist society in which the government played a central role in the economy. Many sectors of the economy were dominated by state-owned enterprises. Over the years, the rhetoric of socialism lapsed, markets opened, and the private sector developed. Yet these were not inclusive markets, but markets controlled by the state and by a handful of businessmen allied with the National Democratic Party NDP, the political party founded by President Anwar Sadat in 1978. Businessmen became more and more involved with the party, and the party became more and more involved with them under the government of Hosni Mubarak. Mubarak, who became president in 1981 following Anwar Sadat's assassination, ruled with the NDP until being forced from power by popular protests and the military in February 2011, as we discussed in the preface, page 1. Major business people were appointed to key government posts in areas closely related to their economic interests. Rashid Mohammad Rashid former president of Unilever AMET, Africa, Middle East, and Turkey, became Minister of Foreign Trade and Industry, Mohamed Zoer Wahid Garana, the owner and managing director of Garana Travel Company, one of the largest in Egypt, became Minister of Tourism, Amin Ahmed Mohamed Osman Abaza, founder of the Nile Cotton Trade Company, the largest cotton exporting company in Egypt, became Minister of Agriculture. In many sectors of the economy, businessmen persuaded the government to restrict entry through state regulation. These sectors included the media, iron and steel, the automotive industry, alcoholic beverages, and cement. Each sector was very concentrated with high entry barriers protecting the politically connected businessmen and firms. Big businessmen close to the regime, such as Ahmed Ez, Iron and Steel, the Soiris family, Multimedia, Beverages, and Telecommunications, and Mohammed Nasir, Beverages and Telecommunications, received not only protection from the state but also government contracts and large bank loans without needing to put up collateral. Ahmed Ez was both the chairman of Ez Steel, the largest company in the country's steel industry, 
producing 70% of Egypt's steel, and also a high-ranking member of the NDP, the chairman of the People's Assembly Budget and Planning Committee, and a close associate of Gamal Mubarak, one of President Mubarak's sons. The economic reforms of the 1990s promoted by international financial institutions and economists were aimed at freeing up markets and reducing the role of the state in the economy. A key pillar of such reforms everywhere was the privatization of state-owned assets. Mexican privatization, pages 38 to 40, instead of increasing competition, simply turned state-owned monopolies into privately owned monopolies, in the process enriching politically connected businessmen such as Carlos Slim. Exactly the same thing took place in Egypt. The business people connected to the regime were able to heavily influence implementation of Egypt's privatization program, so that it favored the wealthy business elite, or the whales, as they are known locally. At the time that privatization began, the economy was dominated by 32 of these whales. One was Ahmed Zayat, at the helm of the Luxor Group. In 1996 the government decided to privatize Al Aram Beverages, ABC, which was the monopoly maker of beer in Egypt. A bid came in from a consortium of the Egyptian finance company, led by real estate developer Farid Saad, along with the first venture capital company formed in Egypt in 1995. The consortium included Fawad Sultan, former Minister of Tourism, Mohammed Nasir, and Mohammed Ragab, another elite businessman. The group was well-connected, but not well-connected enough. Its bid of 400 million Egyptian pounds was turned down as too low. Zayat was better connected. He didn't have the money to purchase ABC, so he came up with a scheme of Carlos Slim, type ingenuity. ABC shares were floated for the first time on the London Stock Exchange, and the Luxor Group acquired 74.9% of those shares at 68.5 Egyptian pounds per share. Three months later the shares were then split in two, and the Luxor Group was able to sell all of them at £52.5 each, netting a 36% profit with which Zayat was able to fund the purchase of ABC for £231 million the next month. At the time, ABC was making an annual profit of around £41.3 million Egyptian pounds, and had cash reserves of £93 million Egyptian pounds. It was quite a bargain. In 1999 the newly privatized ABC extended its monopoly from beer into wine by buying the privatized national wine monopoly Giant Atlas. Giant Atlas was a very profitable company, nestling behind a 3,000% tariff imposed on imported wines, and it had a 70% profit margin on what it sold. In 2002 the monopoly changed hands again when Zayat sold ABC to Heineken for 1.3 billion Egyptian pounds a 563% profit in five years. Mohammed Nasir hadn't always been on the losing side. In 1993 he purchased the privatized El Nasser Bottling Company, which had the monopoly rights to bottle and sell Coca-Cola in Egypt. Nasir's relations with the then Minister of the Public Business Sector, Atefi Bid, allowed him to make the purchase with little competition. Nasir then sold the company after two years for more than three times the acquisition price. Another example was the move in the late 1990s to involve the private sector in the state cinema industry. Again political connections implied that only two families were allowed to bid for and operate the cinemas, one of whom was the Saw Iris family. Egypt today is a poor nation, not as poor as most countries to the south, in sub-Saharan Africa, but still one where around 40% of the population is very poor and lives on less than $2 a day. Ironically, as we saw earlier, pages 61 to 62, 
in the 19th century Egypt was the site of an initially successful attempt at institutional change and economic modernization, under Muhammad Ali, who did generate a period of extractive economic growth before it was effectively annexed to the British Empire. From the British colonial period a set of extractive institutions emerged, and were continued by the military after 1954. There was some economic growth and investment in education, but the majority of the population had few economic opportunities, while the new elite could benefit from their connections to the government. These extractive economic institutions were again supported by extractive political institutions. President Mubarak planned to begin a political dynasty, grooming his son Gamal to replace him. His plan was cut short only by the collapse of his extractive regime in early 2011 in the face of widespread unrest and demonstrations during the so-called Arab Spring. During the period when Nasser was president, there were some inclusive aspects of economic institutions, and the state did open up the education system and provide some opportunities that the previous regime of King Farouk had not. But this was an example of an unstable combination of extractive political institutions, with some inclusivity of economic institutions. The inevitable outcome, which came during Mubarak's reign, was that economic institutions became more extractive, reflecting the distribution of political power in society. In some sense the Arab Spring was a reaction to this. This was true not just in Egypt but also in Tunisia. Three decades of Tunisian growth under extractive political institutions started to go into reverse as President Ben Ali and his family began to prey more and more on the economy. Why Nations Fail Nations fail economically because of extractive institutions. These institutions keep poor countries poor and prevent them from embarking on a path to economic growth. This is true today in Africa, in places such as Zimbabwe and Sierra Leone, in South America, in countries such as Colombia and Argentina, in Asia, in countries such as North Korea and Uzbekistan, and in the Middle East, in nations such as Egypt. There are notable differences among these countries. Some are tropical, some are in temperate latitudes. Some were colonies of Britain, others, of Japan, Spain, and Russia. They have very different histories, languages, and cultures. What they all share is extractive institutions. In all these cases the basis of these institutions is an elite who design economic institutions in order to enrich themselves and perpetuate their power at the expense of the vast majority of people in society. The different histories and social structures of the countries lead to the differences in the nature of the elites and in the details of the extractive institutions. But the reason why these extractive institutions persist is always related to the vicious circle, and the implications of these institutions in terms of impoverishing their citizens are similar, even if their intensity differs. In Zimbabwe, for example, the elite comprise Robert Mugabe and the core of ZANU-PF, who spearheaded the anti-colonial fight in the 1970s. In North Korea, they are the clique around Kim Jong-il and the Communist Party. In Uzbekistan it is President Islam Karimov, his family, and his reinvented Soviet Union era cronies. These groups are obviously very different, and these differences, along with the variegated polities and economies they govern, mean that the specific form the extractive institutions take differs. For instance, because North Korea was created by a communist revolution, it takes as its political model the one-party rule of the Communist Party. Though Mugabe did invite the North Korean military into Zimbabwe in the 1980s to massacre his opponents in Matabeleland, such a model for extractive political institutions is not applicable in Zimbabwe.
Instead, because of the way he came to power in the anti-colonial struggle, Mugabe had to cloak his rule with elections. Even if for a while he managed actually to engineer a constitutionally sanctified one-party state. In contrast, Colombia has had a long history of elections, which emerged historically as a method for sharing power between the liberal and conservative parties, in the wake of independence from Spain. Not only is the nature of elites different, but their numbers are. In Uzbekistan, Karimov could hijack the remnants of the Soviet state, which gave him a strong apparatus to suppress and murder alternative elites. In Colombia, the lack of authority of the central state in parts of the country has naturally led to much more fragmented elites, in fact, so much so that they sometimes murder one another. Nevertheless, despite these variegated elites and political institutions, these institutions often manage to cement and reproduce the power of the elite that created them. But sometimes the infighting they induce leads to the collapse of the state, as in Sierra Leone. Just as different histories and structures mean that the identity of elites, and the details of extractive political institutions differ, so do the details of the extractive economic institutions that the elite set up. In North Korea, the tools of extraction were again inherited from the communist toolkit, the abolition of private property, state-run farms, and industry. In Egypt, the situation was quite similar under the avowedly socialist military regime created by Colonel Nasser, after 1952. Nasser sided with the Soviet Union in the Cold War, expropriating foreign investments, such as the British-owned Suez Canal, and took into public ownership much of the economy. However, the situation in Egypt in the 1950s and 60s was very different from that in North Korea in the 1940s. It was much easier for the North Koreans to create a more radically communist-style economy since they could expropriate former Japanese assets and build on the economic model of the Chinese Revolution. In contrast, the Egyptian Revolution was more a coup by a group of military officers. When Egypt changed sides in the Cold War and became pro-Western, it was therefore relatively easy, as well as expedient, for the Egyptian military to change from central command to crony capitalism as a method of extraction. Even so, the better economic performance of Egypt compared with North Korea, was a consequence of the more limited extractive nature of Egyptian institutions. For one thing, lacking the stifling control of the North Korean Communist Party, the Egyptian regime had to placate its population in a way that the North Korean regime does not. For another, even crony capitalism generates some incentives for investment, at least among those favored by the regime, that are totally absent in North Korea. Though these details are all important and interesting, the more critical lessons are in the big picture, which reveals that in each of these cases, Extractive political institutions have created extractive economic institutions, transferring wealth and power toward the elite. The intensity of extraction in these different countries obviously varies and has important consequences for prosperity. In Argentina, for example, the constitution and democratic elections do not work well to promote pluralism, but they do function much better than in Colombia. At least the state can claim the monopoly of violence in Argentina. Partly as a consequence, income per capita in Argentina is double that of Colombia. The political institutions of both countries do a much better job of restraining elites than those in Zimbabwe and Sierra Leone, and as a result, Zimbabwe and Sierra Leone are much poorer than Argentina and Colombia. The vicious circle also implies that even when extractive institutions lead to the collapse of the state, as in Sierra Leone and Zimbabwe, this doesn't put a conclusive end to the rule of these institutions.
We have already seen that civil wars and revolutions, while they may occur during critical junctures, do not necessarily lead to institutional change. The events in Sierra Leone since the Civil War ended in 2002 vividly illustrate this possibility. In 2007, in a democratic election, the old party of Siaka Stevens, the APC, returned to power. Though the man who won the presidential election, Ernest by Koroma, had no association with the old APC governments, many of his cabinet did. Two of Stevens's sons, Bakari and Django, were even made ambassadors to the United States and Germany. In a sense this is a more volatile version of what we saw happen in Colombia. There the lack of state authority in many parts of the country persists over time, because it is in the interests of part of the national political elite to allow it to do so, but the core state institutions are also strong enough to prevent this disorder from turning into complete chaos. In Sierra Leone, partly because of the more extractive nature of economic institutions and partly because of the country's history of highly extractive political institutions, the society has not only suffered economically but has also tipped between complete disorder and some sort of order. Still, the long-run effect is the same, the state all but remains absent, and institutions are extractive. In all these cases there has been a long history of extractive institutions since at least the 19th century. Each country is trapped in a vicious circle. In Colombia and Argentina, they are rooted in the institutions of Spanish colonial rule, pages 9 to 19. Zimbabwe and Sierra Leone originated in British colonial regimes set up in the late 19th century. In Sierra Leone, in the absence of white settlers, these regimes built extensively on pre-colonial extractive structures of political power and intensified them. These structures themselves were the outcome of a long vicious circle that featured lack of political centralization and the disastrous effects of the slave trade. In Zimbabwe, there was much more of a construction of a new form of extractive institutions, because the British South Africa Company created a dual economy. Uzbekistan could take over the extractive institutions of the Soviet Union and, like Egypt, modify them into crony capitalism. The Soviet Union's extractive institutions themselves were in many ways a continuation of those of the Tsarist regime again in a pattern predicated on the iron law of oligarchy. As these various vicious circles played out in different parts of the world over the past 250 years, world inequality emerged, and persists. The solution to the economic and political failure of nations today is to transform their extractive institutions toward inclusive ones. The vicious circle means that this is not easy but it is not impossible, and the iron law of oligarchy is not inevitable. Either some pre-existing inclusive elements in institutions, or the presence of broad coalitions leading the fight against the existing regime, or just the contingent nature of history, can break vicious circles. Just like the civil war in Sierra Leone, the glorious revolution in 1688 was a struggle for power but it was a struggle of a very different nature than the civil war in Sierra Leone. Conceivably some in Parliament fighting to remove James II in the wake of the Glorious Revolution imagined themselves playing the role of the new absolutist, as Oliver Cromwell did after the English Civil War. But the fact that Parliament was already powerful and made up of a broad coalition consisting of different economic interests and different points of view made the iron law of oligarchy less likely to apply in 1688. And it was helped by the fact that luck was on the side of Parliament against James II. In the next chapter, we will see other examples of countries that have managed to break the mold and transform their institutions for the better.
even after a long history of extractive institutions. Why Nations Fail The Origins of Power, Prosperity, and Poverty by Darren Asemoglu and James A. Robinson 14. Breaking the Mold How a Few Countries Changed Their Economic Trajectory by Changing Their Institutions 14. Breaking the Mold Three African Chiefs On September 6, 1895, the ocean liner Tantalon Castle docked at Plymouth on the southern coast of England. Three African chiefs, Kama of the Nguado, Bathoan of the Nguates, and Sebel of the Quina, disembarked and took the 810 express train to Paddington Station, London. The three chiefs had come to Britain on a mission, to save their and five other Tswana states from Cecil Rhodes. The Nguado, Nguates, and Quina were three of the eight Tswana states comprising what was then known as Bechuanaland which would become Botswana after independence in 1966. The tribes had been trading with Europeans for most of the 19th century. In the 1840s, the famous Scottish missionary David Livingstone had traveled extensively in Bechuanaland and converted King Setchell of the Quina to Christianity. The first translation of the Bible into an African language was in Setswana, the language of the Tswana. In 1885 Britain had declared Bechuanaland a protectorate. The Tswana were content with the arrangement, as they thought this would bring them protection from further European invasions, particularly from the Boers, with whom they had been clashing since the Great Trek in 1835, a migration of thousands of Boers into the interior to escape from British colonialism. The British, on the other hand, wanted control of the area to block both further expansions by the Boers, pages 260 to 261, and possible expansions by Germans, who had annexed the area of southwest Africa corresponding to today's Namibia. The British did not think that a full scale colonization was worthwhile. The High Commissioner Ray summarized the attitudes of the British government in 1885 clearly. We have no interest in the country to the north of the Molope, the Bechuanaland Protectorate, except as a road to the interior. We might therefore confine ourselves for the present to preventing that part of the protectorate being occupied by either filibusters or foreign powers doing as little in the way of administration or settlement as possible. But things changed for the Tswana in 1889 when Cecil Rhodes's British South Africa Company started expanding north, out of South Africa, expropriating great swaths of land that would eventually become northern and southern Rhodesia, now Zambia and Zimbabwe. By 1895, the year of the three chiefs' visit to London, Rhodes had his eye on territories to the southwest of Rhodesia, Bechuanaland. The chiefs knew that only disaster and exploitation lay ahead for territories if they fell under the control of Rhodes. Though it was impossible for them to defeat Rhodes militarily, they were determined to fight him any way they could. They decided to opt for the lesser of two evils, greater control by the British rather than annexation by Rhodes. With the help of the London Missionary Society, they travelled to London to try to persuade Queen Victoria and Joseph Chamberlain, then Colonial Secretary, to take greater control of Bechuanaland and protect it from Rhodes. On September 11, 1895, they had their first meeting with Chamberlain. Sebel spoke first, then Bathoan, and finally Kama. Chamberlain declared that he would consider imposing British control to protect the tribes from Rhodes. In the meantime, the chiefs quickly embarked on a nationwide speaking tour to drum up popular support for their requests. They visited and spoke at Windsor and Reading, close to London, in Southampton on the south coast, and in Leicester and Birmingham, in Chamberlain's political support base, the Midlands. They went north to industrial Yorkshire, to Sheffield, 
Leeds, Halifax, and Bradford. They also went west to Bristol and then up to Manchester and Liverpool. Meanwhile, back in South Africa, Cecil Rhodes was making preparations for what would become the disastrous Jameson Raid, an armed assault on the Boer Republic of the Transvaal, despite Chamberlain's strong objections. These events likely made Chamberlain much more sympathetic to the chief's plight than he might have been otherwise. On November 6, they met with him again in London. The chief spoke through an interpreter. Chamberlain, I will speak about the lands of the chiefs, and about the railway, and about the law which is to be observed in the territory of the chiefs. Now let us look at the map. We will take the land that we want for the railway, and no more. Comma, I say, that if Mr. Chamberlain will take the land himself, I will be content. Chamberlain, then tell him that I will make the railway myself by the eyes of one whom I will send and I will take only as much as I require, and will give compensation if what I take is of value. Comma, I would like to know how, i.e., where, the railway will go. Chamberlain, it shall go through his territory but shall be fenced in, and we will take no land. Comma, I trust that you will do this work as for myself, and treat me fairly in this matter. Chamberlain, I will guard your interests. The next day, Edward Fairfield, at the colonial office, explained Chamberlain's settlement in more detail. Each of the three chiefs, comma, Sebel and Bathowen, shall have a country within which they shall live as hitherto under the protection of the queen. The queen shall appoint an officer to reside with them. The chiefs will rule their own people much as at present. Rhodes's reaction to being outmaneuvered by the three African chiefs was predictable. He cabled to one of his employees, saying, I do object to being beaten by three canting natives. The chiefs in fact had something valuable that they had protected from Rhodes and would subsequently protect from British indirect rule. By the 19th century, the Tswana states had developed a core set of political institutions. These involved both an unusual degree, by sub-Saharan African standards, of political centralization and collective decision-making procedures that can even be viewed as a nascent, primitive form of pluralism. Just as the Magna Carta enabled the participation of barons into the political decision-making process, and put some restrictions on the actions of the English monarchs, the political institutions of the Tswana, in particular the Kotla, also encouraged political participation and constrained chiefs. The South African anthropologist Isaac Shapra describes how the Kotla worked as follows. All matters of tribal policy are dealt with finally before a general assembly of the adult males in the chief's Kotla, council place. Such meetings are very frequently held, among the topics discussed, are tribal disputes, quarrels between the chief and his relatives, the imposition of new levies, the undertaking of new public works, the promulgation of new decrees by the chief, it is not unknown for the tribal assembly to overrule the wishes of the chief. Since anyone may speak, these meetings enable him to ascertain the feelings of the people generally and provide the latter with an opportunity of stating their grievances. If the occasion calls for it, he and his advisers may be taken severely to task, for the people are seldom afraid to speak openly and frankly. Beyond the Kotla, the Tswana chieftaincy was not strictly hereditary but open to any man demonstrating significant talent and ability. Anthropologist John Komarov studied in detail the political history of another of the Tswana states, the Rolong. He showed that though in appearance the Tswana had clear rules stipulating how the chieftaincy was to be inherited, in practice these rules were interpreted to remove bad rulers and allow talented candidates to become chief. He showed that winning the chieftaincy was a matter of achievement but was then rationalized so that the successful competitor appeared to be the rightful heir.
that Swana captured this idea with a proverb, with a tinge of constitutional monarchy, Kosi Kokosi Ka Moraf, the king is king by the grace of the people. The Tswana chiefs continued in their attempts to maintain their independence from Britain and preserve their indigenous institutions. After their trip to London, they conceded the construction of railways in Bechuanaland, but limited the intervention of the British in other aspects of economic and political life. They were not opposed to the construction of the railways certainly not for the same reasons as the Austro-Hungarian and Russian monarchs blocked railways. They just realized that railways, like the rest of the policies of the British, would not bring development to Bechuanaland as long as it was under colonial control. The early experience of Quet Mossier, president of independent Botswana from 1980 to 1998, explains why. Mossier was an enterprising farmer in the 1950s. He developed new cultivation techniques for sorghum and found a potential customer in Vryberg Milling, a company located across the border in South Africa. He went to the railway station master at Lobatz in Bechuanaland and asked to rent two rail trucks to move his crop to Vryberg. The station master refused. Then he got a white friend to intervene. The station master reluctantly agreed, but quoted Mossier four times the rate for whites. Mossier gave up and concluded, it was the practice of the whites, not just the laws prohibiting Africans from owning freehold land or holding trading licenses that kept blacks from developing enterprises, in Bechuanaland. All in all, the chiefs, and the Tswana people, had been lucky. Perhaps against all odds, they succeeded in preventing Rhodes's takeover. As Bechuanaland was still marginal for the British, the establishment of indirect rule there did not create the type of vicious circle playing out in Sierra Leone, pages 335 to 344. They also avoided the kind of colonial expansion that went on in the interior of South Africa that would turn those lands into reservoirs of cheap labor for white miners or farmers. The early stages of the process of colonization are a critical juncture for most societies, a crucial period during which events that will have important long-term consequences for their economic and political development, transpire. As we discussed in Chapter 9, most societies in Sub-Saharan Africa, just as those in South America and South Asia, witnessed the establishment or intensification of extractive institutions during colonization. The Tswana would instead avoid both intense indirect rule and the far worse fate that would have befallen them had Rhodes succeeded in annexing their lands. This was not just blind luck, however. It was once again a result of the interplay between the existing institutions shaped by the institutional drift of the Tswana people, and the critical juncture brought about by colonialism. The three chiefs had made their own luck by taking the initiative and traveling to London, and they were able to do this because they had an unusual degree of authority, compared with other tribal leaders in sub-Saharan Africa, owing to the political centralization that Tswana tribes had achieved and perhaps they also had an unusual degree of legitimacy, because of the modicum of pluralism embedded in their tribal institutions. Another critical juncture at the end of the colonial period would be more central to the success of Botswana, enabling it to develop inclusive institutions. By the time Bechuanaland became independent in 1966 under the name Botswana, the lucky success of Chief Sebel, Bathoan, and Kama was long in the past. In the intervening years, the British invested little in Bechuanaland. At independence, Botswana was one of the poorest countries in the world, it had a total of 12 kilometers of paved roads, 22 citizens who had graduated from university, and 100 from secondary school. To top it all off, 
it was almost completely surrounded by the white regimes of South Africa, Namibia, and Rhodesia, all of which were hostile to independent African countries run by blacks. It would have been on few people's list of countries most likely to succeed. Yet over the next 45 years, Botswana would become one of the fastest growing countries in the world. Today Botswana has the highest per capita income in sub-Saharan Africa, and is at the same level as successful Eastern European countries such as Estonia and Hungary, and the most successful Latin American nations, such as Costa Rica. How did Botswana break the mold? By quickly developing inclusive economic and political institutions after independence. Since then, it has been democratic, holds regular and competitive elections, and has never experienced civil war or military intervention. The government set up economic institutions enforcing property rights, ensuring macroeconomic stability, and encouraging the development of an inclusive market economy. But of course, the more challenging question is, how did Botswana manage to establish a stable democracy and pluralistic institutions, and choose inclusive economic institutions, while most other African countries did the opposite? To answer this, we have to understand how a critical juncture, this time the end of colonial rule, interacted with Botswana's existing institutions. In most of sub-Saharan Africa, for example, for Sierra Leone and Zimbabwe, independence was an opportunity missed, accompanied by the recreation of the same type of extractive institutions that existed during the colonial period. Early stages of independence would play out very differently in Botswana again largely because of the background created by Tswana historical institutions. In this, Botswana exhibited many parallels to England on the verge of the Glorious Revolution. England had achieved rapid political centralization under the Tudors and had the Magna Carta and the tradition of Parliament, that could at least aspire to constrain monarchs and ensure some degree of pluralism. Botswana also had some amount of state centralization and relatively pluralistic tribal institutions that survived colonialism. England had a newly forming broad coalition, consisting of Atlantic traders, industrialists, and the commercially minded gentry, that was in favor of well-enforced property rights. Botswana had its coalition in favor of secure procedure rights, the Tswana chiefs, and elites who owned the major assets in the economy, cattle. Even though land was held communally, cattle was private property in the Tswana states, and the elites were similarly in favor of well-enforced property rights. All this of course is not denying the contingent path of history. Things would have turned out very differently in England if parliamentary leaders and the new monarch had attempted to use the Glorious Revolution to usurp power. Similarly, things could have turned out very differently in Botswana, especially if it hadn't been so fortunate as to have leaders such as Suretz Kama, or Kwet Masire, who decided to contest power in elections rather than subvert the electoral system, as many post-independence leaders in sub-Saharan Africa did. At independence the Tswana emerged with a history of institutions enshrining limited chieftaincy, and some degree of accountability of chiefs to the people. The Tswana were of course not unique in Africa for having institutions like this, but they were unique in the extent to which these institutions survived the colonial period unscathed. British rule had been all but absent. Bechuanaland was administered from Mafeking, in South Africa, and it was only during the transition to independence in the 1960s that the plans for the capital of Gaborone, were laid out. The capital and the new structures there were not meant to expunge the indigenous institutions, but to build on them. As Gaborone was constructed, new gotlas were planned along with it. Independence was also a relatively orderly affair, 
The drive for independence was led by the Botswana Democratic Party, BDP, founded in 1960 by Kwet Masayer and Saretz Kama. Kama was the grandson of King Kama III, his given name, Saretz, means, the clay that binds together. It was to be an extraordinarily apt name. Kama was the hereditary chief of the Nguado, and most of the Tswana chiefs and elites joined the Botswana Democratic Party. Botswana didn't have a marketing board, because the British had been so uninterested in the colony. The BDP quickly set one up in 1967, the Botswana Meat Commission. But instead of expropriating the ranchers and cattle owners, the Meat Commission played a central role in developing the cattle economy. It put up fences to control foot and mouth disease and promoted exports, which would both contribute to economic development and increase the support for inclusive economic institutions. Though the early growth in Botswana relied on meat exports, things changed dramatically when diamonds were discovered. The management of natural resources in Botswana also differed markedly from that in other African nations. During the colonial period, the Tswana chiefs had attempted to block prospecting for minerals in Bechuanaland, because they knew that if Europeans discovered precious metals or stones, their autonomy would be over. The first big diamond discovery was under Nguado land, Suret's Kama's traditional homeland. Before the discovery was announced, Kama instigated a change in the law so that all subsoil mineral rights were vested in the nation, not the tribe. This ensured that diamond wealth would not create great inequities in Botswana. It also gave further impetus to the process of state centralization as diamond revenues could now be used for building a state bureaucracy and infrastructure and for investing in education. In Sierra Leone and many other sub-Saharan African nations, diamonds fueled conflict between different groups and helped to sustain civil wars, earning the label blood diamonds for the carnage brought about by the wars fought over their control. In Botswana, diamond revenues were managed for the good of the nation. The change in subsoil mineral rights was not the only policy of state building that Suretz Kama's government implemented. Ultimately, the Chieftaincy Act of 1965 passed by the Legislative Assembly prior to independence, and the Chieftaincy Amendment Act of 1970 would continue the process of political centralization enshrining the power of the state and the elected president by removing from chiefs the right to allocate land and enabling the president to remove a chief from office if necessary. Another facet of political centralization was the effort to unify the country further. For example, with legislation ensuring that only Setswana and English were to be taught in school. Today Botswana looks like a homogenous country, without the ethnic and linguistic fragmentation associated with many other African nations. But this was an outcome of the policy to have only English and a single national language, Setswana, taught in schools to minimize conflict between different tribes and groups within society. The last census to ask questions about ethnicity was the one taken in 1946 which revealed considerable heterogeneity in Botswana. In the Nguado Reserve, for example, only 20% of the population identified themselves as pure Nguado. Though there were other Tswana tribes present, there were also many non-Tswana groups whose first language was not Setswana. This underlying heterogeneity has been modulated both by the policies of the post-independence government and by the relatively inclusive institutions of the Tswana tribes in the same way as heterogeneity in Britain, for example, between the English and the Welsh, has been modulated by the British state. The Botswanan state did the same. Since independence, the census in Botswana has never asked about ethnic heterogeneity, because in Botswana everyone is Tswana.
Botswana achieved remarkable growth rates after independence because Soretz Kama, Quet Masair, and the Botswana Democratic Party led Botswana onto a path of inclusive economic and political institutions. When the diamonds came on stream in the 1970s, they did not lead to civil war, but provided a strong fiscal base for the government, which would use the revenues to invest in public services. There was much less incentive to challenge or overthrow the government and control the state. Inclusive political institutions bred political stability and supported inclusive economic institutions. In a pattern familiar from the virtuous circle described in Chapter 11, inclusive economic institutions increased the viability and durability of inclusive political institutions. Botswana broke the mold because it was able to seize a critical juncture, post-colonial independence, and set up inclusive institutions. The Botswana Democratic Party and the traditional elites, including Kama himself, did not try to form a dictatorial regime or set up extractive institutions that might have enriched them at the expense of society. This was once again an outcome of the interplay between a critical juncture and existing institutions. As we have seen, differently from almost anywhere else in sub-Saharan Africa, Botswana already had tribal institutions that had achieved some amount of centralized authority and contained important pluralistic features. Moreover, the country had economic elites who themselves had much to gain from secure property rights. No less important, the contingent path of history worked in Botswana's favor. It was particularly lucky because Soretz Kama and Quet Masire were not Siaka Stevens and Robert Mugabe. The former worked hard and honestly to build inclusive institutions on the foundations of the Tswana's tribal institutions. All this made it more likely that Botswana would succeed in taking a path toward inclusive institutions, whereas much of the rest of sub-Saharan Africa did not even try, or failed outright. The End of the Southern Extraction It was December 1, 1955. The city of Montgomery, Alabama, arrest warrant lists the time that the offense occurred as 6.06 .06 p.m. James Blake, a bus driver, was having trouble, he called the police, and officers Day and Mixon arrived on the scene. They noted in their report. We received a call upon arrival the bus operator said he had a colored female sitting in the white section of the bus, and would not move back. We also saw her. The bus operator signed a warrant for her. Rosa Parks, C.F., was charged with Chapter 6, Section 11 of the Montgomery City Code. Rosa Parks's offense was to sit in a section of the Cleveland Avenue bus reserved for whites, a crime under Alabama's Jim Crow laws. Parks was fined $10 in addition to court fees of $4. Rosa Parks wasn't just anybody. She was already the secretary of the Montgomery chapter of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP, which had long been struggling to change the institutions of the U.S. South. Her arrest triggered a mass movement, the Montgomery Bus Boycott, masterminded by Martin Luther King, Jr. by December 3rd. King and other black leaders had organized a coordinated bus boycott, convincing all black people that they should not ride on any bus in Montgomery. The boycott was successful and it lasted until December 20, 1956. It set in motion a process that culminated in the U.S. Supreme Court ruling that the laws that segregated buses in Alabama and Montgomery were unconstitutional. The Montgomery bus boycott was a key moment in the civil rights movement in the U.S. South. This movement was part of a series of events and changes that finally broke the mold in the South and led to a fundamental change of institutions, as we saw in Chapter 12, after the Civil War.
Southern landowning elites had managed to recreate the extractive economic and political institutions that had dominated the South before the Civil War. Though the details of these institutions changed, for example, slavery was no longer possible. The negative impact on economic incentives and prosperity in the South was the same. The South was notably poorer than the rest of the United States. Starting in the 1950s, Southern institutions would begin to move the region onto a much faster growth trajectory. The type of extractive institutions, ultimately eliminated in the U.S. South were different from the colonial institutions of pre-independence Botswana. The type of critical juncture that started the process of their downfall was also different but shared several commonalities. Starting in the 1940s, those who bore the brunt of the discrimination and the extractive institutions in the South, people such as Rosa Parks, started to become much better organized in their fight against them. At the same time, the U.S. Supreme Court and the federal government finally began to intervene systematically to reform the extractive institutions in the South. Thus a main factor creating a critical juncture for change in the South was the empowerment of black Americans there, and the end of the unchallenged domination of the Southern elites. The Southern political institutions, both before the Civil War and after, had a clear economic logic, not too different from the South African apartheid regime, to secure cheap labor for the plantations. But by the 1950s, this logic became less compelling. For one, significant mass outmigration of blacks from the South was already underway, a legacy of both the Great Depression and the Second World War. In the 1940s and 50s, this reached an average of 100,000 people per year. Meanwhile, technological innovation in agriculture, though adopted only slowly, was reducing the dependence of the plantation owners on cheap labor. Most labor in the plantations was used for picking cotton. In 1950 almost all southern cotton was still picked by hand. But the mechanization of cotton picking was reducing the demand for this type of work. By 1960, in the key states of Alabama, Louisiana, and Mississippi, almost half of production had become mechanized. Just as blacks became harder to trap in the South, they also became no longer indispensable for the plantation owners. There was thus less reason for elites to fight vigorously to maintain the old extractive economic institutions. This did not mean that they would accept the changes in institutions willingly, however. Instead, a protracted conflict ensued. An unusual coalition, between Southern blacks and the inclusive federal institutions of the United States, created a powerful force away from Southern extraction and toward equal political and civil rights for Southern blacks, which would finally remove the significant barriers to economic growth in the U.S. South. The most important impetus for change came from the civil rights movement. It was the empowerment of blacks in the South that led the way, as in Montgomery, by challenging extractive institutions around them, by demanding their rights, and by protesting and mobilizing in order to obtain them. But they weren't alone in this, because the U.S. South was not a separate country and the Southern elites did not have free reign as did Guatemalan elites, for example. As part of the United States of America, the South was subject to the U.S. Constitution and federal legislation. The cause for fundamental reform in the South would finally receive support from the U.S. executive, legislature, and Supreme Court partly because the civil rights movement was able to have its voice heard outside the South, thereby mobilizing the federal government. Federal intervention to change the institutions in the South started with the decision of the Supreme Court in 1944 that primary elections where only white people could stand were unconstitutional. As we have seen, 
blacks had been politically disenfranchised in the 1890s with the use of poll taxes and literacy tests. Pages 351 to 357. These tests were routinely manipulated to discriminate against black people, while still allowing poor and illiterate whites to vote. In a famous example from the early 1960s, in Louisiana a white applicant was judged literate after giving the answer for dumb foofspeth to a question about the state constitution. The Supreme Court decision in 1944 was the opening salvo in the longer battle to open up the political system to blacks, and the court understood the importance of loosening white control of political parties. That decision was followed by Brown v. Board of Education in 1954, in which the Supreme Court ruled that state-mandated segregation of schools and other public sites was unconstitutional. In 1962 the court knocked away another pillar of the political dominance of white elites, legislative malapportionment. When a legislature is malapportioned, as were the rotten boroughs in England before the first Reform Act, some areas or regions receive much greater representation than they should based on their share of the relevant population. Malapportionment in the South meant that the rural areas, the heartland of the southern planter elite, were heavily overrepresented relative to urban areas. The Supreme Court put an end to this in 1962 with its decision in the Baker v. Carr case, which introduced the one person, one vote standard. But all the rulings from the Supreme Court would have amounted to little if they hadn't been implemented. In the 1890s, in fact, Federal legislation enfranchising Southern blacks was not implemented, because local law enforcement was under the control of the Southern elite and the Democratic Party, and the federal government was happy to go along with this state of affairs. But as blacks started rising up against the Southern elite, this bastion of support for Jim Crow crumbled, and the Democratic Party, led by its non Southern elements, turned against racial segregation. The renegade Southern Democrats regrouped under the banner of the state's rights Democratic Party and competed in the 1948 presidential election. Their candidate, Strom Thurmond, carried four states and gained 39 votes in the Electoral College. But this was a far cry from the power of the unified Democratic Party in national politics and the capture of that party by the Southern elites. Strom Thurmond's campaign was centered on his challenge to the ability of the federal government to intervene in the institutions of the South. He stated his position forcefully, I want to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that there's not enough troops in the army to force the Southern people to break down segregation and admit the Nigra race into our theaters, into our swimming pools, into our homes, and into our churches he would be proved wrong. The rulings of the Supreme Court meant that Southern educational facilities had to be desegregated, including the University of Mississippi in Oxford. In 1962, after a long legal battle, federal courts ruled that James Meredith, a young black Air Force veteran, had to be admitted to Ole Mississippi. Opposition to the implementation of this ruling was orchestrated by the so-called Citizens' Councils, the first of which had been formed in Indianola, Mississippi, in 1954 to fight desegregation of the South. State Governor Ross Barnett publicly rejected the court-ordered desegregation on television on September 13, announcing that state universities would close before they agreed to be desegregated. Finally, after much negotiation between Barnett and President John Kennedy and Attorney General Robert Kennedy in Washington, the federal government intervened forcibly to implement this ruling. A day was set when U.S. Marshals would bring Meredith to Oxford. In anticipation, white supremacists began to organize. On September 30, the day before Meredith was due to appear, 
U.S. Marshals entered the university campus and surrounded the main administration building. A crowd of about 2,500 came to protest, and soon a riot broke out. The marshals used tear gas to disperse the rioters, but soon came under fire. By 10 p.m. that night, federal troops were moved into the city to restore order. Soon there were 20,000 troops and 11,000 National Guardsmen in Oxford. In total, 300 people would be arrested. Meredith decided to stay on campus, where, protected from death threats by U.S. Marshals and 300 soldiers, he eventually graduated. Federal legislation was pivotal in the process of institutional reform in the South. During the passage of the first Civil Rights Act in 1957, Strom Thurmond, then a senator, spoke nonstop for 24 hours and 18 minutes to prevent, or at least delay, passage of the act. During his speech he read everything from the Declaration of Independence to various phone books. But to no avail. The 1957 Act culminated in the Civil Rights Act of 1964 outlawing a whole gamut of segregationist, state legislation and practices. The Voting Rights Act of 1965 declared the literacy tests, poll taxes, and other methods used for disenfranchising Southern blacks to be illegal. It also extended a great deal of federal oversight into state elections. The impact of all these events was a significant change in economic and legal institutions in the South. In Mississippi, for example, only about 5% of eligible black people were voting in 1960. By 1970 this figure had increased to 50 percent. In Alabama and South Carolina, it went from around 10 percent in 1960 to 50 percent in 1970. These patterns changed the nature of elections, both for local and national offices. More important, the political support from the dominant Democratic Party for the extractive institutions discriminating against blacks eroded. The way was then open for a range of changes in economic institutions. Prior to the institutional reforms of the 1960s, blacks had been almost entirely excluded from jobs in textile mills. In 1960 only about 5% of employees in southern textile mills were black. Civil rights legislation stopped this discrimination. By 1970 this proportion had increased to 15%, by 1990 it was at 25%. Economic discrimination against blacks began to decline. The educational opportunities for blacks improved significantly and the southern labor market became more competitive. Together with inclusive institutions came more rapid economic improvements in the South. In 1940 southern states had only about 50% of the level of per capita income of the United States. This started to change in the late 1940s and 50s. By 1990 the gap had basically vanished. As in Botswana, the key in the U.S. South was the development of inclusive political and economic institutions. This came at the juxtaposition of the increasing discontent among blacks suffering under southern extractive institutions, and the crumbling of the one-party rule of the Democratic Party in the South. Once again, existing institutions shaped the path of change. In this case, it was pivotal that Southern institutions were situated within the inclusive federal institutions of the United States, and this allowed Southern blacks finally to mobilize the federal government and institutions for their cause. The whole process was also facilitated by the fact that, with the massive outmigration of blacks from the South and the mechanization of cotton production, Economic conditions had changed so that southern elites were less willing to put up more of a fight. Rebirth in China The Communist Party under the leadership of Mao Zedong finally overthrew the nationalists, 
led by Chiang Kai-shek, in 1949. The People's Republic of China was proclaimed on October 1. The political and economic institutions created after 1949 were highly extractive. Politically, they featured the dictatorship of the Chinese Communist Party. No other political organization has been allowed in China since then. Until his death in 1976, Mao entirely dominated the Communist Party and the government. Accompanying these authoritarian, extractive political institutions were highly extractive economic institutions. Mao immediately nationalized land and abolished all kinds of property rights in one fell swoop. He had landlords, as well as other segments he deemed to be against the regime. Executed. The market economy was essentially abolished. People in rural areas were gradually organized onto communal farms. Money and wages were replaced by work points, which could be traded for goods. Internal passports were introduced in 1956 forbidding travel without appropriate authorization, in order to increase political and economic control. All industry was similarly nationalized, and Mao launched an ambitious attempt to promote the rapid development of industry through the use of five-year plans, modeled on those in the Soviet Union. As with all extractive institutions, Mao's regime was attempting to extract resources from the vast country he was now controlling. As in the case of the government of Sierra Leone with its marketing board, the Chinese Communist Party had a monopoly over the sale of produce, such as rice and grain, which was used to heavily tax farmers. The attempts at industrialization turned into the infamous Great Leap Forward after 1958, with the rollout of the second five-year plan. Mao announced that steel output would double in a year based on small-scale backyard blast furnaces. He claimed that in 15 years, China would catch up with British steel production. The only problem was that there was no feasible way of meeting these targets. To meet the plan's goals, scrap metal had to be found, and people would have to melt down their pots and pans and even their agricultural implements such as hoes and plows. Workers who ought to have been tending the fields were making steel by destroying their plows and thus their future ability to feed themselves and the country. The result was a calamitous famine in the Chinese countryside. Though scholars debate the role of Mao's policy compared with the impact of droughts at the same time, nobody doubts the central role of the Great Leap Forward in contributing to the death of between 20 and 40 million people. We don't know precisely how many, because China under Mao did not collect the numbers that would have documented the atrocities. Per capita income fell by around one quarter. One consequence of the Great Leap Forward was that a senior member of the Communist Party, Deng Xiaoping, a very successful general during the revolution, who led an anti-rightist campaign resulting in the execution of many enemies of the revolution, had a change of heart. At a conference in Guangzhou in the south of China in 1961, Deng argued, no matter whether the cat is black or white, if it catches mice, it's a good cat. It did not matter whether policies appeared communist or not, China needed policies that would encourage production so that it could feed its people. Yet Deng was soon to suffer for his newfound practicality. On May 16, 1966, Mao announced that the revolution was under threat from a bourgeois, interests that were undermining China's communist society and wishing to recreate capitalism. In response, he announced the Great Proletarian Cultural Revolution, usually referred to as the Cultural Revolution. The Cultural Revolution was based on 16 points. The first started. Although the bourgeoisie has been overthrown, it is still trying to use the old ideas, culture, and customs, and habits of the exploiting classes to corrupt the masses, capture their minds, 
and endeavor to stage a comeback. The proletariat must do just the opposite, it must meet head-on every challenge of the bourgeoisie in the ideological field and use the new ideas, culture, customs, and habits of the proletariat to change the mental outlook of the whole of society. At present our objective is to struggle against and crush those persons in authority who are taking the capitalist road, to criticize and repudiate the reactionary bourgeois academic authorities and the ideology of the bourgeoisie, and all other exploiting classes and transform education, literature, and art and all other parts of the superstructure that do not correspond to the socialist economic base so as to facilitate the consolidation and development of the socialist system. Soon the Cultural Revolution, just like the Great Leap Forward, would start wrecking both the economy and many human lives. Units of Red Guards were formed across the country, young, enthusiastic members of the Communist Party who were used to purge opponents of the regime. Many people were killed, arrested, or sent into internal exile. Mao himself retorted to concerns about the extent of the violence, stating, this man Hitler was even more ferocious. The more ferocious, the better, don't you think? The more people you kill, the more revolutionary you are. Deng found himself labeled number two capitalist rotor, was jailed in 1967 and then was exiled to Jiangxi province in 1969, to work in a rural tractor factory. He was rehabilitated in 1974, and Mao was persuaded by Premier Zhou Enlai to make Deng first vice-premier. Already in 1975, Deng supervised the composition of three party documents that would have charted a new direction had they been adopted. They called for a revitalization of higher education, a return to material incentives in industry and agriculture, and the removal of leftists from the party. At the time, Mao's health was deteriorating and power was increasingly concentrated in the hands of the very leftists whom Deng Xiaoping wanted to remove from power. Mao's wife, Jiang Qing, and three of her close associates, collectively known as the Gang of Four, had been great supporters of the Cultural Revolution and the resulting repression. They intended to continue using this blueprint to run the country under the dictatorship of the Communist Party. On April 5, a spontaneous celebration of the life of Zhou Enlai in Tiananmen Square turned into a protest against the government. The Gang of Four blamed Deng for the demonstrations, and he was once more stripped of all his positions and dismissed. Instead of achieving the removal of the leftists, Deng found that the leftists had removed him. After the death of Zhou Enlai, Mao had appointed Hua Guofeng as the acting premier instead of Deng. In the relative power vacuum of 1976, Hua was able to accumulate a great deal of personal power. In September there was a critical juncture, Mao died. The Chinese Communist Party had been under Mao's domination, and the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution had been largely his initiatives. With Mao gone, there was a true power vacuum, which resulted in a struggle between those with different visions and different beliefs about the consequences of change. The Gang of Four intended to continue with the policies of the Cultural Revolution as the only way of consolidating theirs, and the Communist Party's power. Hua Guofeng wanted to abandon the Cultural Revolution, but he could not distance himself too much from it, because he owed his own rise in the party to its effects. Instead, he advocated a return to a more balanced version of Mao's vision, which he encapsulated in the Utu Whatevers, as the People's Daily, the newspaper of the Chinese Communist Party, put it in 1977. Hua argued, we will resolutely uphold whatever policy decisions Chairman Mao made, and unswervingly follow whatever instructions Chairman Mao gave. 
Deng Xiaoping did not wish to abolish the communist regime and replace it with inclusive markets any more than Hua did. He, too, was part of the same group of people brought to power by the communist revolution. But he and his supporters thought that significant economic growth could be achieved without endangering their political control. They had a model of growth under extractive political institutions that would not threaten their power, because the Chinese people were in dire need of improved living standards and because all meaningful opposition to the Communist Party had been obliterated during Mao's reign and the Cultural Revolution. To achieve this, they wished to repudiate not just the Cultural Revolution but also much of the Maoist institutional legacy. They realized that economic growth would be possible only with significant moves toward inclusive economic institutions. They thus wished to reform the economy and bolster the role of market forces and incentives. They also wanted to expand the scope for private ownership and reduce the role of the Communist Party in society and the administration, getting rid of such concepts as class struggle. Deng's group was also open to foreign investment and international trade, and wished to pursue a much more aggressive policy of integrating with the international economy. Still, there were limits, and building truly inclusive economic institutions and significantly lessening the grip the Communist Party had on the economy weren't even options. The turning point for China was Hua Guofeng's power and his willingness to use it against the Gang of Four. Within a month of Mao's death, Hua mounted a coup against the Gang of Four, having them all arrested. He then reinstated Deng in March 1977. There was nothing inevitable either about this course of events or about the next significant steps which resulted from Hua himself being politically outmaneuvered by Deng Xiaoping. Deng encouraged public criticism of the Cultural Revolution and began to fill key positions in the Communist Party, at all levels with people who, like him, had suffered during this period. Hua could not repudiate the Cultural Revolution, and this weakened him. He was also a comparative newcomer to the centers of power and he lacked the web of connections and informal relations that Deng had built up over many years. In a series of speeches, Deng began to criticize Hua's policies. In September 1978, he explicitly attacked the two whatevers, noting that rather than let whatever Mao had said determine policy, the correct approach was to seek truth from facts. Deng also brilliantly began to bring public pressure to bear on Hua, which was reflected most powerfully in the Democracy Wall movement in 1978, in which people posted complaints about the country on a wall in Beijing. In July of 1978, one of Deng's supporters, Hu Qiaomu, presented some basic principles of economic reform. These included the notions that firms should be given greater initiative and authority to make their own production decisions. Prices should be allowed to bring supply and demand together, rather than just being set by the government, and the state regulation of the economy more generally ought to be reduced. These were radical suggestions, but Deng was gaining influence. In November and December 1978, the third plenum of the 11th Central Party Committee produced a breakthrough. Over Hua's objections, it was decided that, from then on, the focus of the party would be not class struggle but economic modernization. The plenum announced some tentative experiments with a household responsibility system in some provinces, which was an attempt to roll back collective agriculture and introduce economic incentives into farming. By the next year, the Central Committee was acknowledging the centrality of the notion of a truth from facts, and declaring the Cultural Revolution to have been a great calamity for the Chinese people. Throughout this period, Deng was securing the appointment of his own supporters to important positions in the party, army, and government.
Though he had to move slowly against Hua's supporters in the Central Committee, he created parallel bases of power. By 1980 Hua was forced to step down from the premiership, to be replaced by Zhao Ziyang. By 1982 Hua had been removed from the Central Committee. But Deng did not stop there. At the 12th Party Congress in 1982, and then in the National Party. Conference in September 1985, he achieved an almost complete reshuffling of the party leadership and senior cadres. In came much younger, reform-minded people. If one compares 1980 to 1985, then by the latter date, 21 of the 26 members of the Politburo, 8 of the 11 members of the Communist Party Secretariat, and 10 of the 18 vice premiers had been changed. Now that Deng and the reformers had consummated their political revolution and were in control of the state, they launched a series of further changes in economic institutions. They began in agriculture, by 1983, following the ideas of Hu Xiaomu, the household responsibility system, which would provide economic incentives to farmers, was universally adopted. In 1985 the mandatory state purchasing of grain was abandoned and replaced by a system of more voluntary contracts. Administrative control of agricultural prices was greatly relaxed in 1985. In the urban economy, state enterprises were given more autonomy, and 14 open cities were identified and given the ability to attract foreign investment. It was the rural economy that took off first. The introduction of incentives led to a dramatic increase in agricultural productivity. By 1984 grain output was one-third higher than in 1978, though fewer people were involved in agriculture. Many had moved into employment in new rural industries, the so-called township village enterprises. These had been allowed to grow outside the system of state industrial planning after 1979, when it was accepted that new firms could enter and compete with state-owned firms. Gradually economic incentives were also introduced into the industrial sector, in particular into the operation of state-run enterprises, though at this stage there was no hint at privatization, which had to wait until the mid-1990s. The rebirth of China came with a significant move away from one of the most extractive set of economic institutions, and toward more inclusive ones. Market incentives in agriculture and industry, then followed by foreign investment and technology, would set China on a path to rapid economic growth. As we will discuss further in the next chapter, this was growth under extractive political institutions even if they were not as repressive as they had been under the Cultural Revolution and even if economic institutions were becoming partially inclusive. All of this should not understate the degree to which the changes in economic institutions in China were radical. China broke the mold, even if it did not transform its political institutions. As in Botswana and the U.S. South, the crucial changes came during a critical juncture, in the case of China, following Mao's death. They were also contingent, in fact highly contingent, as there was nothing inevitable about the Gang of Four losing the power struggle, and if they had not, China would not have experienced the sustained economic growth it has seen in the last 30 years. But the devastation and human suffering that the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution caused generated sufficient demand for change that Deng Xiaoping and his allies were able to win the political fight. Botswana, China, and the U.S. South, just like the Glorious Revolution in England, the French Rev. Why Nations Fail. The Origins of Power, Prosperity, and Poverty. By Darren Asemoglu and James A. Robinson. 15. Understanding Prosperity and Poverty
how the world could have been different and how understanding this can explain why most attempts to combat poverty have failed. 15. Understanding Prosperity and Poverty Historical Origins There are huge differences in living standards around the world. Even the poorest citizens of the United States have incomes and access to health care, education, public services, and economic and social opportunities that are far superior to those available to the vast mass of people living in Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, and Central America. The contrast of South and North Korea, the two Nogaleses, and the United States and Mexico reminds us that these are relatively recent phenomena. 500 years ago, Mexico, home to the Aztec state, was certainly richer than the polities to the north, and the United States did not pull ahead of Mexico until the 19th century. The gap between the two Nogaleses is even more recent. South and North Korea were economically, as well as socially and culturally, indistinguishable before the country was divided at the 38th parallel after the Second World War. Similarly, most of the huge economic differences we observe around us today emerged over the last 200 years. Did this all need to be so? Was it historically, or geographically or culturally or ethnically, predetermined that Western Europe, the United States, and Japan would become so much richer than Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, and China over the last 200 years or so? Was it inevitable that the Industrial Revolution would get underway in the 18th century in Britain, and then spread to Western Europe and Europe's offshoots in North America and Australasia? Is a counterfactual world where the Glorious Revolution and the Industrial Revolution take place in Peru, which then colonizes Western Europe and enslaves whites, possible, or is it just a form of historical science fiction? To answer, in fact, even to reason about, these questions, we need a theory of why some nations are prosperous while others fail and are poor. This theory needs to delineate both the factors that create and retard prosperity and their historical origins. This book has proposed such a theory. Any complex social phenomenon, such as the origins of the different economic and political trajectories of hundreds of polities around the world, likely has a multitude of causes, making most social scientists shun monocausal, simple, and broadly applicable theories and instead seek different explanations for seemingly similar outcomes emerging in different times and areas. Instead we've offered a simple theory and used it to explain the main contours of economic and political development around the world since the Neolithic Revolution. Our choice was motivated not by a naive belief that such a theory could explain everything but by the belief that a theory should enable us to focus on the parallels, sometimes at the expense of abstracting from many interesting details. A successful theory, then, does not faithfully reproduce details, but provides a useful and empirically well-grounded explanation for a range of processes, while also clarifying the main forces at work. Our theory has attempted to achieve this by operating on two levels. The first is the distinction between extractive and inclusive economic and political institutions. The second is our explanation for why inclusive institutions emerged in some parts of the world and not in others. While the first level of our theory is about an institutional interpretation of history, the second level is about how history has shaped institutional trajectories of nations. Central to our theory is the link between inclusive economic and political institutions and prosperity. Inclusive economic institutions that enforce property rights, create a level playing field, and encourage. Investments in new technologies and skills are more conducive to economic growth than extractive economic institutions.
that are structured to extract resources from the many by the few and that fail to protect property rights or provide incentives for economic activity. Inclusive economic institutions are in turn supported by and support inclusive political institutions, that is, those that distribute political power widely in a pluralistic manner and are able to achieve some amount of political centralization, so as to establish law and order, the foundations of secure property rights, and an inclusive market economy. Similarly, extractive economic institutions are synergistically linked to extractive political institutions, which concentrate power in the hands of a few who will then have incentives to maintain and develop extractive economic institutions for their benefit and use the resources they obtain to cement their hold on political power. These tendencies do not imply that extractive economic and political institutions are inconsistent with economic growth. On the contrary, every elite would, all else being equal like to encourage as much growth as possible in order to have more to extract. Extractive institutions that have achieved at least a minimal degree of political centralization are often able to generate some amount of growth. What is crucial, however, is that growth under extractive institutions will not be sustained, for two key reasons. First, sustained economic growth requires innovation, and innovation cannot be decoupled from creative destruction, which replaces the old with the new in the economic realm and also destabilizes established power relations in politics. Because elites dominating extractive institutions fear creative destruction, they will resist it, and any growth that germinates under extractive institutions will be ultimately short-lived. Second, the ability of those who dominate extractive institutions to benefit greatly at the expense of the rest of society implies that political power under extractive institutions is highly coveted, making many groups and individuals fight to obtain it. As a consequence, there will be powerful forces pushing societies under extractive institutions toward political instability. The synergies between extractive economic and political institutions create a vicious circle, where extractive institutions, once in place, tend to persist. Similarly, there is a virtuous circle associated with inclusive economic and political institutions. But neither the vicious nor the virtuous circle is absolute. In fact, some nations live under inclusive institutions today because, Though extractive institutions have been the norm in history, some societies have been able to break the mold and transition toward inclusive institutions. Our explanation for these transitions is historical, but not historically predetermined. Major institutional change, the requisite for major economic change, takes place as a result of the interaction between existing institutions and critical junctures. Critical junctures are major events that disrupt the existing political and economic balance in one or many societies, such as the Black Death, which killed possibly as much as half the population of most areas in Europe during the 14th century, the opening of Atlantic trade routes, which created enormous profit opportunities for many in Western Europe, and the Industrial Revolution which offered the potential for rapid but also disruptive changes in the structure of economies around the world. Existing institutional differences among societies themselves are a result of past institutional changes. Why does the path of institutional change differ across societies? The answer to this question lies in institutional drift. In the same way that the genes of two isolated populations of organisms will drift apart slowly because of random mutations, in the so-called process of evolutionary or genetic drift, two otherwise similar societies will also drift apart institutionally, albeit, again, slowly. Conflict over income and power, and indirectly over institutions, 
is a constant in all societies. This conflict often has a contingent outcome, even if the playing field over which it transpires is not level. The outcome of this conflict leads to institutional drift. But this is not necessarily a cumulative process. It does not imply that the small differences that emerge at some point will necessarily become larger over time. On the contrary, as our discussion of Roman Britain in Chapter 6 illustrates, small differences open up, and then disappear, and then reappear again. However, when a critical juncture arrives, these small differences that have emerged as a result of institutional drift may be the small differences that matter in leading otherwise quite similar societies to diverge radically. We saw in chapters 7 and 8 that despite the many similarities between England, France, and Spain, the critical juncture of the Atlantic trade had the most transformative impact on England because of such small differences. The fact that because of developments during the 15th and 16th centuries, the English crown could not control all overseas trade, as this trade was mostly under crown monopoly in France and Spain. As a result, in France and Spain, it was the monarchy and the groups allied with it who were the main beneficiaries of the large profits created by Atlantic trade and colonial expansion while in England it was groups strongly opposed to the monarchy who gained from economic opportunities thrown open by this critical juncture. Though institutional drift leads to small differences, its interplay with critical junctures leads to institutional divergence, and thus this divergence then creates the now more major institutional differences that the next critical juncture will affect. History is key since it is historical processes that, via institutional drift, create the differences that may become consequential during critical junctures. Critical junctures themselves are historical turning points. And the vicious and virtuous circles imply that we have to study history to understand the nature of institutional differences that have been historically structured. Yet our theory does not imply historical determinism, or any other kind of determinism. It is for this reason that the answer to the question we started with in this chapter is no. There was no historical necessity that Peru end up so much poorer than Western Europe or the United States. To start with, in contrast with the geography and culture hypotheses, Peru is not condemned to poverty because of its geography or culture. In our theory, Peru is so much poorer than Western Europe and the United States today because of its institutions, and to understand the reasons for this, we need to understand the historical process of institutional development in Peru. As we saw in the second chapter, 500 years ago the Inca Empire, which occupied contemporary Peru, was richer, more technologically sophisticated, and more politically centralized than the smaller polities occupying North America. The turning point was the way in which this area was colonized and how this contrasted with the colonization of North America. This resulted not from a historically predetermined process but as the contingent outcome of several pivotal institutional developments during critical junctures. At least three factors could have changed this trajectory and led to very different long-run patterns. First, institutional differences within the Americas during the 15th century shaped how these areas were colonized. North America followed a different institutional trajectory than Peru because it was sparsely settled before colonization and attracted European settlers who then successfully rose up against the elite whom entities such as the Virginia Company and the English Crown had tried to create. In contrast, Spanish conquistadors found a centralized, extractive state in Peru they could take over and a large population they could put to work in mines and plantations. There was also nothing geographically predetermined about the lay of the land within the Americas at the time the Europeans arrived. 
in the same way that the emergence of a centralized state led by King Xiam among the Bashang was a result of a major institutional innovation, or perhaps even of political revolution, as we saw in Chapter 5. The Inca civilization in Peru and the large populations in this area resulted from major institutional innovations. These could instead have taken place in North America, in places such as the Mississippi Valley or even the northeastern United States. Had this been the case, Europeans might have encountered empty lands in the Andes and centralized states in North America and the roles of Peru and the United States could have been reversed. Europeans would then have settled in areas around Peru, and the conflict between the majority of settlers and the elite could have led to the creation of inclusive institutions, there instead of in North America. The subsequent paths of economic development would then likely have been different. Second, the Inca Empire might have resisted European colonialism, as Japan did when Commodore Perry's ships arrived in Edo Bay. Though the greater extractiveness of the Inca Empire in contrast with Tokugawa, Japan, certainly made a political revolution akin to the Meiji Restoration less likely in Peru, there was no historical necessity that the Inca completely succumb to European domination. If they had been able to resist and even institutionally modernize in response to the threats, the whole path of the history of the New World, and with it the entire history of the world, could have been different. Third and most radically, it is not even historically or geographically or culturally predetermined that Europeans should have been the ones colonizing the world. It could have been the Chinese or even the Incas. Of course, such an outcome is impossible when we look at the world from the vantage point of the 15th century, by which time Western Europe had pulled ahead of the Americas, and China had already turned inward. But Western Europe of the 15th century was itself an outcome of a contingent process of institutional drift, punctuated by critical junctures, and nothing about it was inevitable. Western European powers could not have surged ahead and conquered the world without several historic turning points. These included the specific path that feudalism took, replacing slavery and weakening the power of monarchs on the way, the fact that the centuries following the turn of the first millennium in Europe witnessed the development of independent and commercially autonomous cities, the fact that European monarchs were not as threatened by and consequently did not try to discourage overseas trade as the Chinese emperors did during the Ming dynasty, and the arrival of the Black Death, which shook up the foundations of the feudal order. If these events had transpired differently, we could be living in a very different world today, one in which Peru might be richer than Western Europe or the United States. Naturally, the predictive power of a theory where both small differences and contingency play key roles will be limited. Few would have predicted in the 15th or even the 16th centuries, let alone in the many centuries following the fall of the Roman Empire, that the major breakthrough toward inclusive institutions would happen in Britain. It was only the specific process of institutional drift and the nature of the critical juncture created by the opening of Atlantic trade that made this possible. Neither would many have believed in the midst of the Cultural Revolution during the 1970s, that China would soon be on a path toward radical changes in its economic institutions and subsequently on a breakneck growth trajectory. It is similarly impossible to predict with any certainty what the lay of the land will be in 500 years. Yet these are not shortcomings of our theory. The historical account we have presented so far indicates that any approach based on historical determinism, based on geography, culture, or even other historical factors, is inadequate. Small differences and contingency are not just part of our theory, they are part of the shape of history.
even if making precise predictions about which societies will prosper relative to others is difficult. We have seen throughout the book that our theory explains the broad differences in the prosperity and poverty of nations around the world fairly well. We will see in the rest of this chapter that it also provides some guidelines as to what types of societies are more likely to achieve economic growth over the next several decades. First, vicious and virtuous circles generate a lot of persistence and sluggishness. There should be little doubt that in 50 or even a hundred years, the United States and Western Europe, based on their inclusive economic and political institutions, will be richer, most likely considerably richer, than Sub-Saharan Africa, the Middle East, Central America, or Southeast Asia. However, within these broad patterns there will be major institutional changes in the next century with some countries breaking the mold and transitioning from poor to rich. Nations that have achieved almost no political centralization, such as Somalia and Afghanistan, or those that have undergone a collapse of the state, such as Haiti did over the last several decades, long before the massive earthquake there in 2010 led to the devastation of the country's infrastructure are unlikely either to achieve growth under extractive political institutions or to make major changes toward inclusive institutions. Instead, nations likely to grow over the next several decades, albeit probably under extractive institutions, are those that have attained some degree of political centralization. In sub-Saharan Africa this includes Burundi, Ethiopia, Rwanda, nations with long histories of centralized states, and Tanzania, which has managed to build such centralization, or at least put in place some of the prerequisites for centralization, since independence. In Latin America, it includes Brazil, Chile, and Mexico, which have not only achieved political centralization but also made significant strides toward nascent pluralism. Our theory would suggest that sustained economic growth is very unlikely in Colombia. Our theory also suggests that growth under extractive political institutions, as in China, will not bring sustained growth, and is likely to run out of steam. Beyond these cases, there is much uncertainty. Cuba, for example, might transition toward inclusive institutions and experience a major economic transformation, or it may linger on under extractive political and economic institutions. The same is true of North Korea and Burma, Myanmar, in Asia. Thus, while our theory provides the tools for thinking about how institutions change and the consequences of such changes, the nature of this change, the role of small differences and contingency, makes more precise predictions difficult. Even greater caution is necessary in drawing policy recommendations from this broad account of the origins of prosperity and poverty, in the same way that the impact of critical junctures depends on existing institutions. How a society will respond to the same policy intervention depends on the institutions that are in place. Of course, our theory is all about how nations can take steps toward prosperity, by transforming their institutions from extractive to inclusive. But it also makes it very clear from the outset that there are no easy recipes for achieving such a transition. First, the vicious circle implies that changing institutions is much harder than it first appears. In particular, extractive institutions can recreate themselves under different guises, as we saw with the iron law of oligarchy in chapter 12. Thus the fact that the extractive regime of President Mubarak was overturned by popular protest in February 2011 does not guarantee that Egypt will move on to a path to more inclusive institutions. Instead extractive institutions may recreate themselves despite the vibrant and hopeful pro-democracy movement. Second, because the contingent path of history implies that it is difficult to know whether a particular interplay of critical junctures 
and existing institutional differences will lead toward more inclusive or extractive institutions. It would be heroic to formulate general policy recommendations to encourage change toward inclusive institutions. Nevertheless, our theory is still useful for policy analysis, as it enables us to recognize bad policy advice, based on either incorrect hypotheses or inadequate understanding of how institutions can change. In this, as in most things, avoiding the worst mistakes is as important as, and more realistic than, attempting to develop simple solutions. Perhaps this is most clearly visible when we consider current policy recommendations encouraging authoritarian growth, based on the successful Chinese growth experience of the last several decades. We next explain why these policy recommendations are misleading and why Chinese growth, as it has unfolded so far, is just another form of growth under extractive political institutions, unlikely to translate into sustained economic development. The Irresistible Charm of Authoritarian Growth Dai Guofang recognized the coming urban boom in China early on. New highways, business centers, residences, and skyscrapers were sprawling everywhere around China in the 1990s and Dai thought this growth would only pick up speed in the next decade. He reasoned that his company, Jingsu Taiben Iron and Steel, could capture a large market as a low-cost producer, especially compared with the inefficient state-owned steel factories. Dai planned to build a true steel giant, and with support from the local party bosses in Changzhou, he started building in 2003. By March 2004, however, the project had been stopped by order of the Chinese Communist Party in Beijing, and Dai was arrested for reasons never clearly articulated. The authorities may have presumed that they would find some incriminating evidence in Dai's accounts. In the event, he spent the next five years in jail and home detention, and was found guilty on a minor charge in 2009. His real crime was to start a large project that would compete with state-sponsored companies, and do so without the approval of the higher-ups in the Communist Party. This was certainly the lesson that others drew from the case. The Communist Party's reaction to entrepreneurs such as Dai should not be a surprise. Qin Yun, one of Deng Xiaoping's closest associates and arguably the major architect behind the early market reforms, summarized the views of most party cadres with a bird-in-a-cage analogy for the economy. China's economy was the bird. The party's control, the cage, had to be enlarged to make the bird healthier and more dynamic, but it could not be unlocked or removed, lest the bird fly away. Jiang Zemin shortly after becoming general secretary of the Communist Party in 1989, the most powerful position in China, went even further and summarized the party's suspicion of entrepreneurs by characterizing them as self-employed traders and peddlers, who cheat, embezzle, bribe and evade taxation. Throughout the 1990s, even as foreign investment was pouring into China and state, Owned enterprises were encouraged to expand, private entrepreneurship was greeted with suspicion, and many entrepreneurs were expropriated or even jailed. Jiang Zemin's view of entrepreneurs, though in relative decline, is still widespread in China. In the words of a Chinese economist, big state companies can get involved in huge projects. But when private companies do so, especially in competition with the state, then trouble comes from every corners, sick. While scores of private companies are now profitably operating in China, many elements of the economy are still under the party's command and protection. Journalist Richard McGregor reports that on the desk of the head of each of the biggest state companies in China stands a red phone. When it rings, it is the party calling with orders on what the company should do, where it should invest, and what its targets will be. These giant companies are still under the command of the party, 
a fact we are reminded of when the party decides to shuffle their chief executives, fire them, or promote them, with little explanation. These stories of course do not deny that China has made great strides toward inclusive economic institutions, strides that underpin its spectacular growth rates over the past 30 years. Most entrepreneurs have some security, not least because they cultivate the support of local cadres and communist party elites in Beijing. Most state-owned enterprises seek profits and compete in international markets. This is a radical change from the China of Mao. As we saw in the previous chapter, China was first able to grow because under Deng Xiaoping there were radical reforms away from the most extractive economic institutions, and toward inclusive economic institutions. Growth has continued as Chinese economic institutions have been on a path toward greater inclusiveness, albeit at a slow pace. China is also greatly benefiting from its large supply of cheap labor and its access to foreign markets, capital, and technologies. Even if Chinese economic institutions are incomparably more inclusive today than three decades ago, the Chinese experience is an example of growth under extractive political institutions. Despite the recent emphasis in China on innovation and technology, Chinese growth is based on the adoption of existing technologies and rapid investment, not creative. Destruction An important aspect of this is that property rights are not entirely secure in China. Every now and then, just like Dai, some entrepreneurs are expropriated. Labor mobility is tightly regulated, and the most basic of property rights, the right to sell one's own labor in the way one wishes, is still highly imperfect. The extent to which economic institutions are still far from being truly inclusive is illustrated by the fact that only a few businessmen and women would even venture into any activity without the support of the local party cadre or, even more important, of Beijing. The connection between business and the party is highly lucrative for both. Businesses supported by the party receive contracts on favorable terms, can evict ordinary people to expropriate their land, and violate laws and regulations with impunity. Those who stand in the path of this business plan will be trampled and can even be jailed or murdered. The all-too-present weight of the Communist Party and extractive institutions in China remind us of the many similarities between Soviet growth in the 1950s and 60s and Chinese growth today, though there are also notable differences. The Soviet Union achieved growth under extractive economic institutions and extractive political institutions because it forcibly allocated resources toward industry under a centralized command structure, particularly armaments and heavy industry. Such growth was feasible partly because there was a lot of catching up to be done. Growth under extractive institutions is easier when creative destruction is not a necessity. Chinese economic institutions are certainly more inclusive than those in the Soviet Union. But China's political institutions are still extractive. The Communist Party is all-powerful in China and controls the entire state bureaucracy, the armed forces, the media, and large parts of the economy. Chinese people have few political freedoms and very little participation in the political process. Many have long believed that growth in China would bring democracy and greater pluralism. There was a real sense in 1989 that the Tiananmen Square demonstrations would lead to greater opening, and perhaps even the collapse of the communist regime. But tanks were unleashed on the demonstrators, and instead of a peaceful revolution, history books now call it the Tiananmen Square Massacre. In many ways, Chinese political institutions became more extractive in the aftermath of Tiananmen. Reformers such as Zhao Ziyang, who as general secretary of the Communist Party lent his support to the students in Tiananmen Square, were purged.
and the party clamped down on civil liberties and press freedom with greater zeal. Zhao Ziyang was put under house arrest for more than 15 years, and his public record was gradually erased, so that he would not be even a symbol for those who supported political change. Today the party's control over the media, including the internet, is unprecedented. Much of this is achieved through self-censorship, media outlets know that they should not mention Zhao Ziyang or Liu Xiaobo, the government critic demanding greater democratization, who is still languishing in prison even after he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. Self-censorship is supported by an Orwellian apparatus that can monitor conversations and communications, close websites and newspapers, and even selectively block access to individual news stories on the Internet. All of this was on display when news about corruption charges against the son of the general secretary of the party, since 2002, Hu Jintao, broke out in 2009. The party's apparatus immediately sprang into action and was not only able to prevent Chinese media from covering the case but also managed to selectively block stories about the case on the New York Times and Financial Times websites. Because of the party's control over economic institutions, the extent of creative destruction is heavily curtailed, and it will remain so until there is radical reform in political institutions. Just as in the Soviet Union, the Chinese experience of growth under extractive political institutions is greatly facilitated, because there is a lot of catching up to do. Income per capita in China is still a fraction of that in the United States and Western Europe. Of course, Chinese growth is considerably more diversified than Soviet growth. It doesn't rely on only armaments or heavy industry and Chinese entrepreneurs are showing a lot of ingenuity. All the same, this growth will run out of steam unless extractive political institutions make way for inclusive institutions. As long as political institutions remain extractive, growth will be inherently limited, as it has been in all other similar cases. The Chinese experience does raise several interesting questions about the future of Chinese growth and, more important, the desirability and viability of authoritarian growth. Such growth has become a popular alternative to the Washington Consensus, which emphasizes the importance of market and trade liberalization and certain forms of institutional reform for kick-starting economic growth in many less developed parts of the world. While part of the appeal of authoritarian growth comes as a reaction to the Washington Consensus, perhaps its greater charm, certainly to the rulers presiding over extractive institutions, is that it gives them free reign in maintaining and even strengthening their hold on power and legitimizes their extraction. As our theory highlights, particularly in societies that have undergone some degree of state centralization. This type of growth under extractive institutions is possible and may even be the most likely scenario for many nations, ranging from Cambodia and Vietnam to Burundi, Ethiopia, and Rwanda. But it also implies that like all examples of growth under extractive political institutions, it will not be sustained. In the case of China, the growth process based on catch-up, import of foreign technology, and export of low-end manufacturing products is likely to continue for a while. Nevertheless, Chinese growth is also likely to come to an end, particularly once China reaches the standards of living level of a middle-income country. The most likely scenario may be for the Chinese Communist Party and the increasingly powerful Chinese economic elite to manage to maintain their very tight grip on power in the next several decades. In this case, history and our theory suggest that growth with creative destruction and true innovation will not arrive, and the spectacular growth rates in China will slowly evaporate. But this outcome is far from preordained 
It can be avoided if China transitions to inclusive political institutions before its growth under extractive institutions reaches its limit. Nevertheless, as we will see next, there is little reason to expect that a transition in China toward more inclusive political institutions is likely, or that it will take place automatically and painlessly. Even some voices within the Chinese Communist Party are recognizing the dangers on the road ahead and are throwing around the idea that political reform, that is, a transition to more inclusive political institutions, to use our terminology, is necessary. The powerful Premier Wen Jiabao has recently warned of the danger that economic growth will be hampered unless political reform gets underway. We think Wen's analysis is prescient, even if some people doubt his sincerity. But many in the West do not agree with Wen's pronouncements. To them, China reveals an alternative path to sustained economic growth, one under authoritarianism rather than inclusive economic and political institutions. But they are wrong. We have already seen the important salient roots of Chinese success. A radical change in economic institutions away from rigidly communist ones, and toward institutions that provide incentives to increase productivity and to trade. Looked at from this perspective, there is nothing fundamentally different about China's experience relative to that of countries that have managed to take steps away from extractive and toward inclusive economic institutions even when this takes place under extractive political institutions, as in the Chinese case. China has thus achieved economic growth not thanks to its extractive political institutions, but despite them, its successful growth experience over the last three decades is due to a radical shift away from extractive economic institutions, and toward significantly more inclusive economic institutions, which was made more difficult, not easier, by the presence of highly authoritarian, extractive political institutions. A different type of endorsement of authoritarian growth recognizes its unattractive nature but claims that authoritarianism is just a passing stage. This idea goes back to one of the classical theories of political sociology, the theory of modernization, formulated by Seymour Martin Lipset. Modernization theory maintains that all societies, as they grow, are headed toward a more modern, developed, and civilized existence, and in particular toward democracy. Many followers of modernization theory also claim that, like democracy, inclusive institutions will emerge as a by-product of the growth process. Moreover, even though democracy is not the same as inclusive political institutions, regular elections and relatively unencumbered political competition are likely to bring forth the development of inclusive political institutions. Different versions of modernization theory also claim that an educated workforce will naturally lead to democracy and better institutions. In a somewhat postmodern version of modernization theory, New York Times columnist Thomas Friedman went so far as to suggest that once a country got enough, McDonald's restaurants, democracy and institutions were bound to follow. All this paints an optimistic picture. Over the past 60 years, most countries, even many of those with extractive institutions, have experienced some growth and most have witnessed notable increases in the educational attainment of their workforces. So, as their incomes and educational levels continue to rise, one way or another, all other good things, such as democracy, human rights, civil liberties, and secure property rights, should follow. Modernization theory has a wide following both within and outside academia. Recent U.S. attitudes toward China, for example, have been shaped by this theory. George H. W. Bush summarized U.S. policy toward Chinese democracy as, We trade freely with China and time is on our side. 
The idea was that as China traded freely with the West, it would grow, and that growth would bring democracy and better institutions in China, as modernization theory predicted. Yet the rapid increase in U.S.-China trade since the mid-1980s has done little for Chinese democracy, and the even closer integration that is likely to follow during the next decade will do equally little. The attitudes of many about the future of Iraqi society and democracy in the aftermath of the U.S.-led invasion were similarly optimistic because of modernization theory. Despite its disastrous economic performance under Saddam Hussein's regime, Iraq was not as poor in 2002 as many sub-Saharan African nations, and it had a comparatively well-educated population, so it was believed to be ripe ground for the development of democracy and civil liberties, and perhaps even what we would describe as pluralism. These hopes were quickly dashed as chaos and civil war descended upon Iraqi society. Modernization theory is both incorrect and unhelpful for thinking about how to confront the major problems of extractive institutions in failing nations. The strongest piece of evidence in favor of modernization theory is that rich nations are the ones that have democratic regimes, respect civil and human rights, and enjoy functioning markets and generally inclusive economic institutions. Yet interpreting this association as supporting modernization theory ignores the major effect of inclusive economic and political institutions on economic growth. As we have argued throughout this book, it is the societies with inclusive institutions that have grown over the past 300 years and have become relatively rich today that this accounts for what we see around us is shown clearly if we look at the facts slightly differently. While nations that have built inclusive economic and political institutions over the last several centuries have achieved sustained economic growth, authoritarian regimes that have grown more rapidly over the past 60 or 100 years, contrary to what Lipset's modernization theory would claim, have not become more democratic. And this is in fact not surprising. Growth under extractive institutions is possible precisely because it doesn't necessarily or automatically imply the demise of these very institutions. In fact, it is often generated because those in control of the extractive institutions view economic growth as not a threat but a support to their regime, as the Chinese Communist Party has done since the 1980s. It is also not surprising that growth generated by increases in the value of the natural resources of a nation, such as in Gabon, Russia, Saudi Arabia, and Venezuela, is unlikely to lead to a fundamental transformation of these authoritarian regimes toward inclusive institutions. The historical record is even less generous to modernization theory. Many relatively prosperous nations have succumbed to and supported repressive dictatorships and extractive institutions. Both Germany and Japan were among the richest and most industrialized nations in the world. In the first half of the 20th century, and had comparatively well-educated citizens. This did not prevent the rise of the National Socialist Party in Germany or a militaristic regime intent on territorial expansion, via war in Japan, making both political and economic institutions take a sharp turn toward extractive institutions. Argentina was also one of the richest countries in the world in the 19th century, as rich as or even richer than Britain because it was the beneficiary of the worldwide resource boom. It also had the most educated population in Latin America. But democracy and pluralism were no more successful, and were arguably less successful, in Argentina than in much of the rest of Latin America. One coup followed another, and as we saw in Chapter 11, even democratically elected leaders acted as rapacious dictators. Even more recently there has been little progress toward inclusive economic institutions, and as we saw in Chapter 13, 
21st century Argentinian governments can still expropriate their citizens' wealth with impunity. All of this highlights several important ideas. First, growth under authoritarian, extractive political institutions in China, though likely to continue for a while yet, will not translate into sustained growth, supported by truly inclusive economic institutions and creative destruction. Second, contrary to the claims of modernization theory, we should not count on authoritarian growth leading to democracy or inclusive political institutions. China, Russia, and several other authoritarian regimes currently experiencing some growth are likely to reach the limits of extractive growth before they transform their political institutions in a more inclusive direction, and in fact, probably before there is any desire among the elite for such changes or any strong opposition forcing them to do so. Third, authoritarian growth is neither desirable nor viable in the long run, and thus should not receive the endorsement of the international community as a template for nations in Latin America, Asia, and Sub-Saharan Africa, even if it is a path that many nations will choose precisely because it is sometimes consistent with the interests of the economic and political elites dominating them. You can't engineer prosperity. Unlike the theory we have developed in this book, the ignorance hypothesis comes readily with a suggestion about how to solve the problem of poverty, if ignorance got us here, enlightening and informing rulers and policymakers can get us out, and we should be able to engineer prosperity around the world by providing the right advice and by convincing politicians of what is good economics. In Chapter 2, when we discussed this hypothesis, we showed how the experience of Ghana's Prime Minister Kofi Bija in the early 1970s underscored the fact that the main obstacle to the adoption of policies that would reduce market failures and encourage economic growth is not the ignorance of politicians, but the incentives and constraints they face from the political and economic institutions in their societies. Nevertheless, the ignorance hypothesis still rules supreme in Western policymaking circles, which, almost to the exclusion of anything else, focus on how to engineer prosperity. These engineering attempts come in two flavors. The first, often advocated by international organizations such as the International Monetary Fund, recognizes that poor development is caused by bad economic policies and institutions, and then proposes a list of improvements these international organizations attempt to induce poor countries to adopt. The Washington Consensus makes up one such list. These improvements focus on sensible things such as macroeconomic stability and seemingly attractive macroeconomic goals, such as a reduction in the size of the government sector, flexible exchange rates, and capital account liberalization. They also focus on more microeconomic goals, such as privatization, improvements in the efficiency of public service provision and perhaps also suggestions as to how to improve the functioning of the state itself by emphasizing anti-corruption measures. Though on their own many of these reforms might be sensible, the approach of international organizations in Washington, London, Paris, and elsewhere is still steeped in an incorrect perspective that fails to recognize the role of political institutions and the constraints they place on policymaking. Attempts by international institutions to engineer economic growth by hectoring poor countries into adopting better policies and institutions are not successful because they do not take place in the context of an explanation of why bad policies and institutions are there in the first place, except that the leaders of poor countries are ignorant. The consequence is that the policies are not adopted and not implemented, or are implemented in name only. For example, many economies around the world ostensibly implementing such reforms, most notably in Latin America, stagnated throughout the 1980s and 90s.
In reality, such reforms were foisted upon these countries in contexts where politics went on as usual. Hence, even when reforms were adopted, their intent was subverted, or politicians used other ways to blunt their impact. All this is illustrated by the implementation of one of the key recommendations of international institutions aimed at achieving macroeconomic stability, central bank independence. This recommendation either was implemented in theory but not in practice or was undermined by the use of other policy instruments. It was quite sensible in principle. Many politicians around the world were spending more than they were raising in tax revenue and were then forcing their central banks to make up the difference by printing money. The resulting inflation was creating instability and uncertainty. The theory was that independent central banks, just like the Bundesbank in Germany, would resist political pressure and put a lid on inflation. Zimbabwe's President Mugabe decided to heed international advice, he declared the Zimbabwean Central Bank independent in 1995. Before this, the inflation rate in Zimbabwe was hovering around 20%. By 2002 it had reached 140 percent, by 2003, almost 600 percent, by 2007, 66,000 percent, and by 2008, 230 million percent. Of course, in a country where the president wins the lottery, pages 368 to 373, it should surprise nobody that passing a law making the central bank independent means nothing. The governor of the Zimbabwean central bank probably knew how his counterpart in Sierra Leone had fallen from the top floor of the central bank building when he disagreed with Siaka Stevens, page 344. Independent or not, complying with the president's demands was the prudent choice for his personal health even if not for the health of the economy. Not all countries are like Zimbabwe. In Argentina and Colombia, central banks were also made independent in the 1990s, and they actually did their job of reducing inflation. But since in neither country was politics changed, political elites could use other ways to buy votes, maintain their interests, and reward themselves and their followers. Since they couldn't do this by printing money anymore, they had to use a different way. In both countries the introduction of central bank independence coincided with a big expansion in government expenditures, financed largely by borrowing. The second approach to engineering prosperity is much more in vogue nowadays. It recognizes that there are no easy fixes for lifting a nation from poverty to prosperity overnight, or even in the course of a few decades. Instead, it claims, there are many micromarket failures that can be redressed with good advice, and prosperity will result if policymakers take advantage of these opportunities, which, again, can be achieved with the help and vision of economists and others. Small market failures are everywhere in poor countries, this approach claims, for example, in their education systems, health care delivery, and the way their markets are organized. This is undoubtedly true. But the problem is that these small market failures may be only the tip of the iceberg, the symptom of deeper, rooted problems in a society functioning under extractive institutions. Just as it is not a coincidence that poor countries have bad macroeconomic policies, it is not a coincidence that their educational systems do not work well. These market failures may not be due solely to ignorance. The policymakers and bureaucrats who are supposed to act on well-intentioned advice may be as much a part of the problem, and the many attempts to rectify these inefficiencies may backfire precisely because those in charge are not grappling with the institutional causes of the poverty in the first place. These problems are illustrated by intervention engineered by the non-governmental organization, NGO, 
Sevamander to improve healthcare delivery in the state of Rajasthan in India. The story of healthcare delivery in India is one of deep rooted inefficiency and failure. Government provided healthcare is, at least in theory, widely available and cheap, and the personnel are generally qualified. But even the poorest Indians do not use government healthcare facilities opting instead for the much more expensive, unregulated, and sometimes even deficient private providers. This is not because of some type of irrationality, people are unable to get any care from government facilities, which are plagued by absenteeism. If an Indian visited his government-run facility, not only would there be no nurses there, but he would probably not even be able to get in the building because healthcare facilities are closed most of the time. In 2006 Sevamander, together with a group of economists, designed an incentive scheme to encourage nurses to turn up for work in the Udaipur district of Rajasthan. The idea was simple, Sevamander introduced time clocks that would stamp the date and time when nurses were in the facility. Nurses were supposed to stamp their time cards three times a day, to ensure that they arrived on time, stayed around, and left on time. If such a scheme worked, and increased the quality and quantity of healthcare provision, it would be a strong illustration of the theory that there were easy solutions to key problems in development. In the event, the intervention revealed something very different. Shortly after the program was implemented, there was a sharp increase in nurse attendance but this was very short-lived. In a little more than a year, the local health administration of the district deliberately undermined the incentive scheme introduced by Seva Mander. Absenteeism was back to its usual level, yet there was a sharp increase in exempt days, which meant that nurses were not actually around, but this was officially sanctioned by the local health administration. There was also a sharp increase in machine problems, as the time clocks were broken. But Seva Mander was unable to replace them because local health ministers would not cooperate. Forcing nurses to stamp a time clock three times a day doesn't seem like such an innovative idea. Indeed, it is a practice used throughout the industry, even Indian industry and it must have occurred to health administrators as a potential solution to their problems. It seems unlikely, then, that ignorance of such a simple incentive scheme was what stopped its being used in the first place. What occurred during the program simply confirmed this. Health administrators sabotaged the program because they were in cahoots with the nurses and complicit in the endemic absenteeism problems. They did not want an incentive scheme forcing nurses to turn up or reducing their pay if they did not. What this episode illustrates is a micro version of the difficulty of implementing meaningful changes when institutions are the cause of the problems in the first place. In this case, it was not corrupt politicians or powerful businesses undermining institutional reform, but rather, the local health administration and nurses who were able to sabotage Seva Manders and the development economists' incentive scheme. This suggests that many of the micromarket failures that are apparently easy to fix may be illusory. The institutional structure that creates market failures will also prevent implementation of interventions to improve incentives at the micro level. Attempting to engineer prosperity without confronting the root cause of the problems, extractive institutions and the politics that keeps them in place, is unlikely to bear fruit. The Failure of Foreign Aid Following the September 11, 2001, attacks by al-Qaeda, U.S.-led forces swiftly toppled the repressive Taliban regime in Afghanistan which was harboring and refusing to hand over key members of al-Qaeda. The Bonn Agreement of December 2001 between leaders of the former Afghan Mujahideen who had cooperated with the U.S. forces and key members of the Afghan diaspora, including Hamid Karzai, 
created a plan for the establishment of a democratic regime. A first step was the nationwide Grand Assembly, the Loya Jirga, which elected Karzai to lead the interim government. Things were looking up for Afghanistan. A majority of the Afghan people were longing to leave the Taliban behind. The international community thought that all that Afghanistan needed now was a large infusion of foreign aid. Representatives from the United Nations and several leading NGOs soon descended on the capital, Kabul. What ensued should not have been a surprise especially given the failure of foreign aid to poor countries and failed states over the past five decades. Surprise or not, the usual ritual was repeated. Scores of aid workers and their entourages arrived in town with their own private jets, NGOs of all. Sorts poured in to pursue their own agendas, and high-level talks began between governments and delegations from the international community. Billions of dollars were now coming to Afghanistan. But little of it was used for building infrastructure, schools, or other public services essential for the development of inclusive institutions or even for restoring law and order. While much of the infrastructure remained in tatters, the first tranche of the money was used to commission an airline to shuttle around UN and other international officials. The next thing they needed were drivers and interpreters. So they hired the few English-speaking bureaucrats and the remaining teachers in Afghan schools to chauffeur and chaperone them around, paying them multiples of current Afghan salaries. As the few skilled bureaucrats were shunted into jobs servicing the foreign aid community, the aid flows, rather than building infrastructure in Afghanistan started by undermining the Afghan state they were supposed to build upon and strengthen. Villagers in a remote district in the central valley of Afghanistan heard a radio announcement about a new multi-million dollar program to restore shelter to their area. After a long while, a few wooden beams, carried by the trucking cartel of Ismail Khan, famous former warlord and member of the Afghan government, were delivered. But they were too big to be used for anything in the district, and the villagers put them to the only possible use, firewood. So what had happened to the millions of dollars promised to the villagers? Of the promised money, 20% of it was taken as UN head office costs in Geneva. The remainder was subcontracted to an NGO, which took another 20% for its own head office costs in Brussels and so on, for another three layers, with each party taking approximately another 20% of what was remaining. The little money that reached Afghanistan was used to buy wood from western Iran, and much of it was paid to Ismail. Khan's trucking cartel to cover the inflated transport prices. It was a bit of a miracle that those oversized wooden beams even arrived in the village. What happened in the Central Valley of Afghanistan is not an isolated incident. Many studies estimate that only about 10 or at most 20% of aid ever reaches its target. There are dozens of ongoing fraud investigations into charges of UN and local officials siphoning off aid money. But most of the waste resulting from foreign aid is not fraud, just incompetence or even worse simply business as usual for aid organizations. The Afghan experience with aid was in fact probably a qualified success compared to others. Throughout the last five decades, hundreds of billions of dollars have been paid to governments around the world as a development aid. Much of it has been wasted in overhead and corruption, just as in Afghanistan. Worse, a lot of it went to dictators such as Mobutu, who depended on foreign aid from his Western patrons both to buy support from his clients to shore up his regime and to enrich himself. The picture in much of the rest of sub-Saharan Africa was similar. Humanitarian aid given for temporary relief in times of crises, for example, most recently in Haiti and Pakistan, has certainly been more useful 
even though its delivery, too, has been marred in similar problems. Despite this unflattering track record of e-development aid, foreign aid is one of the most popular policies that Western governments, international organizations such as the United Nations, and NGOs of different ilk recommend as a way of combating poverty around the world. And of course, the cycle of the failure of foreign aid repeats itself over and over again. The idea that rich Western countries should provide large amounts of developmental aid in order to solve the problem of poverty in sub-Saharan Africa, the Caribbean, Central America, and South Asia is based on an incorrect understanding of what causes poverty. Countries such as Afghanistan are poor because of their extractive institutions, which result in lack of property rights, law and order, or well-functioning legal systems and the stifling dominance of national and, more often, local elites over political and economic life. The same institutional problems mean that foreign aid will be ineffective, as it will be plundered and is unlikely to be delivered where it is supposed to go. In the worst-case scenario, it will prop up the regimes that are at the very root of the problems of these societies. If sustained economic growth depends on inclusive institutions, giving aid to regimes presiding over extractive institutions cannot be the solution. This is not to deny that, even beyond humanitarian aid, considerable good comes out of specific aid programs that build schools in areas where none existed before and that pay teachers, who would otherwise go unpaid. While much of the aid community that poured into Kabul did little to improve life for ordinary Afghans, there have also been notable successes in building schools, particularly for girls, who were entirely excluded from education under the Taliban and even before. One solution, which has recently become more popular, partly based on the recognition that institutions have something to do with prosperity and even the delivery of aid, is to make aid conditional. According to this view, continued foreign aid should depend on recipient governments meeting certain conditions, for example, liberalizing markets or moving toward democracy. The George W. Bush administration undertook the biggest step toward this type of conditional aid by starting the Millennium Challenge accounts, which made future aid payments dependent on quantitative improvements in several dimensions of economic and political development. But the effectiveness of conditional aid appears no better than the unconditional kind. Countries failing to meet these conditions typically receive as much aid as those that do. There is a simple reason, they have a greater need for aid of either the developmental or humanitarian kind. And quite predictably, conditional aid seems to have little effect on a nation's institutions. After all, it would have been quite surprising for somebody such as Siaka Stevens in Sierra Leone or Mobutu in the Congo suddenly to start dismantling the extractive institutions on which he depended just for a little more foreign aid. Even in sub-Saharan Africa, where foreign aid is a significant fraction of many governments' total budget, and even after the Millennium Challenge accounts, which increased the extent of conditionality, the amount of additional foreign aid that a dictator can obtain by undermining his own power is both small and not worth the risk either to his continued dominance over the country or to his life. But all this does not imply that foreign aid, except the humanitarian kind, should cease. Putting an end to foreign aid is impractical and would likely lead to additional human suffering. It is impractical because citizens of many Western nations feel guilt and unease about the economic and humanitarian disasters around the world and foreign aid makes them believe that something is being done to combat the problems. Even if this something is not very effective, their desire for doing it will continue, and so will foreign aid.
The enormous complex of international organizations and NGOs will also ceaselessly demand and mobilize resources to ensure the continuation of the status quo. Also, it would be callous to cut the aid given to the neediest nations. Yes, much of it is wasted. But if out of every dollar given to aid, 10 cents makes it to the poorest people in the world, that is 10 cents more than they had before to alleviate the most abject poverty, and it might still be better than nothing. There are two important lessons here. First, foreign aid is not a very effective means of dealing with the failure of nations around the world today. Far from it. Countries need inclusive economic and political institutions to break out of the cycle of poverty. Foreign aid can typically do little in this respect, and certainly not with the way that it is currently organized. Recognizing the roots of world inequality and poverty is important precisely so that we do not pin our hopes on false promises, as those roots lie in institutions, foreign aid, within the framework of given institutions in recipient nations, will do little to spur sustained growth. Second, since the development of inclusive economic and political institutions is key, using the existing flows of foreign aid at least in part to facilitate such development would be useful. As we saw, conditionality is not the answer here, as it requires existing rulers to make concessions. Instead, perhaps structuring foreign aid so that its use and administration bring groups and leaders otherwise excluded from power into the decision-making process and empowering a broad segment of population might be a better prospect. Empowerment May 12, 1978, seemed as if it were going to be a normal day at the Scania truck factory in the city of São Bernardo, in the Brazilian state of São Paulo. But the workers were restless. Strikes had been banned in Brazil since 1964 when the military overthrew the democratic government of President João Goulart. But news had just broken that the government had been fixing the national inflation figures so that the rise in the cost of living had been underestimated. As the 7 a.m. shift began, workers put down their tools. At 8 a.m., Gilson Menezes, a union organizer working at the plant, called the union. The president of the São Bernardo Metalworkers was a 33-year-old activist called Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva, Lula. By noon Lula was at the factory. When the company asked him to persuade the employees to go back to work, he refused. The Scania strike was the first in a wave of strikes that swept across Brazil. On the face of it these were about wages, but as Lula later noted, I think we can't separate economic and political factors. The struggle was over wages, but in struggling for wages, the working class won a political victory. The resurgence of the Brazilian labor movement was just part of a much broader social reaction to a decade and a half of military rule. The left-wing intellectual Fernando Henrique Cardoso like Lula destined to become president of Brazil after the recreation of democracy, argued in 1973 that democracy would be created in Brazil by the many social groups that opposed the military coming together. He said that what was needed was a reactivation of civil society, the professional associations, the trade unions, the churches, the student organizations, the study groups and the debating circles, the social movements. In other words, a broad coalition with the aim of recreating democracy and changing Brazilian society. The Scania factory heralded the formation of this coalition. By late 1978, Lula was floating the idea of creating a new political party, the Workers' Party. This was to be the party not just of trade unionists, however. Lula insisted that it should be a party for all wage earners and the poor in general. 
Here the attempts of union leaders to organize a political platform began to coalesce with the many social movements that were springing up. On August 18, 1979, a meeting was held in Sao Paulo to discuss the formation of the Workers' Party, which brought together former opposition politicians, union leaders, students, intellectuals, and people representing 100 diverse social movements that had begun to organize in the 1970s across Brazil. The Workers' Party, launched at the São Judas Tadeu restaurant in São Bernardo in October 1979, would come to represent all these diverse groups. The party quickly began to benefit from the political opening that the military was reluctantly organizing. In the local elections of 1982, it ran candidates for the first time, and won two races for mayor. Throughout the 1980s, as democracy was gradually recreated in Brazil, the Workers' Party began to take over more and more local governments. By 1988 it controlled the governments in 36 municipalities, including large cities such as São Paulo and Porto Alegre. In 1989, in the first free presidential elections since the military coup, Lula won 16 percent of the vote in the first round as the party's candidate. In the runoff race with Fernando Culler, he won 44 percent. In taking over many local governments, something that accelerated in the 1990s, the Workers' Party began to enter into a symbiotic relationship with many local social movements. In Porto Alegre the first Workers' Party administration after 1988 introduced participatory budgeting, which was a mechanism for bringing ordinary citizens into the formulation of the spending priorities of the city. It created a system that has become a world model for local government accountability and responsiveness, and it went along with huge improvements in public service provision and the quality of life in the city. The successful governance structure of the party at the local level mapped into greater political mobilization and success at the national level. Though Lula was defeated by Fernando Enrique Cardoso in the presidential elections of 1994 and 1998, he was elected president of Brazil in 2002. The Workers' Party has been in power ever since. The formation of a broad coalition in Brazil as a result of the coming together of diverse social movements and organized labor has had a Remarkable impact on the Brazilian economy. Since 1990 economic growth has been rapid, with the proportion of the population in poverty falling from 45% to 30% in 2006. Inequality, which rose rapidly under the military, has fallen sharply, particularly after the Workers' Party took power, and there has been a huge expansion of education with the average years of schooling of the population increasing from 6 in 1995 to 8 in 2006. Brazil has now become part of the BRIC nations, Brazil, Russia, India, and China, the first Latin American country actually to have weight in international diplomatic circles. The rise of Brazil since the 1970s was not engineered by economists of international institutions instructing Brazilian policymakers on how to design better policies or avoid market failures. It was not achieved with injections of foreign aid. It was not the natural outcome of modernization. Rather, it was the consequence of diverse groups of people courageously building inclusive institutions. Eventually these led to more inclusive economic institutions. But the Brazilian transformation, like that of England in the 17th century, began with the creation of inclusive political institutions. But how can society build inclusive political institutions? History, as we have seen, is littered with examples of reform movements that succumbed to the iron law of oligarchy and replaced one set of extractive institutions with even more pernicious ones.
We have seen that England in 1688, France in 1789, and Japan during the Meiji Restoration of 1868 started the process of forging inclusive political institutions, with a political revolution. But such political revolutions generally create much destruction and hardship, and their success is far from certain. The Bolshevik Revolution advertised its aim as replacing the exploitative economic system of Tsarist Russia with a more just and efficient one that would bring freedom and prosperity to millions of Russians. Alas, the outcome was the opposite, and much more repressive and extractive institutions replaced those of the government the Bolsheviks overthrew. The experiences in China, Cuba, and Vietnam were similar. Many non-communist, top-down reforms fared no better. Nasser vowed to build a modern egalitarian society in Egypt, but this led only to Hosni Mubarak's corrupt regime, as we saw in Chapter 13. Robert Mugabe was viewed by many as a freedom fighter ousting Ian Smith's racist and highly extractive Rhodesian regime. But Zimbabwe's institutions became no less extractive, and its economic performance has been even worse than before independence. What is common among the political revolutions that successfully paved the way for more inclusive institutions, and the gradual institutional changes in North America, in England in the 19th century, and in Botswana after independence, which also led to significant strengthening of inclusive political institutions, is that they succeeded in empowering a fairly broad cross-section of society. Pluralism the cornerstone of inclusive political institutions, requires political power to be widely held in society, and starting from extractive institutions that vest power in a narrow elite, this requires a process of empowerment. This, as we emphasized in Chapter 7, is what sets apart the glorious revolution from the overthrow of one elite by another. In the case of the glorious revolution, the roots of pluralism were in the overthrow of James II by a political revolution led by a broad coalition, consisting of merchants, industrialists, the gentry, and even many members of the English aristocracy not allied with the crown. As we have seen, the Glorious Revolution was facilitated by the prior mobilization and empowerment of a broad coalition, and more important, it in turn led to the further empowerment of an even broader segment of society than what came before, even though clearly this segment was much less broad than the entire society, and England would remain far from a true democracy for more than another 200 years. The factors leading to the emergence of inclusive institutions in the North American colonies were also similar, as we saw in the first chapter. Once again, the path starting in Virginia, Carolina, Maryland, and Massachusetts and leading up to the Declaration of Independence, and to the consolidation of inclusive political institutions in the United States was one of empowerment, for increasingly broader segments in society. The French Revolution, too, is an example of empowerment of a broader segment of society which rose up against the Ancien Regime in France and managed to pave the way for a more pluralistic political system. But the French Revolution, especially the interlude of the terror under Robespierre, a repressive and murderous regime, also illustrates how the process of empowerment is not without its pitfalls. Ultimately, however, Robespierre and his Jacobin cadres were cast aside and the most important inheritance from the French Revolution became not the guillotine but the far-ranging reforms that the revolution implemented in France and other parts of Europe. There are many parallels between these historical processes of empowerment and what took place in Brazil starting in the 1970s, though one root of the Workers' Party is the trade union movement, right from its early days, leaders such as Lula along with the many intellectuals and opposition politicians who lent their support to the party, sought to make it into a broad coalition.
these impulses began to fuse with local social movements all over the country, as the party took over local governments, encouraging civic participation and causing a sort of revolution in governance throughout the country. In Brazil, in contrast with England in the 17th century or France at the turn of the 18th century, there was no radical revolution igniting the process of transforming political institutions at one fell swoop. But the process of empowerment that started in the factories of São Bernardo was effective in part, because it translated into fundamental political change at the national level, for example the transitioning out of military rule to democracy. More important, empowerment at the grassroots level in Brazil ensured that the transition to democracy corresponded to a move toward inclusive political institutions, and thus was a key factor in the emergence of a government committed to the provision of public services, educational expansion, and a truly level playing field. As we have seen, democracy is no guarantee that there will be pluralism. The contrast of the development of pluralistic institutions in Brazil to the Venezuelan experience is telling in this context. Venezuela also transitioned to democracy after 1958, but this happened without empowerment at the grassroots level and did not create a pluralistic distribution of political power. Instead, corrupt politics, patronage networks, and conflict persisted in Venezuela, and in part as a result, when voters went to the polls, they were even willing to support potential despots such as Hugo Chavez, most likely because they thought he alone could stand up to the established elites of Venezuela. In consequence, Venezuela still languishes under extractive institutions, while Brazil broke the mold. What can be done to kickstart or perhaps just facilitate the process of empowerment and thus the development of inclusive political institutions? The honest answer of course is that there is no recipe for building such institutions. Naturally there are some obvious factors that would make the process of empowerment more likely to get off the ground. These would include the presence of some degree of centralized order so that social movements challenging existing regimes do not immediately descend into lawlessness, some pre-existing political institutions that introduce a modicum of pluralism, such as the traditional political institutions in Botswana, so that broad coalitions can form and endure, and the presence of civil society institutions that can coordinate the demands of the population so that opposition movements can neither be easily crushed by the current elites nor inevitably turn into a vehicle for another group to take control of existing extractive institutions. But many of these factors are historically predetermined and change only slowly. The Brazilian case illustrates how civil society institutions and associated party organizations can be built from the ground up, but this process is slow, and how successful it can be under different circumstances is not well understood. One other actor, or set of actors, can play a transformative role in the process of empowerment, the media. Empowerment of society at large is difficult to coordinate and maintain without widespread information about whether there are economic and political abuses by those in power. We saw in Chapter 11 the role of the media in informing the public and coordinating their demands against forces, undermining inclusive institutions in the United States. The media can also play a key role in channeling the empowerment of a broad segment of society into more durable political reforms. Again, as illustrated in our discussion in Chapter 11, particularly in the context of British democratization, pamphlets and books informing and galvanizing people played an important role during the Glorious Revolution in England, the French Revolution and the march toward democracy in 19th century Britain. Similarly, media, particularly new forms based on advances in information and communication technology, such as web blogs, 
anonymous chats, Facebook, and Twitter, played a central role in Iranian opposition against Ahmadinejad's fraudulent election in 2009 and subsequent repression. And they seem to be playing a similarly central role in the Arab Spring protests that are ongoing as this manuscript is being completed. Authoritarian regimes are often aware of the importance of a free media, and do their best to fight it. An extreme illustration of this comes from Alberto Fujimori's rule in Peru. Though originally democratically elected, Fujimori soon set up a dictatorial regime in Peru, mounting a coup while still in office in 1992. Thereafter, though elections continued, Fujimori built a corrupt regime and ruled through repression and bribery. In this he relied heavily on his right-hand man, Valdemiro Montesinos, who headed the powerful National Intelligence Service of Peru. Montesinos was an organized man, so he kept good records of how much the administration paid different individuals to buy their loyalty, even videotaping many actual acts of bribery. There was a logic to this. Beyond just record-keeping, this evidence made sure that the accomplices were now on record and would be considered as guilty as Fujimori and Montesinos. After the fall of the regime, these records fell into the hands of journalists and authorities. The amounts are revealing about the value of the media to a dictatorship. A Supreme Court judge was worth between $5,000 and $10,000 a month, and politicians in the same or different parties were paid similar amounts. But when it came to newspapers and TV stations, the sums were in the millions. Fujimori and Montesinos paid $9 million on one occasion and more than $10 million on another to control TV stations. They paid more than $1 million to a mainstream newspaper, and to other newspapers they paid any amount between $3,000 and $8,000 per headline. Fujimori and Montesinos thought that controlling the media was much more important than controlling politicians and judges. One of Montesinos's henchmen, General Bello, summed this up in one of the videos by stating, if we do not control the television we do not do anything. The current extractive institutions in China are also crucially dependent on Chinese authorities' control of the media, which, as we have seen, has become frighteningly sophisticated. As a Chinese commentator summarized, to uphold the leadership of the party in political reform, three principles must be followed that the party controls the armed forces, the party controls cadres, and the party controls the news. But of course a free media and new communication technologies can help only at the margins, by providing information and coordinating the demands and actions of those vying for more inclusive institutions. Their help will translate into meaningful change only when a broad segment of society mobilizes and organizes. In order to effect political change, and does so not for sectarian reasons or to take control of extractive institutions, but to transform extractive institutions into more inclusive ones. Whether such a process will get underway and open the door to further empowerment, and ultimately to durable political reform, will depend, as we have seen in many different instances, on the history of economic and political institutions, on many small differences that matter and on the very contingent path of history.